<clears throat> Hello, everyone, and God bless. This is Father Mikhail and my brother-in-law, Father John Castillo, uh, with our, our first live stream, Two Priest and a Podcast, which uh, was totally Father John's idea for the name. Oh, um, yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. <laughs> so, uh, Father John, uh, this is your first time on anything. Uh, you've never uh, come on to a, to a live stream before or have any um, priestly social media, which is not yeah. a bad thing. <laughs> I, I myself try to stay. I'm not a fan of social media whatsoever. No, me neither. I, I don't Even before I, I uh, became Orthodox, when I was a lost uh, idiot, I suppose, um, I, I've just hated it. I don't know. I've always been a, a Luddite in that regard. I guess that helps. <laughs> I, I just don't see any good in social media, really. No, there, there, there isn't much good in it. I mean, Instagram has has been kind of helpful for both the parish and and my uh, living Orthodox. It's helped bring some people into the church, which has been wonderful to see. Um, so, you know, if we're going to do anything, we always make sure that we do it for the glory of God. Yeah. So this is going to be hopefully the first, like the kind of the inaugural episode of hopefully what will be many uh, podcasts. Regrettably, uh, I had to uh, to shelve according to tradition with uh, Subdeacon Nectarios. It's just we've we've uh, parted ways uh, jurisdictionally and and I think in terms of other things. But um, you know, so there there will be no more according to tradition episodes. But in its place, we have uh, two priests and a podcast. So uh, we're we're very excited to bring this to you. Um, but before we get in, I would like to ask Father John to introduce himself to. Uh, to tell us maybe a little bit more about himself. He was ordained uh, just last November on the 19th, uh, so on the feast day of St. Tikhon, Patriarch of Moscow. So, yes. Father John, uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself and uh, and you and becoming Orthodox and, and how you became a priest. Yes. Well, um, a lot of people at first glance may think uh, maybe I'm I'm Greek, maybe I'm, I'm Arab. I get that all the time. Um, I am not. I'm actually Hispanic. Um, I came up here uh, from from Miami uh, after meeting my wife and decided to move up here. This is long before I converted. And when we first came up here, we thought, well, you know, we'll look for a church. We'll do this and that. And we just never got around to it. And, you know, providentially, we never got around to it because I'm pretty sure if I would have ended up in a Protestant church with the way that they are now, me practically having no faith in anything at that point, I probably would have turned away entirely from any sort of religion after, you know, just going to a rock concert, essentially. That would have completely turned me off on everything. But thankfully, our first encounter with... Uh, a church was coming to the Orthodox Church, and it was from that that we were completely just blown away. As someone who had so little faith in anything, honestly, borderline atheistic, it I felt a tremendous loss in me on not uh, being Orthodox, on not coming to church. If this is what I was missing out on, you know, the very first homily that I heard was on uh, the genealogy of Christ. And throughout all my life of going, because I, 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 I was in a, a Baptist private school when I was young, in elementary school. And I constantly heard the line of like, oh, well, why, you know, why is this written this way in, in scripture? And it's like, oh, well, that's just how they wrote back then. You know, that's a, it's just there because that's an archaic thing. It doesn't really matter that much. When I actually had the genealogy explained from an Orthodox perspective of, the fullness, the totality of, of Christ's genealogy, including sinners, including kings, including righteous people, poor people, everyone, you know, that it made so much sense. I was like, what am I missing out on? I'm missing out on some truth here. How, how could I have never heard this? How could I have gone my entire life not hearing something so seemingly simple but everyone just disregarded it in my entire life. And that really started the pull. And not just that, seeing the piety of the people around me was um, just like nothing else. I'd never seen people taking 
spirituality, taking religion, taking anything serious so seriously. And that was a major draw to me because I in it was a point in my life where, you know, I was sick of treating life frivolously and treating life in this like weird, detached, sarcastic state that uh many people my age and maybe younger seem to find themselves in where they just can't take the, anything seriously, especially not themselves. And it's like, no, I, I, I have to start taking things seriously. And seeing that serious piety really, really attracted me to orthodoxy. And from then on, it's it's just been uh, kind of a roller coaster. <laughs> I, uh, I was received into the church in 2020. Uh, my spiritual father, uh, the same spiritual father as uh, uh, Father Michael here, um, Father Vladimir Morin, he took me under his wing and from there just really pushed me and pushed me and pushed me to serve, to really reach my full potential of of what he thought he saw in me. And, you know, God bless him. I'm, I'm glad that he saw what he saw in me because I certainly would never have. And he put me forward for, you know, ordination uh, to the priesthood um, in 20, November 2022, as you, or 2023, sorry. Yeah, because um, uh, just the previous uh, summer on, in July, we, we went out to, uh, uh, to, to Toronto for, um, for his ordination. He was ordained in the big city here in Canada, right? So Toronto is the largest city population wise, probably, and I would say landmass wise as well. It's, uh, it's not the nation's capital, but it's, uh, it's the capital in terms of population of Ontario and everything else. And so we went to the cathedral of Holy Trinity, um, where you were ordained actually to the diaconate on mm -hmm. Holy Pentecost, which was like, yeah. incredible. Well, on, um, the, the day of the Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit, I believe. Yeah, Holy the Spirit. Day afterwards. So, as, as they call it in, in, in Russian, it translates to Holy Spirit Day. So, yeah. 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 And so it's, uh, you know, what was, was really cool about it was, uh, you know, kind of seeing the progression. Because initially, uh, if I recall, you were like, yeah, you know what? I'm just going to, I'm okay with just being a deacon. <laughs> yeah. No. It, yeah. Essentially, that, that's how it was when I was approached when, you know, Father Vladimir said oh you know I, I i think you'd make a good priest and i was like i i, I don't know what you're talking about and yeah. i i wanted to be a deacon i was like i this is what i want i want to help i want to assist you know being a deacon that 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 saw that was in there for me but no he's he's like no you're, you're short selling yourself you're not exactly living up to the calling that you're just ignoring <laughs> essentially but it, it's the way things work out is God won't let you be Jonah. You know, he won't let you ignore, <laughs> or well, he will make you Jonah, I should say. He won't let you ignore him when he has a plan for you. Yeah, it's what I call the, the Jonah complex, where uh, you want to, you almost want to run away from what you actually should be doing. I mean, when, when I was being ordained to the priesthood, I was terrified, right? You know, I remember being at the, the Red Roof Inn in Herkimer, uh, the night before and just just sweating buckets. I was like, this is like an execution. I feel like <laughs> feel like I'm getting killed the next day. <laughs> yeah, the the entire uh, drive out to the parish that I was going to get ordained at, I was like, I I just like I, I don't want to go. <laughs> this is terrifying. I mean, it is. It's it's it really is. It's terrifying. And the 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 pictures that I've seen from parishioners who. Uh, who, who took of me getting ordained i some of them say i have a face that looks like either i have the the thousand yard stare or uh the face of of please help me because i was terrified <laughs> and I, that that's what i was i was told though that it's you know it's good it's healthy for someone to have that that trepidation i guess that that hesitancy to step into these shoes, it's a huge responsibility. It's a huge ask, not just in terms of the earthly of having to take care of people, but of the the, the spiritual ramifications of, I am spiritually responsible for these, for people. I am spiritually responsible to a higher calling. It's, it's 
you know, m the baseline for a priest is uh, much higher for, you know, your, for a layman. And that it's, it's terrifying. It's terrifying that at the dread judgment seat, there will be so much asked of me. But my thought is if I can help even one person make it, if I can help one person fix their life, that's all that I can ask for. And I'm more than grateful to lay my life down for that, even if it's just for the one. And I don't know, I, it's, I couldn't ignore it despite how scared I was. So here I am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Father Vladimir always says that, right? Is that, you know, well, just because you're scared doesn't mean it's not the right thing to do, right? It's, yeah. Um, my, that's, that's, time, you yeah, know, being, being brave isn't, uh, what is it? Being brave isn't being not scared. It's being scared and doing it anyway. Yeah, it's you know, not going through what fear. you need to do anyway. Yeah, bra bravery is not the absence of fear. It's the it's the ability to act and the determination to take right course of action in the face of it. Right. A lot of people think bravery just means, oh, you you have to be fearless. That courageousness is fearlessness. But this isn't the no. case. Right. It's it, you know, that's something Father Vladimir also taught me uh, with with going into the priesthood was was that, you know, there are times where you're going to be kind of going into unfamiliar or untread waters and you're just going to have to be willing to throw yourself in there to be obedient to the bishop, to be obedient to the church. Because if you can't be obedient to those yeah. things, how can you then say you're obedient to God, right? You know, this this is a common yeah. thing we see with schismatics, with heretics. They're really only obedient to themselves. And this, this is why we have uh, things like spiritual fathers, why we have bishops, why we, you know, why all these things are in place is because in all reality, it's it's meant to help us humble ourselves and come closer to God. Yeah, it. I mean, it, it's if you don't have some small measure of of fear going into doing any sort of of service or work in the name of the Lord, then you're crazy. You're you're overconfident. I would say there there should be some level of understanding that only that you can't do this without God, and that smallness. Like we should always be understanding of that in anything that we do for the Lord, whether it's something small, like uh, we read an Akathist, you know, or whether it's something big, we want to become a monk or we want to, you know, become clergy or something like that. It, it's we should have that understanding of our smallness before the Lord and have a little bit of 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 fear at our smallness. But hope in the strength and the mercies of the Lord in carrying us and seeing us through because we're not going to do anything of our own of our own power we're, we're nothing without the Lord we can't do anything literally anything without him so it's yes. like we we should always be worried of doing something of our own capacity because it will always be cursed if we're doing it out of our own self-will yeah exactly it's why before you know endeavoring on anything, it's important to obtain a blessing, right? Like if you're a lay person and you're wanting to start a blog or a YouTube channel, um, you need the blessing of your priest. And if you're a priest mm -hmm. doing it, um, for example, I I asked the blessing of Archbishop Gabriel before I even started this channel. I, I wrote to him and asked for his blessing, told him why I wanted to do it, what I wanted to do with it. And uh, he just gave me a very laconic response as any good bishop does. He says, may it be blessed. And he says, just don't say anything heretical. <laughs> <laughs> and don't break yeah. with with rocor tradition so it's like oh that's uh that's all i know is, is rocor so well you know with having the blessing of a superior whether it is your bishop whether it's your parish priest your spiritual father the priest that you're going to confess to like getting the blessing from them is extremely important in any sort of endeavor that we're taking any spiritual endeavors we're taking um, or Gives else it, it will be cursed. It's, it's like uh, Father uh, Cosmas of uh, Orthodox Talks of, uh, from Australia has talked about. You know, it's it's without the bishops, with the bishop's blessing, everything will work exactly how they're supposed to. Everything will be blessed exactly that. But without that, it's cursed. Things will just not work out because we're doing it of our own self. We're doing it out of our own pride. You know, even right. if it's something that's seemingly great, something that's good, you know, from our perspective, it might be good. But if we don't seek the blessing, how do we know? 
how do we know ourselves if it is good or not? You know, it we we can't really be. Well, the, you can't be your own. You can't direct your own spiritual life when you exactly when you yes come into the church. And some people, you know, I had this really sweet kid at my parish this past Sunday go, "Father, do you have any sins?" And I was like, "Well." You yeah, is that a trick question? <laughs> you know, it's like, of course I do. <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of why I'm a priest. You know, and I had one priest friend told me, he said that, you know, you, you became a priest because this is your penance, right? It, we all screwed <laughs> up so bad somewhere. Um, a quick little uh, okirios to, to Pano. Uh, you know, thank, thank you. <laughs> um, I saw but, someone someone in the chat had mentioned, they asked if, if I was uh, formerly Catholic. No. Um, despite being Hispanic, despite being Cuban and El Salvadorian, who are m vast majority Catholic, I was never Catholic. Um, my grandparents are, but they never really passed that on to my uh, my parents. And uh, for a while, they were Protestants and then fell into either one atheism, the other weird spiritual new age hoodoo, voodoo nonsense kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, when I was growing up for me, it was, you know, as a little kid, it was, uh, Protestantism and then you, every Protestant, well, a lot of Protestants hit that phase where they become a teenager and they're like, well, none like, of yeah, this, this, this doesn't make sense. It's stupid. yeah, exactly. Everything's the contradictory. Bible, the, the Bible something Everything. you're forced to read as a punishment. <laughs> yeah. Everything's contradictory. No one says the same thing. You read the Bible and then someone, you know, Pastor Jim Bob tells you something that completely contradicts the Bible. And everyone just says, if you don't listen to him, then you're going to hell. And it's like that. This or, you know, somebody good. in the congregation starts yelling in gibberish. And if you can't yell in gibberish, you know, maybe God doesn't. I, I never I thankfully I never had to experience. Well, you, that you were never that. in the. Yeah, I, I had a time when my parents took us to the Baptist church growing up for a bit. And then I spent a lot of time with like the charismatic evangelicals and Pentecostals. That's. That was primarily where we were, which was, uh, uh, and, and just as a quick side note, because I've had some people ask this, if if Father John is my uh, wife's brother, no, uh, my wife is Polish, certainly not Cuban, um, <laughs> but uh, no, he's he's actually, he's married to my younger sister, Matushka Maria, so a quick shout out to my sister, Matushka Maria, love you, and uh, there's there's been some exciting news, actually, from Father John's side of things. Yeah, he's he's uh, not only did he become a priest not too long ago, but he's uh, he's he's prayerfully discerning, uh, moving to Grand Prairie, Alberta, uh, to rector a parish there that has started up uh, that will be going by the name of Saint John the Forerunner, the Nativity of Saint John, right? Yeah, Nativity of Saint John the Forerunner. Well, baby, baby steps. I'm uh, baby steps. Yeah, first, if, if, yeah. if anybody out there is from that parish, or you know, we'll be seeing that from that parish, we'll be. Uh, I'll be heading out there for um, Lazarus Saturday all the way till bright Monday and the majority of the services in between. So, you know, it's is we couldn't in all good faith. Like when we heard that there is a parish out there that didn't have a priest that has already been mentioned to us that isn't going to have Pascha this year. And that has never had Pasca. Like, how could we say no? How, how could we yeah. deprive them of one of the greatest, you know, the feast of feasts? When I'm, you know, I'm I'm a second priest here. In 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 both London, well, in London I'm a third priest. Here in Windsor yeah. I'm a second priest. So my absence here won't affect them having Pasca. But if I don't go, they won't have Pasca again. So. How could in in good like in all honesty, how could anybody say no? Oh, no, exactly. And, and then you found out some other news as you decided to go and undertake this this little obedience to to go uh, to northern Alberta. You, you then found out that uh, your wife is pregnant with your first child. So <laughs> yes, when God <laughs> rains down His blessings, He really really rains them down. So yes, uh, for all of you out there, if you could please. Please pray for us. It's still fairly early, uh, but yes, please uh, yeah, keep us in your prayers. It's pray, uh, pray for her health, uh, you know, for for a safe pregnancy, and of course, uh, for for discernment with with their life because there's there's so much uh, going on. And just as a quick uh, side note, yes, uh, Chad Belcati, we are both Rocor. We're both Rocor trained and ordained and serving. 
So yes. I'm I'm with Holy Dormition uh, Orthodox Church, uh, Holy Dormition of the Theotokos Orthodox Church in Lethbridge. I'm I'm the rector of that parish, and Father John is a is the assistant priest to Holy Trinity Orthodox Church, uh, Russian Orthodox Church in Windsor. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, we're both Rokor, both under Archbishop Gabriel, both ordained by Archbishop Gabriel. Glory to God. And, and uh, you know we're we're very thankful for Vladika. He's a wonderful bishop. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm 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 very glad and, and grateful for where we are. <laughs> so, uh, with that said, and of course you know with the the quick little shout out to uh, to everyone in Grand Prairie and Lethbridge and Three Hills and the like who are who are tuned in with us. We love you all. God bless you. Um, of course, we're we're now on the first day of Great and Holy Lent, Queen Monday, and uh, you know I'm having coffee to keep my focus because. Uh, Going, going throughout the whole day without eating can always throw you off when you're used to eating most days. <laughs> so um, we're going to be talking about becoming Orthodox. And, uh, you know, of course, this is an inaugural episode, so we wanted to give you an introduction as to, you know, just to give you an idea of who Father John is, uh, because you'll be seeing his face a lot more, God willing. And uh, we're, we're hoping to do this, uh, this maybe on a every other week to biweekly basis, um, just to have... Uh, you know, some frequency to get some things out there that might help people and, uh, you know, to to kind of give more of a face to the English speaking Rokor world here in Canada. It is growing. Um, there are yep. definitely a lot more Rokor speaking, uh, English speaking Rokor parishes in the States, but we're starting to pop up in Canada. We're starting to show up more. Slow to um, adopt here in Canada. I mean, there is a lot of diaspora <laughs> in Canada, though, which surprised me. There there are oh, there are a lot of Slavs here in Canada. And then I learned the history and it's like, oh, well, no wonder there's a lot of Slavs here in Canada. Yeah. I mean, fun fact, my great grandfather was one of the first Orthodox priests ordained out West and he first served in Alberta. So, but uh, closer to where you're going, he's, he was in Boyan, not, not in Lethbridge. Um, But yeah, so we'll be talking about various different things as the weeks go on. And we will always be doing a a a Q&A. Um, for the last bit of the show, there will always be a chance to do Q and A. You can ask us questions, uh, either related to the topic, or you can just ask us something completely unrelated. Maybe you've had a hard time getting answers to. So if you have questions, please write them down and, uh, and field them to us. Um, once we are done, uh, the, the talk about becoming Orthodox. So getting into becoming Orthodox, we, we see a lot of pitfalls, Right when when converts are first coming in, so Father John, what would you say is a a common pitfall you have seen with uh, with various converts when they first come to the church? I mean, you know, we've definitely so been do you mean like the newly themselves. received or people who who are inquiring, I- inquiring, inquiring so, through to reception. Ah, <laughs> uh, so I'd say from the very very first step, inquiring, uh, maybe not so much in the U.S., but definitely here in Canada and maybe in a lot of other places language language is going to be a big stumbling block for a lot of inquirers you're going to go to an orthodox church and it's going to be the service is going to be in slavonic it's going to be in serbian it's going to be in romanian greek arabic you name it it's going to be hard to find it in english glory to god for those of you who can find it in english but it's going to be difficult because of just a lot of diaspora like i said a lot of people bringing their traditions with them which their customs with them which that's fair but that's going to be a big stumbling block for a lot of people to get past that to see past the um ethnicity seeing past the ethnicness i suppose of of hearing things in a foreign language um but like we can't close our minds to that we can't close you know, our ears, the our, our, our souls to that. We have to come with an open heart, with an open mind and, and take everything that we can. The first church that I went to was a, a Greek, was a Greek church. Um, and everything was in Greek. Everyone around me was Greek. Um, they thought you I'm were sure Greek. They, 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 thought, they probably thought I was Greek. They, they saw my family and a bunch of, you know, Canadians, a bunch of white people and they're, look at him, they're like, what are they doing here? And then they see me, it's like, oh, Greek. Okay, nice. He's bringing his family. He's, he's, uh, he's converting them. But uh, no, it, it, I go in there and it was, it was all in Greek and it still, it, it grabbed me. It, 
it's the 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 liturgy of the tradition of the church whether you're greek orthodox whether you're you're russian orthodox serbian romanian you know we're all orthodox oh uh thank you like their father we know he was saying we're all orthodox um hmm seem to be having some technical difficulties on Father John's end. Um, hopefully those will resolve soon. Uh, so with, uh, until he gets back, yeah, so with what he's saying, you'll see that it's a common, uh, a common pitfall for some people because when they first are looking to join the Orthodox Church, they will often say, you know, things like, well, you know, uh, I'm not Russian, I'm not Greek, or, you know, or sometimes you'll even get people who will pejoratively say, well, which Orthodox? And, uh, you know, orthodoxy is so much more than, than you know, the, the, the name that goes before it, whether it's Russian, Serbian, Romanian, Greek. Um, he'll be back. <laughs> orthodoxy is a, you know, it is a complete standalone theological thing. It, it's, well, it's more than that in all reality. It's a, it is the church that Jesus Christ established on his holy apostles. You know, things like Greek, you know, Russian, Serbian. As many of, of our of our viewers uh, know, is that it is it is really only indicating either the language that it originates in, the the jurisdiction in terms of the church hierarchy, and you know sometimes like with the you know between Carpatho Rusin or, or uh, Russian and uh, Greek style chant, you know you'll find uh, big differences between um, Slavonic uh, or the Kievan style chants and the um, uh, the you know the Greek Byzantine chants. I got Father John back. I'm just going to bring him back on. There we <laughs> there go. We go. <laughs> so you were saying, Father John. Yes. Uh, what I was saying is that regardless of whether you're stepping into a church, an Orthodox church, and it's a Greek Orthodox church, a Russian Orthodox church, you know, a Serbian, Romanian, what, what have you, at the end of the day, we're all Orthodox. We're mm. all Orthodox churches regardless of which local church you are stepping into you know it's it's that's the main root of things and if hearing things in a different language are going to scare you they shouldn't you really should open your heart to that and i i do agree uh, someone did point out that um we the church as a whole can do a lot better to bringing it to the English speaking people, but we we have to think for say the the Eastern Europeans for the the Slavic peoples they've had what like a thousand years now at this point for the Greeks for the Arabs they've had two thousand years now since the beginning of the church for the English we've had maybe about I'd say a good 80, 60, 80 to sixty years. Of mm -hmm. the church really coming into contact with the English speaking world, it'll catch up. But we need to show up. We can't just go and be scared. We need to be there to let the people know, to let the hierarchs know, to let the clergy know that the English speaking people are interested, that you know, that that these missionary efforts are yielding fruits. And we do see that. We see that in the in the US. Yeah, and both. it can be tempting to have this thought like, well, you know, if I want to be Orthodox, maybe I should go to Greece or to Serbia or to Russia, run off to Russia. But we have to realize that every Orthodox church, every Orthodox jurisdiction that is well established has had its martyrs. It's it's had its missionaries. And we can't abandon the mission field just when it gets difficult either. You know, the, the yeah, thought can be there. It can be really tempting. But we have to we have to stand firm and try to plant good, good seeds. Well, it's like um, Father John Christiankin said, it's, you know, the the same sins, the same passions that you have wherever you are right now, whether or not you go to the most holy places in Eastern Europe or Greece or the Holy Land itself, they're going to follow you there. They're going to be there. You know, we have to focus on our spiritual lives here. We can't just run away from it because we think, oh, this place is going to be holier. Um, but, you know, it's it's. It's catching up, thankfully, with with the English speaking worlds. The the churches are definitely catching up. 
uh, like I said, especially in the, the United States, you know, the, the ROCOR and the OCA are, are making great, and the Antiochian church are making great strides towards providing this in English and in South America too, for the Spanish speaking people, you know, there's making great strides in, in providing it to those who speak Spanish. So it's just a matter of catching up. You know, it's, it's going to take a while. The church moves slowly and that's, that's good that the church moves yes. slowly because we need time to think about things, to process things, to present but at, at the same our time, we, forward. Yeah. But at the same time, we do need things in English, right? You know, you, you can't move so slow to the point where people aren't understanding yes. the services. And, you know, it, it's so important because even in the services, you'll find a lot of um, catechetical materials and a, and a quick uh, to, uh, to Vaughn. Dobre dien would be for afternoon. <laughs> it's evening. Dobre yeah, I, I actually had just recently told someone, um, you know, go to vigil. Because yeah, go to vigil. It, vigil it, is super listen, rich. Listen to the canons. And if the canons are in a language that you don't understand, read them. Go home, read them. It'll probably take you a few minutes to go to, um, you know, the, the Orthodox Austin website and pull the canons from there or look in the Meneon for the day and read the canon for the day. If you're, if you're not actually praying the canon and you're just reading it to understand the words, it's, it's going to take you like five to ten minutes. Even if you're a slow reader, canons are pretty short. You know, without all the accompanying prayers and, and and everything, there's so much theology, so much history, so much like tender care for the soul that you will get so much dogma from the canons of the church that are provided for us every single day that it's it's crazy to skip out on them. It's it's insane to think that you could just sort of glaze you know, have your eyes glazed over while the canons are being read at matins oh, and yeah. think you're going to get anything out of sitting there. Well, it's like, even you're before get it by matins. Putting, yourself, putting yourself in there. Yeah, I, I mean, even before matins, the, the daily triparia, kantakian, yeah. the, the octoyakos, they all contain uh, incredible amounts of theology, right? So it's yes. one of the best places. Is, it's like I've been telling some of my inquirers here in Lethbridge. Uh, the best thing to do is go to vigil and listen attentively, especially because fortunately here in Lethbridge, we do our vigil predominantly in English. There's a couple parts that we do in Slavonic, you know, to, to honor our, our roots. And there are a couple of Slavs at our parish. Um, and so, you know, occasionally I'll, I'll do things in, in church Slavonic to some small extent. But, you know, the, the beauty is, is that when you go, you organically hear in worship how we worship and not just in terms of the proper style of worship, but with a proper understanding, because even when it comes to example for for things with the Holy Trinity, um, you know, whenever you ask for anyone to describe the Holy Trinity, uh, uh, Trinity, a lot of the time the analogies end up being incorrect and either indicative of things like Sabellianism, modalism, uh, or uh, or tritheism. Yeah. And uh, as as Saint Basil the Great said, you know these kind of beliefs, especially when he was referring to uh, to Sabellianism, is impious and blasphemous, right? So that's why in, in Orthodox worship we also try to strive for theological accuracy, right? You know, you, many times you'll hear uh, in in the vigil service Christ referred to as one He both deceased and two natures, right? Or, you know, and and that. You know, and or you'll hear how you know the the Holy Trinity is is you know three persons in in one usia, you know. So you'll you'll hear all sorts of little things that will start to kind of tickle your brain if you've never been uh, familiarized with it before. I mean, there's even uh, incredible <laughs> selections from the Menaean where uh, I, it was for one of the feasts of the Theotokos, I believe, where it made a reference to uh, uh, you know to saying that uh, let let those be struck in the face that deny her as Mother of God, right? Um, I, I should have brought my uh, great canon book just in the great canon alone yeah. today. Oh, uh, yeah, the great so canon of Saint Trinitarian Andrew. Trinitarian theology, so mm -hmm. much knowledge and in, phrased in so many different ways to make it as understandable as possible in glorifying the Holy Trinity, but in the fullness of the understanding of the Holy Trinity. It, it's you, you can't just turn your brain off and go to a service. You can't do that. One, yeah. why are you even there? That's disrespectful to God. Well, and, and it's all, a violation of the gospel, right? To, to be yeah. watchful lest you fall into sin. Could you not stay awake with me one hour? <laughs> exactly. But just how much you're short selling yourself by not taking a little bit of initiative. And and even if you do tune out, I mean, it's 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 going to happen. 
let's let's face it it's going to happen you're going to tune out it's a long service for people who aren't used to it you know so what's a good tired. piece of advice to kind of circumvent that problem would you say father for 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 newcomers and inquirers who might tune out or even orthodox oh. christians who might struggle with that what would you think would be a good coping strategy I, to help good, them get back on track just be very watchful watchful of yourself and the moment you realize that your thoughts are starting to drift away, rein them in. Rein them in immediately. No matter how long you've been sitting there daydreaming, no matter how long you've been, you know, wondering, oh, I have to pay this and that bill, that's all just a distraction. Rein it in and focus right then and there. Make the effort in that moment to focus. And then yes. anything that you may have missed, if if you really are focusing on it, you're gonna feel that gap on what what you may have missed. Go back. Go, go, you know, when you go home, just quickly read over, read over a service. If you don't know where to find service texts, if you don't know where to find, you know, the, the, the dailies or this and that, ask, ask, ask your priest, ask, you know, other parishioners, especially if it's an English speaking parish. I'm sure there's, there's plenty of people there who know the liturgical resources. Everything is available. Everything. We, we are not a church of secrets. No service text is hidden from anyone. Yeah, Everyone can, can read it. Shebny can read what the priest does in the altar if you're really curious. Yeah, I, there, there's websites out there that put out the variables for every single service for the daily, very well constructed. So that, you know, there's, there's, we live in an age of so much information that there's really, aside from maybe being illiterate, I suppose, if you are still illiterate or maybe having, you know, some sort of impediment. There, there's very few excuses to not being able to access materials, to not being able to read materials. Well, and, and a good piece of advice from St. Seraphim of Saraf uh, for that as well is to, you know, have your prayer rope on hand and to start doing some Jesus prayers if you find your mind wandering so that at least in some way you're keeping your heart focused on God. And yeah, that's when you're there to worship. Someone so, pointed out, I, I can definitely sympathize with that, of the tuning out if, if everything is not in your language you know say you walk into a church and everything is greek or or, or slavonic it, it is going to be hard admittedly if you don't know a single word of what's going on you know if it's your first time or you know a few times in it, it's it's going to that's going to happen but invest yourself in it you have to really put yourself into it pay attention find find somewhere to read uh, there's definitely plenty of clergy who would be fine. I mean, even the great piece of advice that Father Vladimir Morin had given me is we all have phones for the most part, but most of us are going to have a phone in our hand, yeah. in our pocket. Why not use that device to look up the services and follow along if you have to? Why not print it out if you can? But you can follow along. Just invest yourself little bit by little bit you know, learning the motions, seeing how things move, focus on those things, even if the words aren't coming to you, but focus, learn it little by little, and it will come to you, you putting Absolutely. in that little bit of effort, God will reward you, God will enlighten you to learn little bits well, and, and pieces. And there, there's the whole thing with struggle too, you know, having struggle is not a bad thing, but in today's day and age, we're kind of conditioned to reject struggle, yes. to to almost hate it, to want instant gratification. If you can't understand it, you can't get it, you don't have access to it right away. So many people just throw in the towel and say, well, I give up. It's, it's too hard. Yeah. But, you know, God loves a good struggle. This is, I mean, St. John of Constant, I think, sums it up best when he says that a Christian without a cross is no Christian at all. We yeah. shouldn't grumble about our crosses. You know, we, we should carry them with long suffering, with patience, with dignity, humility, as best we can. Um, and, you know, part of that is is taking the time to say, okay, you know, I'm not going to get all this right away. You know, whether it's language, theology. Um, uh, you know, I saw some questions about the Trinity that uh, I, I decided to star so that we can address some some things later because you know we're going to do a Q and A later. We will yeah. grab some of these things up here. Um, but you know, it's it's so important for us to to be patient with ourselves and not think that we can or should understand everything right away. You know, it's it's important to have good guides. You know, and and one of the best things you can have is a good spiritual father. Um, having a good spiritual father to help form your background, both you know theologically and with regards to spiritual praxis, is 
essential. Um, St. Ignatius called, you know, kind of pointed out how the Israelites needed a mediator in Moses. Well, just because you've decided to follow God and come into union with him doesn't mean you, you can just do it by yourself. You need a mediator. And even as priests, we have spiritual fathers. You know, we have yeah. to have a spiritual father. We have to be accountable to the bishop. There has to be someone who acts as our mediator and someone, and, you know, for, for any Protestant potentially watching this, that doesn't mean that Christ is not the sole mediator between God and man. Let's Let's not get it all twisted like that. It's, you know, Christ is the sole mediator between God and man because he is both fully God and fully man. You know, he, he is. There, there's, there's a big danger of making yourself your own self-directed spiritual guide, your own spiritual father, your own authority, because it's so easy for us to forget if we pull ourselves out of that hierarchy of that direct subordination to someone physically, to, to a, another person of above our station, it's so easy for us to forget that we are subordinate to God, to Christ himself, that he is the head. So we, yes. it's so easy to fall into a delusion, a pride of thinking, well, I can do all of this and that on my own. It's the exactly. one of the greatest benefits of obedience is that it always keeps us in mind of our obedience to the Lord. And uh, just, just so as a quick little nod to where you're originally uh, from, Father, uh, just as a quick little interlude, Florida is supporting you. <laughs> just, just it's always in. good to, see, uh, God bless you, to see some Floridians out there. Yeah, his father is originally from Miami. That's uh, yes. He moved from Miami to uh, Ontario to, to marry uh, my sister, actually. So <laughs> it's pretty cool. Um, yeah. So, you know, the, the thing is, is that uh, we... When we come into the church and we we look for these guides, it, it's it's ultimately also to help us humble ourselves so that we don't just think to ourselves, well, you know, I've got this all figured out or I can direct my own spiritual life. Because a lot of the time what happens is people fall into delusion. You know, I've had people much think too little. Oh, no, yeah. No, I've, I've had people come to me little. who've That's had true. crazy yeah. ideas and no one to really keep them from going off the deep end into into something where it could even lead them into demonic delusion. As the what is it? Uh, the. Father Cosmos loves to say that the people who will only eat fried air and then they're working heavy physical labor jobs. It's like, no, we, we have to be discerning, but how can we be discerning when we're young in the faith? You know, how can yeah. someone who is just, oh, I, I've just been a convert for a few weeks. Uh, I'm going to go and, and, you know, do tons and tons and tons of prayers and do all these crazy huge fasts it's like no 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 start with the basics but how are you going to know what the basics are without a spiritual father without someone to guide you without someone that you trust to put your soul well, in, and, and in not all, not all spiritual fathers are equal not every single priest is or should be or can be a spiritual father i mean Typically, it's good for that priest if he's doing that to have a blessing from his priest. Yes. Um, there are some traditional Rokor priests who would say um, things like, you know, oh, well, you know, I'm not a spiritual father. So, you know, when when you're coming into the church, when you're when you're first starting, you can't you can't just go, oh, well, that's it. You know, I'm, I'm just going to read and figure this out by myself. You need you need to have that guidance. You need to have well, a good priest. I, I will say the um, exactly uh, Jason's what you're saying is. No, that, that is true. We start where you are. That's exactly what I'm saying. You start where you are. You don't, you know, where you're going to start here, but you're not going to, you know, want, you're not going to shoot up to here. You're going to start small, start small. And then yes, look for a spiritual father to help guide you. But you yeah. start, you start where you are. You come to the church as you are, who you are. And yeah, you we're, we were fortunate point. to have Father Vladimir. I mean, Father Vladimir had a very good spiritual father at uh, Jordanville, Father Kiprian, who was uh, the, the known as great iconographer of Jordanville. He um, he did actually, fun fact, he was the one who I believe primarily painted most of the icons or wrote most of the icons of the cathedral. And there's quite a few uh, famous Jordanville classic icons that he had written. Um, but that being said, yeah, you have to start where you are with your priest. Um, uh, and and I will go into more depth on this, but to answer Brody's quick question here, typically spiritual fathers, at least when you're dealing with in the world, um, they should be clergy. <laughs> you know, uh, lay people cannot and should not be spiritual fathers. There's one, there was one rare case. I can't remember which uh, saint it was. It might have been in the life of Elder Euronymous when he was of Aigina when he was young. I believe his spiritual father or his spiritual guide was actually a super, super holy 
layman, but uh, that's not really common these days. And, and in all reality, it should either be a priest, a or bishop, a or a hero monk, or yeah. uh, in certain cases, just members of the great schema. So just a monastic father can be yeah. a spiritual father in certain cases. Like you look at, at the life of St. Paisios, uh, you know, people see the name Father Paisios in, the, in, in some of the writings and assume he was a priest. He was not actually. Yeah. Uh, St. Paisios was never ordained to the priesthood or even to the diaconate. Um, the title of father is conferred upon monastics when they enter into uh, the great schema or when they become a rassal for. Um, they can be referred to as um, father. I do um, want to point out that uh, that was a good question that that Jason's had uh, on clarifying that point of uh, that. Yes, we do start where we are, where we come into the church. Yeah. And, and, and asking the questions father isn't going to be, it's not going to be an instantaneous thing. We do have to do a deal, a, a great deal of working on things on our own. Yes, definitely. Of our own effort, because we do have to put in the work. Yes. But we should try to find the spiritual father that, that it will help immensely. It will help immensely. Yeah. And, and, and some, some people, when, when they hear me say great schema, it doesn't always mean like the really cool, you know, megala schema monks, right. Or, or Stavrofor is the term cross bearing. Um, just to kind of clarify any confusion on that, you know, the Stavrofor monks are the ones that you see with the really cool um, uh, great schemas that they wear. And it's, it's just like, wow, it, it's, it's amazing because these are people who have truly died to the world and their life is completely devoted to prayer. They hardly speak. I think there's there's one at Holy Cross in Virginia, I'm, uh, but I'm not sure. They're, they're very rare to find. They're, it's it's a beautiful thing. You know, you know, may we all just obtain even just a tenth of that kind of prayer. You know, where we where we have fervent love for God. So, Father, to kind of move the, the topics along a bit. Yeah. Um, we of course another common pitfall we see with with beginners is understanding what is a prayer rule and how do we avoid prayer rule burnout. Yes. Take it slow, especially before you have a spiritual father, which, again, it could take a long time to find someone that you trust to do that. Or even if you don't know how or if you're you know, it's kind of hard to connect to people, you should make that effort. But starting out. It's so easy to over overdo it. You know, we have to treat prayer exactly as it is. It's it's it takes work, it takes effort. It's a muscle that we have to build, truly. We don't, you know, when you first come to the church, especially when you first get baptized, when someone gets first received, they're going to feel like they can run a million marathons, you know, that they, they can read their entire Akathis book in one sitting, that you could do a million canons, that prayer just feels so easy. But that's going to wane. Once that grace from baptism gets pulled back so that you have to stand on your own two feet it will become hard to pray it will become hard to focus and that's why we need to build the muscle of prayer by starting small yeah uh, don't don't one... try to do 300 jesus prayers a day right away if you yes. really yeah, never no. had a structured prayer life <laughs> you know? yeah I, I it's 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 difficult especially to it's one I mean, it's thing to ideal. to just go through the motions and say the jesus prayer but to effectively, effectively internalize that prayer in, you know, time. out of your mouth, into your mind, into your heart, into your, in, you, through your, your, your noose. It's, it's so difficult to do that, that we do want to start small and, and one very not forcefully. Necessarily, as a quick disclaimer, one should not necessarily attempt to get into the weeds of noetic prayer without a experienced spiritual father or or you know even getting a blessing from your priest to speak to a monk uh from an uh, like for example from saint anthony's greek orthodox monastery or you know or wherever where someone might have experience with the jesus prayer it's very important to not um get too excited to the point where you're like oh well i'm going to just do noetic prayer because you might end up deluding yourself there i mean even in the life of saint paisios he was doing the jesus prayer one night and he uh, it looked like christ had appeared above the, the room of his cell, but he, you know, being humble, realized that this was not Christ. And he even said, you know, who am I? You know, I'm, who am I? I'm not worthy. Christ would not come to see me. I'm not worthy. And sure enough, it was the devil in disguise trying to, uh, trying to tempt the saint, trying to tempt him off of uh, his, um, off of his, his prayer. Um, 
Okay, I, I yeah. see a, a few comments on on that. It's a uh, the thing with overburdening yourself too much on prayer is is for for some people it does become like a, a kind of a trap in that you say, oh well, I'm gonna do say a hundred Jesus prayers every hour, something you know, or it's 200, 500. I'm gonna do five hundred Jesus prayers in 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 one sitting, in one hour, in this and that. Um, <laughs> And then the next day, the next you, you do it. Maybe you do it. Maybe you actually do it very, very prayerfully, very zealously, very great on day one. Day two comes and suddenly you're dragging your heels on doing it because you realize how how difficult it is. But for some people, being able to take that step back and say, OK, this is too difficult. This is too much for me and I need to scale it back. Some people won't have that discernment. A lot of people won't have that discernment, and they'll they'll just burn out entirely and say, "Well, I, I can't pray. I can't do this." Yeah. Or, and even though we're not quite at Q and A yet, I wanted to bring this up because this is a really good comment from Austin. Thank you for sharing this, um, because it it, it actually it, this is a common thing people have too that kind of leads into the topic that we're discussing is that uh, people can you know start off very zealous in their prayer rule and then they find that they go down. But actually, Saint John Clamacus. And step one of the ladder has something very good to say about that. And that in all reality, even though you will go through periods of being hot and cold, um, it's better to start off strong and zealous so that the memory of your zeal comes to you and motivates you and pushes you back on a right path. You know, hopefully it gets to the point where we consistently say to ourselves, what, what is wrong with me? Why am I not giving my all for Christ? Why am I holding myself back? I need to go back to this and really not just do it to feel good about myself or to feel good inside. But I need to do this out of love for Christ, out of uh, philotimo, I believe is the Greek word for that. Yeah, take, take advantage of, of the times that you're hot to build habits for when you're cold. Like, take advantage of those times. Yes, by all means, start doing maybe a little, you know, more prayer. But make sure that those habits will carry you through the cold times. Yeah. Not doing too much that it becomes a burden. I'll, I'll share when I first converted. I, uh, as, as silly as it seems, as small as it seems of just doing the morning and nighttime prayers. Now, for some people who are already, you know, built that prayer muscle, well, that, that's easy. That's, that's simple. It's very, you know, nice for them to wake up in the morning and do the full, the full set of prayers and the nighttime prayers and do the, the full set of nighttime prayers before bed. But for me, when I first came into the faith, I was doing them after baptism just fine but as that grace started to slowly slowly get pulled back i was i would wake up and i would just sit in bed and i'd be like i don't i don't i have to do these prayers it's a lot of prayers it feels like a long time and it's so hard to get out of bed and i would just sort of just sort of sit there languishing essentially and like oh it seems like so much to have to do and that's when i got the advice from my spiritual father of well chop it up you know, do this and this set, smaller set of things to build up that habit of praying in the morning. And then once you become comfortable with that, once you've become, once it becomes easier, then start to increase, then start to add on to your prayer rule. You know, it's, we can't fall into that rigidity of, of thinking that we can't peel back a little bit you know, or that we can't pull back a little bit on our prayer life when we feel like it's becoming not burdensome, but it's becoming too much to the point that it's we're just mechanically doing it or we're 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 hesitating to do it. Like say you go to wherever you go to pray and you just sit around and you're like, oh, I have to, I have to do all these prayers, I have to do all of this and that. And you're just wasting time because you're so daunted by it. It shouldn't prayer shouldn't be that way prayer should be because you're motivated to want to do it yes exactly and uh there's some great questions in here that i'm, I'm actually starring some of these that i'll be saving for q a such as the one from land plant really good question about finding a spiritual father um but we'll, we'll get to that in the q a so please stick around uh so the you know one one good piece of advice that father vladimir always gave me and definitely would have always given you on prayer rules is that consistency is key Yes. Um, you know, even if it's if it's small to start, as long as you're doing this consistently every single day, you build up that muscle, like Father John said earlier. And as you build up that muscle, 
your desire to pray increases with yeah. time. And always, you know, walk forward slowly when the desire goes. Don't just throw yourself in 100% yet, because if you if you burn out and don't maintain that consistency, then it's hard to make progress in the spiritual life. The, the, um, the, consistency will, the consistency will save you when you're cold too. When you don't want to pray whatsoever, yeah. you will continue doing your prayers, even when you feel nothing. But you, that consistency will, will keep you going when your the your spiritual life has gone from that roaring flame to just little itty bitty embers that you have to tend to yeah and, and that's the thing it's like uh, another good point from austin like very good point is that prayer shouldn't feel like a chore father cosmos actually addressed this in one of his talks where he pointed out that you have to at least have enough love for your soul to want to do the prayers even when you don't feel like praying because you want the benefit and it's like yeah. god i want the benefit i want to draw closer to you you know, I'm a man of clay. I'm feeble. It's hard for me. It's like St. Joseph the Hezekiah yeah. even said, we've got three enemies. We've got, uh, you know, our fallen nature, the devil, and the world itself, which, of course, the devil is the prince of, of the world. He's the prince of the air of this age. But the world has got all these pitfalls and traps in it that are meant to push you down and keep you away from Christ. And, and you know, a lot of people might think, oh, well, that sounds cheesy, but it, it is all about Christ. He is the Logos. So it's all about striving for union with yeah. him. And prayer is really one of the best ways you can begin to have that union with God to really uh, come into it with him. So it, you know, and we can, we can communicate with God. We can commune with him through his uncreated energies, as many of our great hesychastic fathers have said. Um, so avoiding prayer rule burnout ultimately comes down to consistency. Uh, you know, start with uh, a little bit of the morning prayers, the evening prayers, um, prayers before and after you eat. That's a big one for so many people is getting into the habit of praying before and after eating. A lot of yes. people in the West, hey, you know, we, <laughs> you were you were in a Protestant-ish background yes. at one point. Oh, see, I would say kids. <laughs> one, one of the, the, I would say, turning points in my spiritual life was realizing that any moment that I want to pop food into my mouth, you know, I should cross myself. As St. John Chrysostom had said, you know, we need to be praying constantly, crossing ourselves constantly when we're coming in and out of a room, when we're putting on our pants in the morning, when we're eating something. We should always be giving thanks to God and even just building that habit of praying when you're eating, you know, when you're about to eat something. And then when you're done eating, say, say a thanks to the Lord that you, you had this food. That's that contributes to that continual prayer, to that uh, that ceaseless prayer. You know, us living in the world, we can't just sit, you know, sit like a monk and dedicate our lives to just prayer. We have distractions. We have obligations. We have jobs. all of these other things, jobs, all of this and that. But if we're constantly saying, thank you, God, thank you, God, for, you know, for this clothes. Thank you, God, for this food. Thank you, God, that. I'm looking at something that's beautiful, this nature, you know, that I'm warm, that I'm alive, but constantly thanking God in every step that we take, that's prayer. That's how we achieve ceaseless prayer. Prayer will become easy if we're constantly internalizing that. And a big place to start practicing that is if you aren't already, when you go to eat food, just cross yourself. Maybe if you're going to eat a meal, say our father. Or get to the point where you're saying the, you know, our father every single time you eat something, even if it's you're having a little snack, even if you're having something small, just say our father, you know, give thanks to God that you have this nourishment that he's given to you. Yes, exactly. I just wanted to put that comment up there real quick because it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a good channel. If you really want to get some good yes. kind of catechetical lectures on any topic, Check out Orthodox Talks, Father Cosmos. We've all been missing him. He hasn't done a talk since Talk 83. I hear he's working on a book, but I don't know. It's, it's just a rumor I heard. I'm not sure, but if if you're not listening to Orthodox Talks now, please you're listen. You're missing to out. It. You're <laughs> really missing out on a lot so of good. After this live stream, keep... go listen. <laughs> yes. Or, you know, in your day-to-day, -day, he even talks about it in, in some of the, the later talks, the middle talks, where, you know, how the people who are listening to the recorded talks how blessed it is because they can just sit there and listen to a talk and then listen to it again while they're doing something. You'll pick up on little bits and pieces here and there of the full conversation versus if you were sitting there and listening to a four hour talk live, 
your eyes are going to glaze over. You're not going to absorb everything. And he said it himself. You're just not. You're not going to absorb every little thing that he's saying. But just listen to the talks here and there while you're, you know, while you're cleaning, while you're working, while you're driving. Listen to them. He will catechize you. He will teach you so much. And every single thing that he says is backed up by the saints. He, anytime he says his own opinion, he will say it. It's his opinion. And that you don't really have to follow it, but you should. But you don't really have to follow it. But well, you, he will you say listen, everything though, is the saints. You'll learn so much. And I, just a quick shout out to Jason <laughs> there. You know, happy to help out. Honestly, one thing that you'll find about Orthodox saints, you will find so many saints from different backgrounds. You will find there's a saint for everything, for everyone. And really, the, the whole point of that as well is that you can see yourself in their lives and see how you too should and can strive for holiness. You too can have union with God. You can you can come close to Christ. You can emulate him. Every, you know, so many saints were at one point terrible sinners and or have done terrible things and god transforms their lives so never anyone who's watching this who's maybe got some struggles in their lives don't give up you know look up look up various different saints look up saints for different things there's you know you can find a lot surprisingly on google yeah. but you know there's there's so many saints that can help you see the light at the end of the tunnel in a real good way when it comes to your struggles where that light at the end of the tunnel is in fact christ and yeah, I, he's I, I, drawing you to him Exactly what he's saying. I guarantee you, whatever struggles you're facing, there's a saint who's faced those same struggles. There's a saint that you can find solace in, that you can ask for, you know, that saint's prayers to help you, to carry you through these struggles, because they've they've done it, and they've overcome through the grace of God, and they are saints. So never think that your struggles are insurmountable, and that there's no saint out there that can't relate to you or that you can't relate to. Yeah, it's true. And uh, just, just so people know, if you're asking questions, I am actually saving them for the Q&A portion. So don't worry if you don't get an answer to the question right away. You are going to get one, actually. And, and even if you can't stay on for the whole live stream, um, you know, you can always go back and watch. It'll be towards the end of the live stream. Um, is there a saint for grieving? That's a good question. I'm going to put you in Q&A. There, there definitely is. There's always a saint that... Uh, if you look at their lives, you're going to find someone you can relate to. That's a really good question from uh, Magdalene. So I, I will um, I will definitely get to that. Same with Jason's last question. There's really good questions in this in this group tonight. Um, so moving forward, one of the most dangerous things that we can encounter in the Orthodox spiritual life is what we call prelist or spiritual delusion. Yes. So Father John, what are some things? Um, that you would say are common uh, forms of prelists that, that converts might be uh, endangered by, and how do we avoid that? And, hello, Chase. <laughs> Good to see you, my friend. I, God bless you. <laughs> a really, I think, big form of spiritual delusion that uh, people will encounter is feeling that they're too messed up, that they're too much of a sinner. Mm to come to church to pray to go to confession that's delusional that's i'm sorry but that that's delusional to think that the only sin that is too big is the one that you don't ask god to forgive that you don't go to your priest to look for forgiveness that you don't work towards fighting against that is the real big sin it is it is a delusional thought and that that is going to be a big one, I think, for a lot of, of of people, especially early on, is that you might have some who the other the other form of delusion is the flip side of that is they come to the church, they get baptized, they start doing um, a million they think prayers. They're illumined. They, <laughs> they, they come yes, in with they, a three hundred knot prayer rope. <laughs> they they think that you know you're you're praying and you're floating on a cloud while you're praying like or you're you're floating like Saint Mary of Egypt while you're praying. It's like no no no, you are not. You are just full of pride. Yeah. But those, those are two, I think, common, the two common pitfalls is the, the same side of the same of, of the coin, you know, or the two sides of the same coin of uh, feeling like you're the worst, absolute worst, unsavable, that not even God could save you or thinking that you're so holy that you're a living saint. You're, you're neither. You're neither. You're, Actually, you're in the middle. Really, that's a good one to add on to what you were saying, Father, uh, from from our good friend Chase. Yes, despair is actually a form of pride, believe it or not. Yes. 
um, despair places you on such a level where you think that on a cosmological level that you are the worst or that you could in particular have such a place in, in the created order to upset God to the point where you can't be forgiven. But th this is a lie. And the devil will tempt you with this. Yeah, um, it's, it's more than thinking like you're the worst sinner because we should we should internalize that. that yeah, our, our sins are terrible, that our sins more than anyone else's our own sins. No one else can commit the sins that we can commit because we, I am me. No one can commit the sins that I can commit. They're the worst. But if we think our sins are more powerful than God, that's what we're saying. When you're saying God can't forgive this sin, you yeah, are putting yeah. a limit on God. You are saying that your sinfulness, you are more powerful than God is to yeah. forgive us. And, and essentially, you're placing your judgment above God's. Um, this is also why we, we have to avoid judging people, right? Like we can call out errors. We can say so-and-so is wrong on this. You know, if so-and-so is an unrepentant uh, spreader and espouser of heresy, well, they are a heretic. It's not a pejorative. It's a, it's a category to describe somebody who holds a false belief and who yeah. teaches it and refuses to recant of it. Um, but that being said, we shouldn't. We shouldn't judge other people and say, well, you know, a good example from the saints is is saying that, uh, oh, you know, my my brother lied. Well, that's correct to say he lied. But to go and call your brother a liar, well, now you're you're attributing something to his soul. Yeah, you're, you're just being spiteful at that point, really. It's it's yeah, it's exactly that. It's one thing to say, you know, to go to your brother and say, hey, you know, what you're saying is it's heretical. Here's some information on why it's heretical. You shouldn't be saying that, but it's another to just go and say to everyone, Hey, you guys shouldn't talk to, you know, this guy, cause he's a heretic. He said this and this, that that's slander that, that you are far worse than he is for that. Mm -hmm. No, exactly. And, and, and that's the thing, like we can't just assume things. It's, you know, especially when it comes to people within the church, when it comes to things outside, well, St. Ignatius has, very wise words on that. Don't partake and don't read the teachings of heretics uh, because they, they're not guided by the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit guided the church in terms of uh, the, the scriptures, in terms of what is scripture. You know, so when we look at the canon of the New Testament, the Old Testament, all of this was inspired by the Holy Spirit working through people. You know, it, it's, it's not like some strange deus ex machina, the book floated down from heaven. Um but, you know, that, that's the thing is, is that it's, um, oh, wow, fasting brain kicked in. <laughs> um, where, where was I going, Father? <laughs> Deus Ex Machina was the last thing that you yeah, said. Yeah, yeah. So, that it, that, you know, in the spiritual life, things things come by way of, of God working with people, right? And so when we, when we have the saints, when we have the scriptures, which are formed by the saints, um, we, we need to also read guides when reading the Holy Scriptures. We need to have a light to read it by. That light, of course, a lot of people say is holy tradition. This is correct. But who best communicates the tradition and how to understand these things, uh, th these things, and that would be the Holy Fathers because they are formed and guided and illumined by the same Holy Spirit that gave us the Holy Scriptures. You know, a, a good witness to that is the consistency across the holy fathers across the saints right it's that absolute consistency yeah don't, and don't that's be how you can read, see the holy spirit yeah don't don't be scared to read saint john chrysostom in any of his explanations of the gospels or of the epistles yeah read Beautiful. read the gospels and the epistles yourself it's good you know read a chapter of the gospel and read two chapters of the epistles every day like father john christianken says to everybody he would say that to everybody read a gospel read one chapter of the gospels two of the epistles do it on yeah. your own time but also check in check in with saint john chrysostom check in with yeah. saint theophylact yes i was going to recommend saints. um the commentaries by saint uh, theophylact of bulgaria yeah you know they're they're almost like condensed versions of saint john chrysostom's homilies because the i mean i've got two full volumes of uh of saint john chrysostom's homilies on the book of matthew alone it's massive yeah it's, um, it's a lot it's a lot to take in, like if you ever get a St. John Chrysostom commentary on, say, a gospel, it's gonna be like this big. Yeah. But, yeah. but read it. No, no, read it because you will understand everything that he's saying. St. John Chrysostom spoke so 
simply, clearly. so clear. clearly, so understandably that he said a lot, but he said a lot that you will understand. Pace yourself, but read it. it, it it's You will get so much from that, so much understanding of the Gospels. Because St. John Chrysostom is going to talk of the historical context of what was being said, the traditions of the surrounding events, the theology of it, the dogma, how we should apply this to our lives. It's, there's so much to learn from him. I, just reading little snippets of what he's saying, it's so enlightening. Yeah, and, and of course, uh, the Desert Fox, who I'm, I'm going to be uh, bringing on as a moderator for the next uh, live chat, um, he he actually said reading his commentaries on Romans and he I'm just gonna put it up. It's a uh, it's a good comment. You know, it's it's difficult, yeah. But uh, you know, sometimes you're not ready right away. But when it comes to the Gospels, I definitely would recommend, and you can get them from Jordanville, uh, the ones uh, the commentaries by Saint Theophilact of, of Bulgaria because they actually contain the whole Gospel in them, and chapter by chapter, line by line, he has his commentaries after each portion. So you're getting something really rich if you. Want a good uh, gospel copy, though, in, in my opinion, what, what trumps in, in terms of the New Testament commentaries, um, the best copy of the Gospels to get is the Holy Apostles Convent, um, Evangelistarian, Evangelistarian. The, the, basically, it's just the Gospels. It's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Yeah. But each Gospel comes with its own endnote. And that's where it, it kind of goes beyond uh, the Orthodox Study Bible that way, because you have endnotes that will sometimes have these extensive commentaries on even just one or two verses sometimes from the Holy Fathers. And it could be everyone from from uh, Saint Bede um, to uh, you know to to Saint uh, Kirill of Alexandria in some cases, or you could be getting ones from Blessed uh, Theophilact, Saint John Chrysostom. Uh, so many commentators. It's it's incredible to have that. It's it's an incredible incredible um, commodity. Yeah, it's 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 worth a lot. Um, and yeah, you, you probably just weren't ready. You're not at that level yet or that stage in your life yet in your spiritual life. Maybe you might never be. And that's OK. That's also OK to not reach those points. You know, it's but have the trust when you hear someone, you know, quoting St. John Chrysostom or quoting St. Theophilact or other saints, just have that trust that, yeah, that's correct. Even if it's hard for you to engage with the source material itself, because I, I can see that too. It's a lot. It is a lot to condense, and some of the stuff on the epistles is is difficult because that's that's really when he's going to get into a lot of theology is in the epistles. Whereas in the gospels, it's going to be a lot of historical context. It's going to be a lot of explaining exactly, you know, who was what, who. You well, know, and, and the significance of certain things because a lot of people will take, for example, and. I have no problem addressing this here right now is the, the whole Matthew 23 thing. And it's like Matthew 23, you know, call no man father, really, you know, but then they, it's funny because the Protestants who love to bring that, that whole call no man father thing up. Well then, you know, forget that it also says, and call no man your teacher or your guide upon the earth. Yeah. Yet they'll call and their, their ministers pastors, which means guide or shepherd. Well, I thought Jesus said there's only one shepherd. So by that same account, we can level the same word concept fallacy. Um, yeah, well, I mean, it, it's it's also, you know, you see the Holy Apostle Paul in the epistles. He writes, he calls people father. He, yeah. he says it. He calls he, he himself, that title. He himself as fathering the Corinthians in faith. Beginning them he gives the people gospel. that title. It, 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 he meant no one ahead of, you know, of him. Well, it's, it, it's an idiomatic statement, right? Yeah. So it's like, call no man your father upon the earth. But he, of course, prefaces this with, you know, the, the ones who love the greetings in the market, who love sitting at the head of the table. You know, basically, he's saying, you know, these people who are vainglorious and who are just in it for the praise and not to serve God. These are not people you should call your father because they will not yeah. they will not father you in faith. They will father you in the cult of personality. In fact, this is something that we Orthodox priests sign in our ordination um, oaths is not to have a call to personality around us. And there, there are parishes out there, and I've seen, unfortunately, some I'm aware of some, I'm not going to name them, um, where the priest has definitely set himself up as kind of the the focal point of the parish rather than Christ being the focal point. Well, and at that point, you become a guru. Yeah, You're, exactly. And, and it, gurus not, can even try to play the normal card, right? They can try to be like, oh, I'm I'm so normal. I'm, I'm so worldly. But, you know, a lot of the time, they're, they're trying to supplant 
church teachings with shortcuts that they find easy and appealing. So, and, and that's even what, what uh, St. Ignatius Brianchaninoff would call uh, being carnally minded because you, you know, you're interested in earthly worldly wisdom and trying to find a way to make the church take that in rather than ascending to the heavenly wisdom of the church. Yeah, it's, yeah, that, that, that's another dangerous solution. That's a talk for another time, I think. <laughs> yeah. That definitely another talk for another time. Just a quick shout out to Orthodox Boomer Grandma. I've always always loved her. She's always popping in on live streams. Great support. Good to see you. Um, so fasting. So we're going to talk a little bit about fasting, and then we're going to get to Q and A. So of yes. course, this is now the start of Great Holy Lent. Uh, I think Father and I have both been going through the harrowing experience of uh, what we call Clean Monday. In Clean Monday is uh, typically, according to the fasting guidelines of the church, is a day where you completely abstain from all food. Yeah. Um, for many people, this is so hard to do. It's and extremely this is where, hard. Pardon? It's extremely hard. Yeah. It's, it's very, very hard. And it's especially coming in new as a Westerner, where as a Westerner, we are taught essentially to see food and put it in your mouth and it's everywhere no questions. it's everywhere you go out you see yeah. advertisements billboards fast food joints convenience stores yep. you know every gas station has a bag of chips waiting in there for you when you, you know maybe you don't like chips normally like like me and then you suddenly see that when you're fasting and the temptation turns but this is why it's such an important training tool so what what is ultimately the aim of fasting father well, the aim of fasting is to, one, humble ourselves, humble our bodies, make sure that our bodies aren't satiated, that we're not smugly self-assured in being okay in our smallness. We need that, that, that hunger helps us to know how small we are, how fragile, how weak we are, just being a little bit hungry from denying ourselves a little bit. It helps to tame the carnal passions. Um, it helps us focus in prayer. The benefits for fasting, for making a good attempt at fasting are are limitless. It's it's Christ himself commands us to fast. He doesn't say when you just when you pray, he says when you fast and when pray. You fast. And the servant isn't greater than the master. You know, Christ didn't begin his earthly ministry before being baptized. Well, we can't truly enter into the life of Christ without being initiated into the church through baptism. And of course, if that isn't to say if you're received into, uh, into the church by chrismation, you're not in the church, you are. Um, you know, the, the baptism should be the standard, but that's definitely a talk for another day. But either way, the point is there's always a point of entry to something. You know, whether you're, you know, how you're received into the church and, and being brought into the life in Christ. And then, of course, imitating Christ. Well, imitating Christ doesn't mean you get to sit around all day talking about how nice Jesus is and thinking that Jesus was just about being a nice guy. Jesus, when you look at it, this is a, you know, Jesus went into the desert for 40 days with no food or water. And it's like after 40 days, that's when the gospel says after 40 days, he got hungry. Which one of us could do this? <laughs> like This is yeah, a superhuman it, it, feat of asceticism. Yeah. Where he's shown us the way to perfection. Only great saints who are truly enlightened and grace-filled can do anything like that. And you see it in the lives of the saints that sometimes you'll have a saint who is subsisting solely on communion. Like I, I think in uh, in the latter, in one of the later portions of the latter, there there are there are monks that Saint John Climacus is talking about that are uh, going on all of Lent just communing and that's it yeah. that's all they're eating i think we can't do that because we're not full of grace we're not full yeah, I think of that saint zosimus was one of them uh the the same saint zosimus who had uh communed saint mary of egypt i believe he i went through. think so i'm not i'm not 100 yeah. percent on that but I, i'm not either. um but yeah i it's it's fasting is it's it is difficult we do just like prayer we have to especially young in the faith we have to build into it that even if has to start very consistent even if fasting came normal, came easy to us before converting, right? I barely, I didn't eat that much before I converted. I would have maybe one meal a day sometimes. I was just really bad at eating. Um, but when I converted and I had to fast for God, when I had to fast 
to tame my passions. That's when it gets hard. I was hungry. I don't know where it came from. Well, so I know easy to fast from. to look good, right? It's like, yes. oh, you want to look good. You want to. When, you when we are right. fasting <laughs> for ourselves for vain reasons, it's easy. It it sometimes feels the the easiest thing in the world. But when we want to fast to work on our spiritual lives, that's when we get attacked. That's when we really get attacked. But we have to build ourselves up to learning how to fast in that way. And, you know, some people maybe, you know, maybe God has blessed you and, and you can do the fast as prescribed out of right out of the gates. And, you know, more power to you. That's beautiful. That's great. Yeah. Do it. And, and, cool. and you know, remember that this is only because God has helped you. He he gives each of us sometimes good launching points, good tools. Some people have a real strong affinity for uh, theology, for example. Some people have a strong affinity for the services, for liturgical music. And some people have a really strong uh, affinity for basically anything ascetical. But asceticism cannot be fueled by vainglory. And this is why, you know, it's so hard when, like you were pointing out, you're eating one meal a day, but then you have to fast for God and suddenly it's hard. It kind of reminds me of, of one of the accounts from the Optina elders where, uh, you know, young elder, uh, when he was first coming into the monastery, he became an elder later on, but he, he approached uh, Elder Lev uh, to be his spiritual father and to come into the monastery under his guidance. And uh, when he was a layman, he he prepared for monastic life in the world by doing a thousand prostrations every single day. It's a young Russian man, you know, he was boom, just a thousand prostrations daily. But when he went to the monastery and he told Elder Lev this, he said, okay, you know, just do, uh, you know, like, I think it was a low number, like, you know, for him at least, like 50, couldn't do 50, then it was 25, he couldn't even do 25, couldn't even do five prostrations. And when he said, why, why is this the case? Why am I unable to do it? You know, the elder pointed out to him is because when you were in the world and you were doing this out of love for yourself, the devil assisted you with your pride. But here, doing it under obedience, it's a lot harder now because you don't have that help. And so, yeah. it, you know, it's kind of like when you come to the church, you have to obey yeah. and you have to fast. Ease into it. Ease into it. And like I said, if you can do it, if you find the fasting to be easy to follow the full rubrics, that's great. But you should probably be doing more prayer then as well, because if the fasting is easy for you, then it's not that much of a struggle now, is it? Versus if you are like spitting blood, trying to hold back you know, not eating a piece of cheese <laughs> and it takes all of your willpower <laughs> to not have a piece of cheese during Lent. That's a lot. That's a lot of effort. And you're doing it for God. You're not doing it because, oh, I'm, I, I don't want to eat this cheese because it's going to make me fat and I'm going to get, you know, all the, the belly, the curves, all the fat in the wrong places. No, you're doing it because you want to conquer those carnal passions, that impulse to just satisfy yourself. That's a that's in itself an ascetic feat, yeah. You know, but it's it's we have to understand the, the level things that add up. The little things add up big time. It's just like you know, if you're, you know, I, I knew somebody who struggled with prayer. They weren't able to get a prayer book right away, but they had a prayer rope, and they would just add one Jesus prayer a day. Yeah, and it got easier and easier and easier. You know, we and and that's the thing. As long as as long as you can be consistent with it, this is a great tool. But if if you can't be consistent then, you know, you're going to have a problem. So start small, start small. Don't, don't try to do the whole thing right away. Just because, you know, you've got a whole thing here to work with doesn't mean you have to hit all of it all at once. You can go up the ladder bit by bit by bit. One thing I, I would recommend to you is, is if you do have a spiritual father, <laughs> if you do actually have a spiritual father, don't just decide your True. fasting rules on your own though. Seek his advice seek his blessing even if he gives you a lighter even if it's blatantly obvious that you you know you need a reduced say lenten rule because of circumstances in life still seek that blessing from your spiritual father because then it will be blessed you don't want to just do that of your own volition that's that is if you already do have a spiritual father if you have to make those decisions on your own obviously pray about it and you know you're going to have to do what you're going to have to do but if you do have a spiritual father, please ask him first before you start making up your own rules. Yeah, and, and if if you have restrictions like dietary issues, medical issues, talk to your priest. You know, God desires mercy. You know, this is what Christ said to the Pharisees. Know this, I desire mercy. 
Um, what what is doable and good for one may not be so for another. But God never shunned the uh, the widow's two mites. And whatever you're able to offer, whatever whatever you are able to give within your time, you know, just be consistent with that and give that. You know, talk to your priest. If he tells you to fast a certain way, obey that. You know, if he says, okay, well, you know, you're new, you're zealous, but I want you to go and slow it. It, it actually, this kind of, this reminds me of something that that happened in the life of St. John of Shanghai in San Francisco. Um, you know, St. John Maximovich had a young man who, uh, he really impacted him and he wanted to imitate uh, St. John in, in many ways. And so like he, he would, during Lent, he was sleeping on his floor instead of in his bed. Um, you know, he was trying to be an ascetic <laughs> and I think he became a priest. Um, I'm pretty sure I met his son actually when I got ordained. Um, can't recall who wrote this account and contributed to the life of, but it, it so what ended up happening was, uh, St. John was contacted by the kid's parents because they were worried about him. Like he's not eating, his cheeks are sinking in, you know, typical mom and, and dad worries. Right. And so Vladika John called him into his office and, and they talked and clearly the boy wanted to, he was hoping Vladika would bless his efforts and would give him more. Well, to break him of the pride, the delusion he was falling into of, of thinking he could be an ascetic just like him at this point and not obeying his parents, St. John did something pretty unexpected. He called for, uh, for the church warden to go and buy some sausage from the store and he made the kid eat the sausage. <laughs> and some people go, what, how, why did he do that? Well, it, it was simple. When he made him eat the sausage, he said, obey your mother and father. What he was telling them right there is that the fast isn't all there is to this. Humility, obedience, cutting off one's will is part of the process of, of engaging in proper Christian asceticism. Yeah. It's like I, I uh, just read uh, earlier today, you know, it's, it's, the fasting times, the Lenten times, you know, whether it's the Great Lent, whether it's, you know, Nativity or the, the Dormition fast or the Holy Apostles fast, fasting in just the physical aspect of not eating food profits you nothing if it's not combined with prayer and with almsgiving. Without all three, it's nothing. You're, the demons don't eat. They're always fasting. So if, if we're just doing only the bare minimum of physical, but we're not also praying, we're just dieting at that point. If we're, you know, if, if we're not giving alms as well, if we're not helping those who are in need, you know, whether it be through material, uh, you know, help, through encouragements, through our prayers, then we're also not fulfilling what Christ intended for us to fast, pray, and give alms all together it will be transformative spiritually you will blossom if you can do all three things together absolutely so the final portion and then we'll get to the q a and we'll keep this portion a little shorter is on discerning god's will um so father in, in your in your experience what is one of the, the best ways for discerning god's will what is one of the best things that an orthodox Ooh. christian can do to do this pray Pray fervently and to God, to the saints, especially depending on the circumstances. Are you having trouble discerning whether or not you should be doing this in that line of work, this career? You know, ask Saint Spirit on for his prayers. Ask, you know, pray to God and then ask Saint Spirit on for his prayers. He'll help you. Are you trying to discern whether or not you need to do a certain thing? Try to figure out what saint has dealt with these kind of things, kind of like what we were saying before on certain saints for certain circumstances. And talk to your priest. And talk yes. talk to your priest, the priest as well. Talk to your spiritual father, your father confessor. Um, you know, even if it's your father confessor, you know, maybe he doesn't go, maybe he's not quote unquote your spiritual father. You know, he might be a priest who objects to that. Um, but, you know, your father confessor knows you. He hears your confessions and he can also help you to discern things so that you can see, is this coming yep. from me? Is this coming from the other guy? Or is this actually something from God? And if you have visions or dreams, just ignore them. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Visions and if or you dream, dreams. If you have a demonic dream, well, ignore that too, but then you know, increase your prayer life. <laughs> dreams in general, do not ever take them as being a confirmation or an affirmation or a point in the right direction. Even if Christ himself truly 
truly deigned to appear to you in your dreams, if you said no, 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 there's no way you would appear to me because I, you know, I'm me. Why would you appear to me in my dreams? That would be blessed because you're not so full of pride that you would expect Christ himself to guide you, the Theotokos to guide you in a dream. More often than not, it's demons. I would say 99.9% .9 of the time, unless you're some great saint or you have some extremely extraordinary, profound thing happen, but it's extremely rare. Just ignore it. Ignore dreams, ignore signs, ignore visions, any of that. It's That's an easy way to fall into delusion. But discerning what God wants for you, it's hard. It's hard. You you have to put in the prayer for it. Sometimes it, maybe it's blatantly obvious, but most of the time it's it's going to be difficult because what God wants for us tends to be difficult, tends to be what we don't want to do. So even when God does tell us, even if it's blatantly obvious what we need to do, we're going to resist. We're going to look for every little way to exactly. weasel our way out of it. So it's 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 tough. It's tough without humility. Being humble is probably, I would say at the end of the day, the the best way to learn to discern what God wants for us is humility. So just humble yourself. I didn't mean to do that, but uh, uh, hello, Angeliki. We, we are also Canadian, so Father John and I here here in Canada too. So, But no, he's right. It's, um, you know, that's the thing. It's uh, when discerning these things. You know, you, you you have to you have to have accountability, and it's like Father John said, it's okay. You know, even if it's from Christ, and if you quote unquote reject it for fear of falling into delusion, God God will still find a way to communicate with you. God won't be stopped when it's when it's God's will. Yeah. Um, you won't you won't be penalized for for being humble and saying and rejecting a a, a true vision in humility, not in in anger or in fury, but in humility of saying I'm I'm not worthy to have Christ appear to me. I there's no way. Yeah, that you won't be punished for that. That's humble. That's humility, knowing that you aren't even worthy of seeing the Lord, which is true. It's the same way of, of approaching communion. If you ever once approach the chalice and say, I am worthy of this, no. step out. Do not. Do no. not partake. No, none are worthy. None are worthy. Because you are unworthy, but you're hoping in the mercies of our Lord. The only time we say anything about worthiness in the liturgy is when we are actually wrapping up the liturgy and it says, a right, having partaken fearfully of the of the life-giving fearful mysteries of Christ, let us worthily give thanks to the Lord. Meaning that, of course, we should be giving thanks to God in this circumstance and that, you know, hopefully he will, you know, he will find us to be acceptable before him. But, you know, it, it's, we ourselves cannot be worthy. I mean, even one of the prayers um, it even tells, and, and it's very important, it's a good reminder to the priest when he reads this prayer, um, it's around the time of the cherubic hymn where he reads, uh, none, are, none that are bound with carnal lust are worthy to draw near or to minister unto thee, right? So it's, you know, there's a certain emphasis on freedom from, from sins, from certain passions that you have to have, but this, you know, this worthiness that even comes from that is from God. Anything yeah. worthy comes from God. Anything good. I think that, that's a actually a really good point that uh, Orthodox Boomer Grandma brought up. She is saying we can't really be humble, humble-minded, but humility is a pure gift from God, and that's true. It's true. We aspire to be humble. We, we are. Be humble. God is humble. <laughs> yes, but we we aspire to that. We aspire to be given. We work to being blessed with that gift. You know that that fruit of the spirit. But we should be just, aspiring uh, to be humble, to be like Christ. It, like in everything, you know, we should be just, uh, aiming for the best, yeah. aiming for the highest. And just a quick, gentle pastoral word, you know, try to keep it cool. Don't war with each other in the comments. When it comes to, you know, certain spiritual matters, like with music and worldly stuff like that, like, yeah, we, we'll talk about some of what the saints have to say on that. But uh, do try to avoid um giving out any spiritual direction or advice for someone. It's just, you know, you may be right with what you're saying. But the way in which it's communicated and the timing in the person's life is something that you have to trust to a, a priest to assess. Yeah, and, I'll, I'll uh, answer this one really quickly. Uh, MacDan22 is saying, I'm coming in late, but are they saying the Orthodox don't believe in visions slash dreams? No, I'm not saying that. Okay. What I am saying, though, is to be careful of visions and dreams, especially in the context of falling into delusion. We have plenty of saints who truly saw visions and, and dreams that were 
angelic that were, you know, Christ himself, the Theotokos, the saints appearing, truly they happened. But we also have a lot of other saints who received visions that were demonic in their nature. They were deception. They were there to deceive them. Um, I, I forget which saint. It was a, a saint from the Kiev Caves who uh, fell into demonic possession because he had a, a vision where he thought Christ himself appeared to him. And it was a little strange on how, how Christ was speaking to him, essentially seeking this weird permission to bind him to do this and that and saying like, you, you will be saved and I'll take you. And once he acquiesced to everything in this vision, he became possessed immediately. It's, it's that that we need to be careful of. Yeah. The, the devil will, uh, will get you to sign on the dotted line, but you know, you don't always notice the fine print that he's concealing in the deal. And, you know, yeah. he might be, you know, posing. It's like, you know, you, I think Pato had used this as an illustration one time in one of our talks is that, you know, demons are kind of like those phishing scams you get, you know, you get the, the email, the, the tempting thought, and then it's like, oh, well, yeah, if you I, click the link, good. you know, there, they've got you, they've got your information, they have access yeah. to certain things. And, and so when you give them access to your lower faculties like that, especially to things like imagination, to fantasy, which a lot of the time is, you know, these fantasies are always aimed at our delusions of grandeur, our pride. Uh, when we give into that, you know, we, we commune with the devil. The devil's sin that caused him to fall from grace was pride. So we have to be very careful. It's not that we, we don't believe that visions and miracles happen. It's that we're cautious, we're discerning, we're slow. And if it is something of God, God can't be stopped. He'll get his message through. He'll yeah. find a way. I don't think you, I'd never heard of that. That uh, That's a really good way to put it. That it, it is exactly like fishing scammers. You know, yeah. they, they were angels of light at one point. They yeah. can still appear that way. It's, it's, it warns us so in, in the in the Gospels. It, in, in the uh, epistles. It's, in the epistles in Scripture. Yeah. yeah, it warns us. So and, and just a quick gonna pastoral word everything. based on, on some things I'm seeing in, in the comments. You know, someone, and I'm not going to say who, you know, but, you know, talking of pride, but yours is greater than mine. Never say someone's pride is greater than yours because that's that's a pretty proud statement to make. That's assuming you have a degree of humility and, and a degree of, of moral superiority that you can judge another person from. No one here or anywhere should be judging the spiritual life of another person. You know, we can assess struggles. We can judge when things are wrong, when somebody says something incorrect or says something that is spiritually damaging or harmful. We can address the thing, the, the issue be careful not to attach a judgment to the person's soul. That's all I'm going to say on that. Um, so with that said, with the sermon uh, talking about it, um, uh, let's, let's get to some, uh, let's get to some questions. Sure. And uh, as God forgives, forgive me too, Orthodox Boomer Grandma. <laughs> I love your name. It's, it's, it's great. <laughs> um all right, so I've got some starred questions. And Father John, if you want to keep an eye on any other questions coming in, sure. and just click the star on them if you highlight them. Um, uh, you know, and, and then, of course, I'll, I'll start reading some of them out of the starred sections here. I'll put them on screen for us both to answer. Um, and if you have a specific question for myself or Father John, don't be afraid to field it to a specific priest either. Um, otherwise, we'll just take turns and we'll, we'll, we'll kind of go between them. Um, so the first question comes from Martyr Throne. Fathers, what would you advise on people who blaspheme Christ and the mother of God? What do we say or do? Um, how about we go uh, two for two on this one, Father? So you go first and then I'll jump in. What would you advise on people who blaspheme Christ and the mother of God? Stay away from them, first <laughs> and foremost. Um, Don't let them tempt you to wrath. Yes, and that's, that, that's exactly why I say that. Well, yes, it, it is. It, it it is important to 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 deal with this issue of, of blasphe blasphemers. But we're not saints. We're not going to be like Saint Nicholas, who can strike a heretic because he did so without passion. By the way, when he struck do it errors. without passion, we're we're not nowhere near that. We are going to be tempted to wrath. We're going to be hurt. Yes, in 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 the right ways, partially. But in other ways, it's going to be our pride. It's going to be our anger. It's going to be hatred for this person. How stupid can you be? How can you be so, you know, blind, blah, blah, blah. We're going to go too far. I would say stay away first and foremost, as, as best as you can. Sometimes, of course, it's not, it's, it's unavoidable. But 
if it's like online in an online setting or if it's just casually just try just ignore it really pray for that person truly pray for that person with pain of heart yes but stay away and, and if it's, it's in a situation with family you can gently try to say look just like there's certain things that I might say that you might find offensive, this is something that deeply offends me because if it offends, it, it, blasphemy does offend God and it should offend us. Um, there's nothing wrong with being offended by that and being angry at what is said. Be careful not to attach your anger to the person. Rather direct that anger towards sin, towards your sins and towards blasphemies against God. That's fine. That anger is a tool to tell you maybe as Father John said, it might be time to cut some distance, stay away for a season. Um, there was one incident, uh, it's from a book called Everyday Saints and Other Stories, where a man had come in to uh, to the monastery church there and had lit his cigarette in the lampada uh, in front of the, the icon of the Holy Theotokos. And Father Raphael was serving at that time, and he was so incensed by this that he grabbed the man and dragged him out of the church. He had already warned him not to smoke in the church, and then he went and did this. So he dragged him out forcefully, and the man was fighting with him and insisting on what he did. And you know, because of what he did with lighting the, the cigarette and the lampad of the Theotokos, he actually struck the man. He punched him right in the face and sent him flying down the steps of the church. And of course, this is before liturgy, which he was supposed to serve. And he's a, he was a monastic priest. So he ran all the way to Elder John Christiankin, who was his spiritual father. He ran over to his uh, to where he, he was staying on the monastery grounds and confessed what he had done. But what was interesting is that Father John said, you can serve in good conscience, Father Raphael, for it wasn't you who sent that man flying, but it was your angel. So th there are so times the where critical, the critical yeah. piece there is that he felt terrible. Yeah, he, he was immediately repenting. He had to do that. It's not that he wanted to do that because he was so angry with that person, but he felt that he needed to, to defend the honor of the Theotokos. But exactly, you know, you, there's someone pointing out how their co-workers, you know, uh, uh, abuse the name of the Lord, take the name of the Lord in vain, probably constantly, probably swearing, probably saying some Very really familiar. miserable things. There's, unfortunately, there really isn't, terribly much you can do they have their own free will they've made their choices you, you, you can, can try to bring it up with management yeah, you can you try. like hey this is this is offensive to me in my religion you, you can certainly try it's just yeah, like you know, if, you're, if you were to bring up uh the the unholy prophet muhammad's uh wife's age in in the presence of, of muslims they would probably take great offense to that and might even report you to hr <laughs> yeah, have, have, you know, if you have the the courage and the the strength to you know with pain tell them you know please stop saying that if they ignore you they're free to do that unfortunately as that's part of their free will to resist but pray for them ignore what yeah. they're saying pray for them pray for them every time you hear it say a prayer for them you, so you, jason's you, world they're spiritually sick yeah so to move on to the next question jason's world uh asked what if someone made an album about orthodox christianity and were to wear uh clothes uh similar i'm guessing you mean similar to maybe what us orthodox priests wear um hmm. what impact would that have on pop uh on pop culture absolutely uh, not a good one <laughs> i i can i'm gonna tell you right now there's already a band that does that in poland and oh, yeah, they man. make they dress like schema monks they're the the singer of the band actually went to a theological academy to learn how to sing and you know what he does with all of that he sings perversions he sings blasphemies he was dressed as the mother of god it's it's disgusting and no we, we would just see more of that yeah it's, and it's, it's, it's not, a, we, we don't want to mix these two things the yeah and, it, and it's a things. it's a sin to don these clothes and these crosses without having the blessing in the office to wear them mm -hmm. you know like even when when we were uh when i was ordained a deacon uh when father john was ordained uh, was first ordained a deacon he couldn't just throw on the riasa without first the blessing from the bishop, even though it is part of the regalia of our office. Um, yeah, and I, of course, yeah. It, it actually, if if uh, you do get ordained a deacon and say your bishop somehow forgets to give you the blessing for the riasa, don't put it on. Do not. You still don't have the blessing to wear it, even though you have the right to. You don't have the blessing to. Yeah, so it's the same thing. But get we, them to do it. <laughs> yeah, but it's... it's uh, it's terrible. The, the the examples, the already real world examples that we have of that question are blasphemous. Blasphemy beyond blasphemy. Quick side note as well. It's the it's the same for the for the cassock. 
Um, you can't wear a cassock unless the bishop blesses you to wear one. And you get yeah. a blessing to wear one when you're made a reader. That's why seminarians um, also yeah. uh, are able to wear cassocks, even though they have no, like no they're not even readers. Because they, they, they're, they've received the blessing from the, the bishop there to be able to wear their cassocks. And fun fact, in Jordanville uh, at Holy Trinity Monastery, they actually, the seminarians also wear monastic belts as a sign of their obedience that they're submitting themselves to because they, they live like monks while they're in the seminary. They, they It's like spiritual boot camp. Um, oh, I think you should probably star that. I, I unfortunately can't star oh, anything. Can't star them? But yeah, uh, exactly. Fire from Within posted a, a good question that would be good to, to get to. Oh, I think a lot a of Protestants, point. you know, sometimes fall into that, like they come into the church and they see that kind of thing. And it'd be good to address that, I think. Yeah, there's a couple of good questions that I've noticed in there. Are you able to read the start questions? Are you able to put them up on screen, Father? I, I can read them, but I can't interact with them. Oh, you can't interact with them. Yeah, we'll YouTube, YouTube does not. Google does not want to play uh, nicely with me right so now. It doesn't here, want here's a, a good question from Spiritual uh, Spiritual Danger Close. As an amateur theologian, I have issues with the Trinity. I view it as man's poor understanding of God mixed with Platonism. Any recommendations? Well, um, first thing is it's not man's poor understanding. Uh, the understanding of the doctrine of the Trinity is first, of course, revealed in the Holy Gospels by the Lord Jesus Christ, who reveals to us the Father, the Son, and the, and the Holy Spirit. Even in the baptismal triparion for, um, for Theophany, it, you know, it, it says, uh, it talks about how uh, when Christ was baptized in the Jordan, worship of the Trinity was made manifest, for the voice of the Father bore witness unto thee, calling thee his beloved Son. And the Spirit in the form of a dove gave uh, witness to his word, right? Uh, so it's it's talking about how the triune God, one of the best ways to understand it, and not to get hung up on terms like Platonism, because sometimes people will see a word like hypostasis, or um, in some cases, even if they really deep dive the scriptures, when when St. John writes, uh, do this in, in remembrance of me, in Greek, the word is anamnesis. A lot of people will go, oh, well, those are that's Platonism. Those are Platonic words. Well, words are useful for something like this, especially in Greek, especially in philosophy. Words encapsulate a lot of meaning. You know, hypostasis describes something that is substantive and real or that gives uh, re um, concrete reality to a nature. And in the case of the divine persons of the Holy Trinity, and there's some good papers you can read about this by Jacobs, by uh, Christoph Erisman, Dr. David Bradshaw, uh, and of course, in terms of patristic resources, St. Basil the Great, St. John of Damascus, um, you know, St. Uh, Gregory Palamas, St. Gregory uh, Nesianzen, many, many great saints illumined by the Holy Spirit talk about this. And of course, now we cannot know God in his essence fully. We, we cannot comprehend what the divine usia is and what it's like. It's, it's, it's like uh, St. John Damascus puts it, God's being is like a sea of being. It's an infinite ocean of essence. And, uh, you know, it's, it's communicated. It is the principle uh, of, of existence for things like nature is the hypostasis or the person in this case. So the three divine persons interpenetrate one another and are, uh, and are, of course, of the same essence. And the Father communicates his essence to the Son via beginning and to the Holy Spirit via proceeding. And so the, there's an internal uh, relational aspect here, whereas unlike with, with created beings, for example, uh, the way a father relates to his son, like what with my son, John, uh, is is that's what's called an external relation. For John, me being his father is internal. You know, he wouldn't exist without without me contributing to that existence. But for me, my relationship to my son is actually external. Whereas with the father and the son and the Holy Spirit, their relationship to each other is actually internal. So understanding the Trinity, you'll never be able to understand the, the depth of that, you won't be able to peer into the essence of God, despite what certain people like Thomas Aquinas think. Um, but, you know, to understand that, you know, nature is, you know, natures are something imminent and real, but they don't exist outside of hypostasis. That's one of the first places to start. I would really recommend reading um, Dr. David Bradshaw's paper, uh, Aristotle in Byzantium, if you can find it online. I'm, I'm pretty sure you can. I think it's on academia.eu or something like that. Um, but there's so many things that you can read about this that that will help flesh this out further. But, uh, you know, when, when dealing with the metaphysics of the Trinity, it's really important to, to, to dive into first what the fathers are saying, like St. John Damascus and his fount of knowledge and uh, the philosophical chapters. And, uh, and of course, to look at, uh, there's a really good book that you can get um, 
by uh, it's published by St. Vlad's Press. I'm not a big fan of St. Vlad's Press. I don't like that all their patristic series uh, start with introductions written by people outside the church. I think that's their popular ridiculous. patristic series now. Includes yeah, it, it's ridiculous. But uh, you, in in the book on the Holy Spirit, you can you can kind of plumb into the depths a little bit more of Trinitarian theology. Um, so those would be my recommendations. Uh, it's it's learning the vocabulary, what they mean, and realize that even though certain Platonic words might be included, that actually the view on reality of the Church Fathers is not uh, Neoplatonism, it's not Platonism. It falls more into line with Aristotelian categories and more of a the, the view of reality in the Church is more what we would call moderate realism. We do believe. Uh, nature's or essence, you know, uh, usia is real, it's imminent, but we don't believe that it exists outside of hypostases, whereas Platonism would hold, for example, that in the Holy Trinity, you essentially have four gods, because you would have the divine nature, which would be considered the highest in the realm of forms. And then, you know, the other members of the Trinity would be participants in that, which would render them subordinates, it would it would make them posterior to divine nature and divine nature would be anterior. But a good way to view this is, as St. Photius the Great said, we do not worship natures. We worship three divine persons. We don't worship the divine nature. We worship three divine persons, right? So it, you have to understand that God is what and who they are, that they interpenetrate each other, that they're, they are homo usion, as the language of the fathers of the first council would say. They, their essence is communicated between them. They interpenetrate one another. The Father communicates his essence to the Son via beginning and to the Holy Spirit via proceeding. But, uh, you know, it, it's important not to think that the view of divinity is, in terms of divine nature, is more real than the divine person. So um, I would recommend reading up on, on the whole idea of imminent, of um, moderate realism. And again, I would highly recommend anything by Dr. David Bradshaw, um, Christoph Erisman, Anna Zhirkova. There's a, there's a lot of good a lot of good works on on Trinitarian uh, theology and and the uh, and the uh, philosophy of the of Byzantium. Sorry, that's a, a long one. <laughs> that's why I like you just handle that one. You you are the the more precise when you speak on theology. Oh. Um, this one's for you, Father. Are spiritual fathers always clergy? From uh, I think we from touched Florida. on that one a little bit. Um, yes, if you're counting. Spiritual fathers are always tonsured in some respect, whether it's clergy, whether it's ordination through clergy or being being clergy, so through ordination, or tonsured as a monk. You're not really going to find a spiritual father that's a layman. Um, very extremely rare that you find something like that. Um, this has happened, but extremely rare. Usually you will see someone who's maybe a fool for Christ. Uh, who falls into that category. But as I've read, and a lot of saints caution most fools for Christ in like right now that aren't canonized by the church are in delusion. It's a very, very difficult thing to discern that God wants you to become a fool for Christ. And usually they go to a monastery, they get a blessing to do this. Um, but I guess the long and short of it is yes. They're always going to be clergy. They're always going to be monks. It's so, such a fringe case that it may as well not really be a consideration for your average Orthodox Christian. Mm -hmm. um, but deacons, to a certain extent, yeah, can be depending depending on the strength of the deacon. Yes, they can be as well. But minor clergy, mm, I would kind of stay away from that as a spiritual father unless they're extremely advanced maybe they're a monk yeah, yeah but even again that, that falls into being tonsured kind of territory but it's uh i'd say try to stick more to higher clergy or or fully full-fledged monks yeah exactly so um dr crispy rothschild so this this one i kind of jumped the queue a bit um, by accident, uh, and, and I'll, I'll use it to jump onto another question. The brown scapular is a divine mercy Catholic thing. Yeah, it's so the brown scapular comes from the uh, so-called apparition of, of Our Lady of Mount Carmel in the Roman Catholic Church. I used to be a, a big proponent of the brown scapular when I was a Catholic. Uh, in all reality, there's a lot of these so-called visions that Catholic saints have. Uh, a lot of the time, are exactly the kind of delusions you'll see warned about in the Desert Fathers with visions of Christ, the saints, and angels. 
And it leads down this path where there's this very passionate carnal delusion almost about the spiritual life, where there are men who have uh, who are supposed saints who talk about the Theotokos almost as if she's their spouse and that they can have some kind of form of, uh, through consecration, wedding to her, be wedded to her. Um, it's, you know, or women who would view that way about Christ. Like the, there was one, I can't remember if it was Catherine of Siena or someone else who believed that she had the foreskin of Christ and, and wore it as a ring. Um, you know, the, there are other women, you know, such as uh, Mary Margaret Alicoque, who uh, came up with the uh, Sacred Heart devotion, uh, in which she had these very carnal visions, which were were almost like erotic or romantic kind of encounters with Christ, according to her, where they would be lying there together talking, and he would lean on her, and she'd lean on his chest, and that he apparently extracted his beating heart from his chest the one day and said, I give you the deed to my heart. You know, it's just this goofy, frankish uh, perversion. Uh, so it's it's almost Nestorian in a way with dividing the person of Christ. Um, but, you know, things like the brown scapular, uh, you know, even if someone sweet gives them to you, I, I saw a really uh, a blessed, you know, bless, God bless you uh, to the person who's who, who sent this comment. But uh, even if, the, you know, these things come as gifts from sweet little old ladies, be careful. Because just as the devil can can appear as an angel of light, he can also use very kind people to deceive us, right? And and putting on those things can become a curse. Uh, these things are not blessed by the church. These these are not devotions that are upheld by the Orthodox Church. And to partake in the sacramentals, because that's what the Catholics call them, they call them sacramentals, um, of the heterodox is to participate in the spirit that formed them, which is the spirit of delusion. So when you do this, you could be opening yourself up to something uh, pretty dangerous, spiritually speaking. Yeah, and it, it's... To your, it wouldn't be disrespecting that that person because I, I I saw that the question a while back and the the concern because the, this person very greatly loved this person that's beautiful you know love this person who did so much for you who helped you so greatly and it's a very merciful person but you know it's it wouldn't be a disrespect to get rid of an object like that you're not that that person isn't bound to that object like you're not bound to that object your love isn't bound to that object. You love that person. You love what that person, you know, means that, that that person means to you. So it it's something that would you probably do want to get rid of as you know. Yeah, and, and things like the same. Said. Yeah, and things like the Saint Benedict Medal. I'm still kind of like eh, about that, even though Saint Benedict of Nursia is one of our saints. Um, I'm not sure when the medal was struck exactly. There's a lot of debate over its dating. Um, that's something I would have to look more into. I know there are some Western Rite Orthodox who make use of that, but there are also Western Rite Orthodox who go completely against the church and make use of post-papal schism innovations like the sacred and immaculate hearts. So, it, you know, it's always best, um, it, it's always best to, to keep this in mind. Um, no, technically the scapular does not, I saw this from Thomas. No, it does not predate the essence energies distinction. The way that things are flushed out, the language used can predate that. But actually, the Cappadocians refer to the essence energies distinction. St. Basil, the great points out that the energies are various and they come down to us, but the essence is forever unknowable to us, meaning the principle or the state of existence. To believe that God is actus purus is to actually have the God of the philosophers. If God can't actualize anything, if he can't do anything, if there's no potential in God, then asking him for forgiveness, for mercy, for anything, you're wasting your breath. It may or may not happen. So. Uh, let's see. Um, there was a question that we had starred a bit back from Fire From Within that was actually a really yeah, good question. I'm going to try and find that question. I know I started a bit. I'm not back. sure if you did. If if you uh, can. Oh, there it is. I found it. So why uh, in more churches is, is there a lot of gold stuff? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'll let you answer this, Father. Yes, that is that is a jarring thing for a lot of people. You come into the Especially church, Protestants. you see all the gold, you see maybe, say you come into a very grand cathedral, and you see the, the grandeur of everything. Well, it's because we're giving our best to God. We're not, you know, the, the, these gilded objects, whether or not it's real gold or not, a lot of the times it's probably not going to be real gold because that's horrifyingly expensive in this day and age but in the past it was it would have been real gold it's because we are giving our best to the lord we're not giving it to the just to the church we're not giving it to the priest 
We're not giving it to our bishop. No, it's to God. We are adorning his house, his temple with the best of the best. It's the same as if, you know, when you give anything to the church, say, even something as simple as a flour for baking prospera or olive oil for keeping the lampadas lit, you're not going to give like the cheapest possible flour. You're not going to give the cheapest possible oil. No, you're going to want to give the very best that you feasibly can to the Lord. Look, look how the temple's described actually in, in the, in the Bible. It, it's beautiful. It's elaborate. It's ornate. Even the Ark of the Covenant is even, even the whole vision on, on Mount Sinai where God literally instructs Moses how to construct the tabernacle, how to construct the Ark of the Covenant, how to worship him. There's, there, there's mentioning of things like gold, violet, like purple uh, tapestry or banners. <laughs> back then, that would have been really difficult, really expensive. I mean, yeah. back in the time of, of... Icons in general. An icon yeah. hand-painted would be extremely expensive. Thing. You, you would have yeah. in, in, you know, in antiquity, and even then, even in the Middle Ages, you would have, your village would have like one icon. And it would be passed around throughout the whole village. And they'd serve, they'd do a prayer service in someone's home as the, the the icon was passed around. But it's because we are adorning God's house, God's temple with the best of the best as we possibly can. And even then walking into a church and seeing all the gold, seeing all the, the beautiful icons should put us in mind of, of heaven, of paradise. Well, and, and, and a lot of the time in icons, the gold is actually meant to represent the the heavenly light, the the yes. grace of God permeating the saint's life and how God is everywhere present. It, it's, it's representing his grace in a way that way, uh, not depicting it, but the whole idea is that God envelops the saint in his grace. Now, sometimes backgrounds of icons might be blue and the halo will be gold. And this, of course, is to represent that they've received illumination from the Holy Spirit. So it, it does communicate that, but it's also that we give our best and we give it to God, like Father yes, John said. Exactly. Exactly. We're giving it straight directly to God. That's yeah, a good but question. good question. A lot, Very a lot good of people question. do really have that, especially inquirers. They have that question, like, why why is everything gold? Why is everything so ornate? Yeah. yeah, why is it so why is it so fancy? Yeah. Um <laughs> let's see. Um so just, just a quick brief mentioning. So Desert Foss asks, why does he hear more about those monks who become saints? It really just depends on who you talk to. I mean, uh, in our circles, we certainly are, that Father John and I have traveled in, we're pretty familiar with a lot of monastic saints. Uh, you know, St. Joseph the Hezekiah, St. Uh, Paisius, Bielichkovsky, St. Seraphim, Saraf, St. Seraphim, uh, I believe someone had mentioned, yep, uh, St. Seraphim uh, Viritsky, who wrote this beautiful meditation that Father John sent us for, for Christmas this year on, uh, that was from me. A really beautiful yes, uh, it's correspondence. A very beautiful, yes. Yeah, and it was written uh, to a spiritual son who was a bishop in uh, Saint, in the Gulag. You have so. Saint Suluan the Athenite, Saint Nicodemus the the Agiorite. You have any bishop, any any sainted bishop, any sainted patriarch. They're a monk. Um, yeah. So can I get some recommendations? So Jason asks, can you get some recommendations for icons, especially a prayer rope? That that's new to him. He wants a. He wants to. I guess he's saying he's wanting a pattern of of life to develop. So what would you say, Father? Uh, I can I special prayer rope. It's new to me. Hmm. I'd say an icon of a saint that really that you're feeling very attached to right now in this moment. Yeah, like based on what I saw in the chats, uh, I'd recommend Saint James the Faster. Yeah. You know, even if you just get like a paper icon from a monastery or just a print, that's fine. It doesn't yeah, have to you, be expensive. Our our attachment, we are fickle, and sometimes our attachment, sometimes it's a it's a, our attachments to saints are going to change, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. But whatever saint you feel closest to in this moment, definitely ask for that saint's prayer, and you know. You know, even on your your prayer rope, even just, you know, five or ten times, you know, oh, holy saint, holy mother, holy ascetic, holy father, pray to God for me, whatever saint this is. You know, ask yeah. for their prayers with, with pain of heart. Simple, simple, simple prayers are very, very powerful. You don't need yeah, long, it's, it's fluffy the pain prayers. Of heart. Uh, so Land Plant said, how do we go about finding a spiritual father? Well, uh, a lot of that comes down to praying for God to, to send you a good guide if, if you don't have one you know and 
not all priests are comfortable with the idea of being yeah. spiritual fathers. Not all priests have a blessing to do that, depending on where you are and what the tradition of your jurisdiction is. Um, but your father confessor is always a good place to start and, and just start by bearing your soul to him. And, and if, uh, if God wills it, and if, if it's going to be good for you, then God will send the right person to guide you, but it can take time. Fa father John and I got very fortunate that our parish priest is a very good spiritual father, that he was able to, to guide us and to, and to give us the kind of attention we needed. Um, not everyone's quite in that same question. Some uh, situations, sometimes there's complications with parish priests. Priests are still men. You know, we still, we're still mortals. We still are sinners. We still need to repent. You know, there's, there's always going to be a struggle. I'd say, um, even if you can't find a spiritual father, even if it does take a while to find a spiritual father, take solace in your confessor. Your confessor will act in that capacity for you, whoever is your local father confessor. Mm -hmm. and, and no problem, fire from within. He, he was happy with, uh, with our answer. Um, yeah, you, you'll find that most of the time in orthodoxy, things are pretty consistent across the board. Um, but yeah, let's see. Father, do you want to answer that question from Matt? Um, that is actually a really good one. And that's I, I talked about this earlier. Um, when I first came to the faith, I thought that I had to do all of the prayers. Now, we should. I'll, I'll say that point blank right now. We should. We should be aiming to do all of the prayers in the morning and in the evening. Because they are a very basic prayer rule that has been set down by... Uh, I think actually in the canons, because uh, St. Nicodemus talks about this quite a bit as like the bare minimum of what is asked of us is the morning and evening prayer rule, the entirety of it. But at the same time, especially if you're new in the faith, or even if you really haven't worked on your spiritual life and on, on your ability to pray, it's going to be very daunting. You maybe want to take it in sections maybe you know read certain prayers you know take the first opening bit up to the creed everything up to the creed and then maybe the prayer to uh, uh one of the prayers to jesus christ to the theotokos to your guardian angel and then the prayers that you say for like of your own volition you know for people around you and then go to the dismissal you know, work, work on building up to it. There's someone who, who I recently was talking to, or actually I was, I've been talking to a lot and he wants to convert. Um, but you know, he's, it's, it's, it's a difficult time, but it's hard for him, you know, to, to fully engage in reading prayers because I don't think English is his first language. And I've told him just for now, since maybe you're not very experienced in reading and, and, and reading in, in English and reading long prayers, say, our Father, the Creed, Psalm 50, and that'll that will cover you until you can grow into reading the full prayer rule. It's it it's really it, it takes a, a lot of discernment on what, what we can and can't do. But I guess as as a as a full baseline, yes, we should be doing all of the evening and morning prayers, but within reason we're we're because of our weaknesses. We're probably going to do a shorter version of that until we get strong enough to be able to do the whole thing. So this is a good question from Florida. Um, I've seen an icon with the halo edges of gold, but the inner part of the halo uh, is black. It was St. Xenia of St. Petersburg. Everything else looks normal. I asked my priest and he didn't know why. Do you? Um, there's a couple reasons why this could be. It could be a misprint. Um, hopefully it's not a blasphemous icon. Uh, but when I've seen icons like this, typically it's actually the, the, the black is usually from discoloration when the color of the halo might have been yellow or something lighter and could have been from soot from the lamps being lit near it. You'd be surprised how uniform that black film can become over icons. It, it, it almost looks like it's part of it. This is also something that you can find commonly sometimes in certain Russian styles of, of iconography, either in the Novgorod school, which um, I'm not going to lie, is my least favorite school of iconography. They... They did not know how to draw. Um, icons aren't meant to be anatomically uh, impossible. The hyper literal, <laughs> hyper realistic. Yeah, or or yeah, or the academic style. Um, I'm more of a fan of classical Russian or Byzantine style icons. Um, but you know, it, it it's really hard to kind of weigh in on this without seeing the icon myself. And because you know, especially if it's written in Slavonic, I can read it and, and tell you if it if it's right or wrong. But that's about it. Um, 
But yeah, no, I, I would I would suspend judgment on it in the meantime and just maybe ask around, maybe talk to to another priest who might be more familiar with Slavic schools of iconography. Uh, that might help. Um, um, I'm just going to jump the queue really quickly. This is a very quick answer on what Noodles just said. Should slash can we sing when we pray? I enjoy it for certain prayers. Yes. If you know the tones. Is If you know the tones. Yes. By all means, if you know the tones for the troparia that you are praying, sing it. De definitely, yeah, sing it. If you know the tone for the sessional hymn you're singing or you're, you're praying, sing it. Yeah, for sure. If you want to sing the creed, if you want to sing our father, you know, in, in, in you know, one of the, the definitely one of the prayerful styles that, that the, the church has and one of the traditions was the, the Byzantine, the Greek style of singing, the one of the many uh, Slavic styles of singing, go for it. It's beautiful and it, it can be very prayerful. So yes, yes, definitely you can. Absolutely. Is it normal to be worried to choose a patron saint because I feel like I can't even walk one of the steps of the saints I've looked into? Don't let don't let that subtle, sneaky, 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 hidden form of pride get in there. You know, you can never go wrong with choosing a heavenly intercessor. It's not about living up to the ideal. It's in terms of that. It's not in terms of being able to imitate it right off the hop. The ideal is what you're striving for. It's yes. the goalpost you're running for. Yeah, my um, my patron saint is uh, St. John, the forerunner. Yeah, you know the Baptist of our Lord, the greatest man from Christ born to woman, <laughs> the greatest man born of a woman. How can I live up to that? How can anybody, the many Johns who are named after him, live up to that? Saint John of France. We're, we're not asked to reach that level a hundred percent, like it's you know get an A plus in school. We're asked to strive to reach that level, and our patron saint is there to be a helpful intercessor and a helpful guide in doing yeah, and that the, and much the like our life, guardian angel you're not judged on if you get the grade or not you're judged on the effort to exactly get the grade. yes yes so god god will will take your effort into account more than anything i mean for me i'm named after the the archangel michael that's that's the nigh impossible act to follow but i try you know i try to to look at his life i ask for his prayers and um but you know even uh, at least I know this is a more of a Russian Orthodox thing, but maybe, but there's, there's different saints even, or different patrons for different parts of your life. Like, um, you know, you have like a patron saint of when you're essentially made a deacon or, or a priest, like I was ordained on the feast day of uh, St. John, the theologian to the diaconate. And then I was ordained on the feast day of the transfer of the relics of St. Nicholas, uh, father John on Holy spirit day and on uh, St. Deacon's day. So, uh, you know, we, we've been even advised by, by other Russian priests that, uh, you know, we should pray to those saints as well on whose days we were ordained because they yeah. kind of become patrons, you know, helps, protectors, friends, uh, you know, for, for us in terms of our vocation in regards to being, uh, you know, uh, ordained on their feast days. Yeah, I would say it, um, if you still have a question that you really want answered and maybe you posted it before, but we haven't gotten around to it, please repost it. We will definitely get around to it if, if you can repost it. Um, I know it, it just reminded me because M just did exactly that and that's actually one that i do want to talk about the if you could uh if you could highlight that one for us this one no oh, the no. how uh, should orthodox uh view the western church post schism how should we view well let's we can answer that and then we'll answer this one um post schism okay i, I, I will it. say this there it is yeah. based on the second part of that question right so in the same vein the anglican church who is also heretical, not in communion with us, you know, every this and that. They've also provided a lot of translations for us, especially us English speaking. You know, there's uh, Isabella Hapgood, I believe she was, I don't know if she was an Anglican or a Protestant, but she never converted, you know, Lord have mercy on her. Um, but she did a lot of good in making service books, translations, that were are great and that are still used to this day for the English speaking communities. However, just because they produce things that were good doesn't mean that their views and their theology and their dogmas are good. Just like the Pope sometimes says something that I will agree with because it's true. But does that mean that I think that the Pope is the vicar of Christ? Does that no. mean that I think that the Pope is you know my patriarch the only number one patriarch no 
The no, Pope had no authority. Put it. Vicars are, are things that dead kings used. Our king is alive. Our, our head is alive. We don't need a vicar. Yeah, but just because someone who is in error can produce something that's correct or say something that's correct doesn't mean like that that's okay. They're going to do that because our, our, they're, they're going to produce things that are correct. You can't be wrong 100% of the time, like maybe sometimes. Some people are going to be wrong 100% of the time. But that doesn't invalidate all of the error just because they produce something that is correct, something that is good. Just because this is funny. <laughs> Who knows? He's working some kind of worldly magic. <laughs> um, this is actually kind of a good one to, to branch off on. How can we stay away from temptations when living in the Western world? Um, one of the best ways... Uh, it's kind of, again, what, what Father John and I talked about consistently through, through this is, is consistent prayer life, consistent reading of the scriptures, the saints, and fasting. Yes. You know, the, the world encourages gluttony. It's marketed. Go buy a Big Mac for whatever low price. Go to Tim Hortons and get, uh, yeah. you know, coffee and, and donuts. You know, do this, do that. Well, go in the opposite direction. And you something know, that I encourage people a lot too, especially once, you know, if God in, gives you the discernment to feel that ebb and flow of when you're very hot for him or when you're very cold in your faith, when you're very hot in your faith and prayer comes easy and the struggles, the temptations seem to have all evaporated, take that opportunity to try to figure out what are the things in your life that are leading you into temptation? Is it your phone? Is it the internet? Is it maybe someone you shouldn't be talking to that you're falling with? You know, try to cut these things out of your life you know, obviously it's going to be really hard to cut out your phone, but I mean, do you, do you really need to be on your phone 24 seven? Do you need to be wasting all your time on YouTube, getting pornographic ads, getting time wasting, you know, just frivolous garbage? Like, do you really need to be doing that all the time? A little bit of recreation is okay, but if you're constantly in recreation, you're wasting your time. But we should be, when we're very hot in our faith, trying to identify the, our tempters. Absolutely. Okay, so NM asked, I don't like reading my prayers out of a book, so I've managed to memorize several of the shorter ones, but the Nicene Creed is presenting a real challenge. Any tips for memorizing longer prayers? Um, repetition. Repetition yeah. is, is usually the best way to learn any skill. Um, so I would say repetition with doing the prayers. And I would also say, you know, you could even work on trying to memorize line for line, right? So mm -hmm. I, I broke the creed up into three parts when I memorized it uh, years ago. So, you know, I did the first bit and then I did the second and then I did the third final part, which was, of course, about the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. And just doing this consistently will help you. So uh, that's what I would recommend is just be consistent. Um, I think you would probably have a, a good answer for a normal child scrolling up a little bit on uh, asking about Islam. On Islam. Is that under the live or under the starred? Uh, I'm going to see if it's under the start. It is not under the start. Actually, no. it is under the start. It is under okay. the start. So I'll, uh, I'll look for it in there. Uh, about Islam, eh? Okay. Yes. Might be at the... Because he, re he reposted it, and I definitely want to get to that since he reposted it. Oh, he reposted it? Okay. So uh, I'm trying to see it. I'm just making sure that anybody who's reposting questions that we're, we're like prioritizing those right now. Just to, as a quick thing. Um, and maybe you can read the question to me, Father, if I can't find it. Uh, so how should we feel about the Russian-Ukraine war? I have family on both sides and I've lost. Oh, God bless you. I'm, I'm oh, very Lord sorry to, to hear that. Mm -hmm. Lord have mercy. Um, shouldn't these solidify itself or is there a deeper meaning behind the war? There's always a deeper meaning. Yes. Um, you know, when we look at various wars throughout time, and a lot of the times when it affected Christianity, it was usually in response to things like, uh, you know, the, the, the Coptics fell into the heresy of Monophysitism. Uh, what happened? They got swept up by the Islamic invaders. Um, and Islam is technically a heresy. Um, the, it has had influence from Arianism and Nestorianism. Um, and St. John of um, St. John Damascus uh, had even pointed out that, you know, they, they had certain Christological errors that carried over from Arian monks and, and from Nestorians. So um, this is why they have some kind of respect for Christ, unlike the Jews. But why they still ultimately see him as just a man is because of, of these influences. And yet here we are, you know, we see the Nestorians got swept up by the, by the Muslims. The, you know, the, the, uh, the Coptic uh, people did. Uh, Constantinople got stormed and taken by the Turks when, uh, 
when of course they were entertaining the notion of reunion with uh, with the Latin West and and all of the papal innovations. So if that's not a clear sign that it's not supposed to happen, I don't know what is the po the, the papist will say, oh, you you rejected the Pope, so you lost Constantinople. No, <laughs> it was actually nearly accepting the Pope that caused, and we didn't yeah. even accept them, and that that caused Constantinople to fall. So I take uh, to yeah. on the topic of of the war, I would honestly parrot what my hierarchs say it's yeah a tragedy Honestly, because yeah. of human pride human greed human Rope weakness. position is, is pretty neutral on the war we don't take sides you know we we, we abhor all forms of of killing and violence i, it's, I even it's saw a question a, a tragedy really that yeah. the, the, the orthodox brothers and uh, and sisters are killing each other it you really know, is a tragedy. The, yeah exactly it's, it's a fratricidal war as uh metropolitan Ilarian of blessed memory put it Yes. Uh, it's a fratricidal war. Uh, we shouldn't support it. We should be praying for an end to it. Whatever God's will is, that we got to accept that. And, you know, in my opinion, and my opinion's not worth anything, by the way. This is just my take on it. And uh, and if it's wrong, it's wrong. Um, but a lot of this is happening because of the issues with the church in Ukraine. You know, President Poroshenko put pressure on the EP with the help of the CIA to make this stupid, you know, <laughs> mockery of a church, the so-called autocephalous church of Ukraine. They get granted a tomos of autocephaly. There's no heresy or anything to rectify their non-canonical, uh, non-apostolic ordinations. And these, these people uh, end up storming churches. They end up violently attacking canonical Orthodox Christians under Metropolitan Unifri, the proper Metropolitan of Kiev in, in all of Ukraine. And you know, all these things start occurring even before the war happens. Well, in my opinion, it wouldn't be unbelievable to think that whenever wars arise in Orthodox Christian countries and circumstances, it's usually because there's an issue with something like this going on. At least it's just a pattern I've, I've caught on to. This is something that uh, Father Cosmos talked about in Talk 83. So if you're kind of curious as to where I'm maybe forming some of these ideas from, go listen to Talk 83 by Father Cosmos. I think you'd really um, benefit um uh, there's one that i think would probably be pretty good i think this was a reposted one uh from uh mr mr jch24 does yeah. god forgive us when we have nobody to confess to through direct prayer to christ nowhere does does the orthodox church say that we can't confess directly to god especially for sins that aren't mortal you know sins that aren't say like fornication murder theft repeated sins that are completely done out of absolute willful obstinacy you know say small things yes of course we can you know, a lot of the sins if you read in in your prayer book in the nighttime prayers the confession prayer a lot of those those sins that are listed there are relatively smaller ones you know things that happen by happenstance excusable kind of sins as as saint nicodemus would would uh would label them we can ask for forgiveness directly for Christ for those things, but for big, tremendous mortal sins that have completely separated us from from the Lord, from from you know, from the church. You know, like I said, fornication, you know, murder, theft, uh, blasphemy, heresy, things like that. Yeah, you you definitely have to go to confession. You yes. need to go to confession to have the the weight of that removed from you. You need the sacrament. You need that grace to have that peeled away from you. But you can still pray to God to ask for help in seeking forgiveness for this. There's nothing. There's nothing that says you can't do that. But to have true, to complete your repentance, yes. to complete that that terrible ache that you have of transgressing the Lord, go to confession. Even for the small ones, too. Even for the ones that you're reading in your confession prayers, if they're repeated, go to your spiritual father. Go to your confessor. Confess them. Complete your repentance. Yes, absolutely. Um, and, and to Moses, God help you. The Lord have mercy on you, and, and may God help you in strengthening you in your struggles. May, may he bless you. Um, so Ortho Boy asks, Father, I will also repost this. Does the Eastern Orthodox Church believe Mary to be the spouse of the Holy Ghost? No, we don't use that wording. Um, that this is something from the very carnally minded Latins who 
I mean, the, these people have such a poor understanding of the, the makeup of, of the, the Trinity in terms of what constitutes uh, relation and how, uh, you know, the, the three hypostases relate to one another to the point where they give two things to, to uh, one thing to two members of the Trinity and subtract it from another, turning him into a subordinate. You know, they, the filioque renders the Father and the Son anterior to the Holy Spirit because they have the power to cause his divinity, or in other words, to be the, uh, the you know, they, they divide the procession of the Holy Spirit into two uh, spirations, which is something that the church never agreed to. And even if you, you spend any time reading into Trinitarian theology and philosophy, uh, you, you would realize that such a notion is impossible. So, uh, no, we don't call her the, the spouse of the Holy Ghost. We call her the mother of God. Theo tokos rejoice the bride unwedded. There's a good question that I scrolled up a bit um, from Drew. I don't know if he's still here. Um, he is asking, uh, Fathers, I feel as though the Lord is calling me to convert to orthodoxy, but I have reservations due to my race. I've heard horror stories about potentially not fitting in. What advice would you give me? Convert. Church Go to church. All people. Convert. All people. Do not that's, that is that is the demons that are it holding is the back. demons. And if anyone does give you a hard time for your race, I got a good story for you on that. Actually, there That's was a demonic. situation. Yeah, yeah. There, there was a situation at a Greek Orthodox church. This happened not too long ago. And, uh, you know, a, a woman of African-American descent went to this church. She was actually genuinely interested in going to an Orthodox church. And this rude woman. This rude Greek lady says to her, oh, I think you're lost. The church for you is up the street. And she was pointing to a black Baptist church. Lord have mercy. Well, the bishop actually caught wind of this. And he chastised this person in front of the congregation. He didn't name them. But he said, you know what? You're, you're now under a penance from me to pray for this woman for the rest of your life. Because of you, she may never convert. And, uh, and as a result... Whatever happens, you will be partially responsible for her soul, and no one can lift this penance from you but me. So, no, go to a church. Go go and convert. You know, the church is for all people. The Orthodox Church is yes. the Church of Jesus Christ. I, and if, if, if my lighting, unfortunately, betrays me, I am a lot browner than I look. I am not Greek. Certainly more Arab. than me. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not Greek. I'm not Arab. I am Hispanic. So I, I do fall into that same camp, too, of, of walking. To the, I actually had that thought of walking into... You know, the, the Russian Orthodox Church, the first time of, am I going to fit in? Are they going to think I'm just some weirdo outsider? This not, no, nothing but love. Nothing but, but oh, you immediately. Know, warm reception. From they the didn't want to let you go when you got transferred to another parish. <laughs> yeah, and, and people who are, you know, racist and are going to be racist, that is demonic. That's not right at all. That is completely, completely against anything that the church teaches that the holy fathers teach and that in christ himself taught so yes. don't let that stop you don't let the fears of people giving you weird looks stop you at all no, i know have really, many, many saints of different backgrounds saint moses the black saint moses, yes yes i, I mean love saint moses saint is a great story of repentance i actually amazing. i came from a bit of a rough background and when i when i was first converting he was one of the first saints i read about and his life touched my my heart it, Think how many how many saints do we have that that are that are you know from the Levant that are really brown that are browner than me, you know? So it's it's don't let don't let any of that no. get it in doesn't the way matter you're coming to the faith. It, you know? It's as Saint Paul wrote in in Christ there's no slave nor freed nor Greek nor Jew, you know. Just just to give you that idea, it's like the whole idea is that your identity is about being in Christ, you know, your your race. Christian, you know, that for thou art the mother of the Christian race. That's that's one of the prayers of the Theotokos. Um, Magdalene uh, Sayya asked a really good question. Hi, Father, is there a saint for grieving? There's a lot of good saints for this, my dear. Um, Saint Xenia, Saint Petersburg, uh, was a woman who dealt with incredible grief at the loss of her husband. Um, she became a fool for Christ, and at one point, she used to dress in her husband's old military uniform. But she would do this to do almsgiving in his name for the purpose of trying to save his soul. So there's, you know, from grief can come immense love and immense love can sometimes cause immense Greek, uh, grief. I would, I would really recommend um, reading uh, various lives of different saints. who You can look up like Orthodox saints who have gone through hardship. St. Xenia is a really good one, though. Yes, yeah, St. Xenia is. Definitely ask for, you know, if you are going through, through a, a difficult time like that, if you're grieving 
someone and you're, you're truly worried for where their soul has ended up, ask Saint Senia for help. She, she will pray for you. Yes. Here's a, a good one for you, Father. It's a, pre it's a pretty quick answer. and we'll, we'll answer this one quickly so we can move through more. Uh, we take it through our reception into the church, through baptism and through chrismation. And I am actually talking to someone on trying to get them to figure that out right now. And they're they're kind of at a crossroads. They don't know who to take as their saint. And they also don't feel worthy of taking a saint's name. Pray. Pray to God. Pray to the saints that you're thinking of. Read about the lives of saints. It'll happen to you like it happens to a lot of people where they will read the life of a saint. And they'll say, okay, maybe this saint. And they'll go and they'll check out another saint. And they'll keep coming back to the same saint. No matter how many times they stick away, they're just drawn to this saint. Then ask for that saint's prayers. Pray that that saint prays for you. And it will become very evident. Or sometimes you, you know, walk in, you know, walk into your local parish and just really look at the icons. Yes. See which one really you just connect with. Because sometimes the saint will call to you through that as well yeah. and try to figure out, you know, even if it's an prayer. unknown saint, it doesn't matter if it's the most unknown saint in the world, that saint is still a saint valid, valid to take their name to be your speedy intercessor. And uh, yes, um, we do view her as, as, as queen of heaven. She's, she's higher than all the angels, right? More honorable than the cherubim beyond compare, more glorious than the seraphim. Saint to saints. Um, to move on, star shooter. If I am born Orthodox Christian, but only recently came back to the faith, do I have to get baptized again? Nope. No, you would have already received a baptism as an infant. You cannot be, receive another Orthodox baptism. There's so much, forgive me, stupid talk online where people will refer to heterodox converting to the church as being rebaptized into the Orthodox faith. It's only one no, one. you were not baptized. And equanimia, such as being received by chrismation, is not a validation of that baptism saying that it had effect, uh, efficacious grace. It's the only thing that's valid in certain cases with the application of chrismation, uh, reception via chrismation, is the form of the baptism. Water, and in all reality, water and the name of the Trinity is pretty low bar. That's not even what was originally constituted as being economizable. The idea of economizable baptisms was anything in terms of immersion in water, triple immersion in water in the name of the Holy Trinity. But that's that's another topic for another day. Um, uh, Trey no. Steller had asked a two-part question that I think we should probably tackle. The first, I'll take the first one if you want to take the second one. Is the second one on what exactly is the New Jerusalem? Yes, and the first one is, are we asleep after we die? If you can, yeah. So um, I'll let you I take that. that. And uh, but thanks for for that question. Just to wrap it up, Star Shooter. No, the, the thing you're going to have to do is go to a priest, have confession, and uh, the proper way, at least as my bishop has instructed, and as the the uh, the, the tretnik uh, calls for, is is to be received back via chrismation. Because when we apostatize, we we lose the grace of the Holy Spirit, and so we we can be chrismated back into the faith, but you cannot receive another baptism, having been baptized as a baby. Uh, you, and essentially, you're just going to renew yourself when you come into the church. So after after we get to Trey's question, uh, we'll take Alex's question because she seems to really want to have that question answered. I'll look for it while we're while we're answering it. Certainly, but, you um, answer Trey's question part one, and then look for yes. Alex's uh, question, and, and I'll answer part two while you're doing that. Yes. So, um, yes, we do get judged instantly in the particular in the 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 particular particular judgment. judgment you know we're not asleep after we die no our bodies right. are not just sleeping that's a modern sleep. protestant it's, it's a jehovah's witness idea seventh day adventists also believe that the same thing no we, we're, we're not asleep our we are our bodies are dead they're no longer in motion our souls which are eternal have been cleaved away from our bodies right now very unnaturally i might say um because of our fallen nature this is, has to happen and we do get judged instantly we're taken on through the aerial toll houses which that's another can of worms anybody who has something to say about just that a, right now just a just quick hold. interjection uh truth defenders i'm not intentionally skipping over your questions i've actually starred them there are certain questions just depending on on the efficiency and the need that we try to address um 
you know, in terms of things that are important. I'm not interested in, in bad mouthing anyone, but in terms of Sam Shamoon, no, I don't really recommend people listen to him. Um, I think it's a good question you asked. Please don't think I was avoiding him. Not if you could see things on my end here, it's like I yeah, got chaotic. over 40 starred questions in one tab. And then I have like sometimes I'll come back to the live tab to try and, and catalog the questions or see where we've gone. And I'll have like just a wall of, of questions that I have to read through. So I'm not I'm not trying to skip over your questions, uh, you know, truth defenders. Really yeah, if, not. Any, if anybody yeah. you get their your questions skipped over, we're not doing it maliciously. It's it's no, no, we're we're doing our best please to forgive try us. To please forgive people. us. So you know, forgive us, forgive forgive our feebleness. Uh, you know, I'm but I agree with you. I don't think that Sam Shamoon should be some of that people watch. I mean, he is foul mouthed. I don't like the language he uses. I don't like how he talks about people. I know he had a, a disagreement. I saw this clip of him disagreeing with David Erhan, who he had had on his show before. And he he says these terrible things about him being Turkish. Well, sorry, Sam, you know, in the kingdom of, of, of heaven, there is no slave, nor Jew, nor Greek, nor free. It doesn't matter. He's an Orthodox Christian. And just because you don't agree and understand his ecclesiology, doesn't give you the right to go and talk in a way that is completely unchristian. You know, I love Sam. I think he's, I think he's a, you know, he's got a good heart. I think what he wants is good. I think the way he's going about things online is not healthy. And he doesn't have a church he's officially part of. He doesn't have a priest. He doesn't have a bishop. People love to go on, a, on, on Jay Dyer, for example, but Jay does have a spiritual father who oversees him. Jay has asked for forgiveness on multiple occasions. He's offered reconciliation i haven't seen this come out of sam shamoon's channel and and yet people will just give a pass to that and there's a lot of you know there's minor theological errors that pop up in sam's uh talks on various things he doesn't seem to understand too much of the issues with people like marmari he doesn't seem to be very um necessarily well read on the subject of nestorianism and on how the Nestorians will use similar terms and wording to us. They, they, and yeah, they do have certain things that they agree with us on in terms of belief, but that doesn't necessarily constitute that we need to have the you know Marvel Avengers team up. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, all the free peoples of the Orthodox or Christian world <laughs> need to unite against blah, 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 blah. Yeah. You know? But, you know, he, but, uh, he's learning. And, and one thing I like about Sam is that he's always said that he's open to correction. Um, the, the thing is this though, is just like in terms of if you're looking for something catechetical to teach you, I really don't recommend his channel for that. Um, if you're interested in seeing refutations of Islam or other things, he, he's got a lot of good stuff. I like Sam. I just don't always like how he approaches certain things. And you know what? I'm, I'm sure he doesn't like how I approach certain things. I'm sure there's, there's people that I've unintentionally offended on this channel. And, uh, you know, I, I certainly ask your forgiveness. It's, uh, certainly not the, the intent. Um, but yeah, I have to agree with Florida. Orthodox Shahada is an amazing channel for taking down uh, the, the lies of Islamophobia. Um, and no, we're not going to forget about your question there, Trey. So the, the thing yes, about the uh, new... Well, uh, just the to, new to wrap up what I was saying is we, we all will have to go through the aerial tow houses, which is the particular yes. judgment. Um, so we, even though we do use the verbiage of reposed, those who have fallen asleep, um, no, we, we don't we don't believe that they are literally asleep we are dead yes but we will rejoin at the last judgment we will be rejoined with our physical bodies because we are inseparable from our spirit you know our bodies are both physical and and spiritual we're not just one or the other to believe we're one or the other is 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 heresy it's error um but yes we will be judged pretty much instantly and we, we see that a lot in the lives of the saints and a lot of the visions yes. and a lot of what, what is accepted in the, in the canons of the church. And uh, even the, in the, the armor of, of faith, I always, I always forget the exact place in the epistles on that. Uh, the Holy Apostle Paul talks about the, the, you know, the, yeah. the, the aerial, the aerial spirits. Like the, it's, it's in the, there, the amazing. parable as well that Christ says Jesus. on um, the, the parable as well as the, the rich man in Lazarus. As well as oh, yeah. is a, a window into what happens to us when we die. Yeah, you know it's absolutely. It's, so you know we we don't we don't just. So I'll to get it. to his part two. Can you find Alex's first question? Yes, so I'll find it. But her. if I can't, I I sort of remember what it was. And I'll please forgive me, Alex, if I can't find it exactly. 
So uh, what exactly is the new Jerusalem and the resurrection of the souls during judgment, uh, judgment Day? How can the saints be with God now if all we still have is to be judged? So the new Jerusalem is actually referring to the church. Jerusalem actually in, uh, in ancient uh, Judaic tongue means uh, a vision of peace. So uh, Jerusalem means the vision of peace. The vision of peace, of course, ultimately is fulfilled when we see Christ upon the cross of, Cal of Calvary. Why? Because Christ conquers death through this. He descends into Hades. He shatters the kingdom of death and he plunders it, it, the riches. You know, he plunders the, the strong man. He binds him and plunders him, which he talks about in the gospel, actually, when he, when he says, how does uh, one, you know, the, the, you know, one must bind the rich, uh, the, the strong man to plunder his, his house, to plunder his riches. Um, but, you know, the... The new Jerusalem is the church. The new Israel is the church. Uh, and, and this is figurative language to describe the kingdom of heaven, that which is, of course, dedicated to God and that serves him. Um, the resurrection of the souls during Judgment Day, it'll be a full bodily resurrection. It's not just a resurrection of the soul, but rather the soul and the body being reunited. You know, the soul is immaterial in the sense that it, it's not made of this heavy, meaty stuff. It doesn't it doesn't die. The soul is immortal. Um and that being said, just kind of like how Christ has two natures, you know, he's fully man, fully God, united in his one hypostasis. Human beings have a material and immaterial nature, right? So it's it's like, you know, the nature of what your body is in terms of being material is different from what your soul is in terms of it being immaterial. As St. John Damascus points out, human nature is the union of these two things, right? And so when the soul separates from the body, the body doesn't cease to be yours any more than the soul does. You know, we don't say the soul of a human being, we say the soul of so and so, right? We there, there's a idea of identity with this that is even maintained after death, and because there are no dead in Christ, that when those who who have died in friendship with God have union with with God through Jesus Christ, they have everlasting life because He is the way, the truth, and the life. And so when when we're united to the person of Christ, we have eternal life because our life is in Him. And this is also why the saints can hear prayers. This is why they can intercede. It's because they are participating in the life of God, not because of you know becoming anything like a, it's not like apotheosis, which teaches a, a change in divine uh, in nature from human to some form of divinity, but rather it is the the full realization of what man is to become. So um, I okay, hope so that I did you. find Alex's question. Um, Good. Good. Can you oh, start it? Are you able to I can't start, it? but I, I'll read it, uh, Alex, if you are still here. Uh, we'll definitely go ahead and, and ask, uh, answer that question. I'll read it. Uh, Alex asked, what if my partner didn't want to marry me and now I'm pregnant? How will God view my child? Well, one, that's a honestly a very terrible situation to find yourself in. And, and to clarify, glory to God that you're having a child. Yes. Yes. Um, not being married makes it hard. It makes it very hard. Children are a and, lot of work. As as a man with two kids who were born back to back, they're a lot of work, but they are worth it. Yes, um, and and you know, it's it is a lamentable situation. And I know I, I wish it's one of those moments where I wish I could ask Saint Nicodemus himself to answer that question, and, because he would answer it very very harshly for that man. Yeah, he, and he's told he told you to pack your bags and leave, and this is the man who got you pregnant. Lord have mercy on his soul. That is a terrible are, are thing. You, are you both? Orthodox Christians? Yeah, is it okay if we we ask that question for you? Oh Lord, have mercy, my my poor. Because dear. that's yeah, that 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 is truly uh, abominable. If uh, you are both Orthodox Christians, and uh, that is the situation, um, your child will not be judged. No, your child is not guilty for this. No, your your child and, is definitely um, not guilty for that, and your child is a gift that is is being given to you that you should care for and, and love yes. no matter how and, hard it gets. And no matter what, um, you know, stay, stay faithful to Christ. You know, the, this man is making an, an incredible mistake to, to not be there for his wife and his child. There's nothing more uh, effeminate and disordered and mm -hmm. outright demonic than a man who abandons his wife and child his or his, his woman and his child. Right. And, you know, he should be taking responsibility and marrying you. That Saint said, Nicodemus had uh, some pretty strong words on that. He was uh, pointing out this example of this spiritual father who was, um, he said was like, it was, it was a good, it's sort of good, but he had some criticisms where this uh, nobleman 
was falling with one of the the handmaidens that was there, one of the one of the servant girls and the spiritual father through a long process of, of helping him out uh, eventually was able to stop the sin and then the nobleman was able to you know finally live up to his family and get married to a noble woman but saint nicodemus pointed out that that's not how he would have handled it he would have told that nobleman that he would not have lifted the penance off of him forever unless he made it right by marrying that servant girl that he fell with even though they're of completely different station completely different class back when that really 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 mattered for nobility it because it's it's that terrible for a man to do that to a woman obviously it's a mutual fall but men do bear a lot of responsibility for that yes. um, especially for this specific situation that you find yourself in Alex, and, it's a, you know talk talk to your priest definitely yeah, and you know, if, seek if confession man, for what is happening you know seek seek and if this man does a foolish thing and doesn't take you back and take responsibility for you and his child um you know be prayerful save yourself don't 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 jump into another relationship take your time take time to heal to grow close to god and if it is god's will and he brings someone into your life to marry i i know couples where a woman uh, had had a child outside of wedlock when she was young and she ended up marrying a wonderful orthodox man and she converted to the faith and she uh, you know is now in a, in a loving relationship he took her on and her son a wonderful couple dear friends and uh, if they're watching they know who they are <laughs> and, uh, and, and I, but, I you know, say for anybody who is watching in the future or watching right now and you make it this far into it and you find yourself in a situation like this as well and you know out of wedlock and having a child and do not under any circumstances get rid of that child do not commit infanticide yes because no, that for the be, love of god don't do that it's that uh, that child no matter what you think how, much of, how burdensome it may seem how difficult it may seem even if you end up alone with just your child that child is a gift and that child shouldn't pay for your sins and you shouldn't be complicit in murder to get rid of this child that child deserves to live he's one of god's creations as well a a, a soul will not be created a child will not be created without god's consent even if it is from something that has happened out of sin yeah so things take can care happen of that sin, but that child is not a mistake you know take care that of that child. child love that child and the church will view that child with love as well the circumstances of that child's birth are it is a, a, a terrible it is what it is what happened but the church does view that child with love yes absolutely and and a wonderful wonderful offer there from from jennifer turner you know god god bless both you wonderful women and and alex just stay strong okay stay strong hold on to that child love that child you know do do everything you can to be a good mother and uh you know just don't don't let this ever make you think that this subtracts from your worth it doesn't god still loves you he hasn't given up on you and uh and that child is not a mistake you know the, in in the coptic churches and in some of the other um schismatic sects with certain things like the Jacobites and all that they they won't baptize children who are born of uh, out of wedlock that's not the standard in the orthodox church we yeah, will we will baptize the children like that. just make sure you find a good god parent and mm -hmm. uh, that you you constantly pray and uh whatever you do this this might even be a comfort for you because God you know God is all knowing. He's you know your, your parish knowing. priest, whoever baptizes your child, will know well as as well on on how to find a a, a godparents for it. But I, I would strongly suggest having also a godfather for this child, whether or not it's male or female. Um, have both sets of godparents to fill in the gap of not having a a father figure in you know for the the time being you know it, it is a lot god god parents will do step in to that role especially in terms of prayer and spiritual support and it did, every child needs that and it's it's an important thing absolutely absolutely um i don't know what wesley curry is on here but uh what <laughs> um you know i think you might be uh, remembering 
something rather odd and uh, that might be exclusive to you, but uh, like a chat GPT bot, he's just going. And yeah. Going. Like God doesn't talk <laughs> like that. I will turn and toss you violently like a ball. Sounds like something a, uh, a toddler would say. <laughs> so right. it's not those, God. What is it? Those Protestant ministers who like kicked a Bible, like it was a football or something. Kind oh, of like that. Gosh. Yeah. I saw that video. Lord have mercy. Um, Okay, so uh, there, there was a question before that I think was a repost. Hold on, let me see. Someone had said it something about their friend. Uh, oh, oh yeah, with normal child again with a very strange question that sounds kind of uh, kind of scary. Uh, a question, a strange one. I have a friend who claims that he had been uh, kinosied, kinosis from birth. He claims he talks to God, his spirit is black cloaked, and his soul abides nowhere, and he is sinless. Well, if his soul abides nowhere, then how is he talking to you? <laughs> I <laughs> would strongly recommend staying within arm's reach, within arm's distance, far away from this person. You know, I, I, would, I would just recommend cutting distance with them for now. They, they, he is they, probably they, possessed. Could be possessed. More could than be like looted. Um, pray for him. Tell him to talk to a priest, and if he refuses to cut the distance i think that's really all there is to say i think father john's right stay away pray for him however pray for him. pray for him a lot keep this person at the top of your prayers this person needs a lot of prayer because that sounds like some either serious delusion like father michael was saying or possession this this individual really really needs well, a wesley, lot wesley you're you're getting blocked jesus did not appear to me seven times and uh anyone who thinks that they have this weird gift of prophecy. Uh, you know, I, I I think you need to go talk to a priest and get some help. God help you. But uh, I'm, I'm not going to put up with this kind of delusion here. So God it's help you, just, Wesley. It's just but, clogging up. Uh, yeah. We're missing some people's questions. We're, we're missing people's questions. So you know what? You're, yeah. uh, you're, you're banned and your comments are deleted. Oh, Bye. God, God bless you, Wesley, and may you find peace. Yeah. Yeah. That's just forgive me. That's like the stupidest thing anyone can try to say is either claiming that they saw Jesus seven times or that Jesus appeared to someone. Seven Never believe this stuff. And even if you, you think you see him, like we said, question it, you know, you never uh, know. So Francis Bull, Bu Bouye. I'm, I'm Hispanic. So I'm going to read that as Bouye. I'm so sorry for butchering your last name, Francis. Um, he is asking father's question. My dad passed away in 2012 as a Muslim. I, being an ex-Muslim and a catechumen, I pray for him. Is there anything in orthodoxy that talks about this issue? Um, we there there actually, is a story. We oh. have saints that you can ask. There, there's actually an akathist you can you can pray for this person who has, oh, you know, for, your, for your father who has, has reposed in error, who has reposed outside of the church. Um, Give me a moment and I will find that. Well, yeah, it's I'll the Akathist to Martyr Virus. Thank you. Thank you of Martyr Virus. Um, Thank you. There was an account. It's on Constantine Zalala's channel of a man whose mother ended up in Hades. And he, he prayed for her. Long and the short of it is, um, in that case, God had mercy. Now, God's mercy may not look like the person getting out of hell. But, it, you know, whatever God's mercy is and how it extends to people in Hades, that's for him to know and for us to have faith in. So you pray for your father. Definitely pray for him. Pray for God to have mercy on him according to his great mercy. And then just trust God. Leave it in his hands. Yeah, pray leave it, leave as it much in his as hands. You want, but leave it in his hands. A, a lot of us, a lot of converts, we have that same exact experience of we don't know where the souls of our of our loved ones are because they're they are outside of the church. But pray, pray for them. And Alex, um, you know, if you need if you need anything, feel free to reach out to the Living Orthodox Media, and Father John and I would be happy to to talk if you need anything. Okay, you know, God God help you. I I really feel for you on this. It's uh, no one can force anyone to do anything, but you know what, you you just keep being as strong as you can and and do the best you can. If you need anything, uh, Living Orthodox Media at gmail .com. You can reach myself or Father John through that. Okay. God help uh, you. Bad intro actually is is re asking about his question, and I, I scrolled up to to catch it. Bad intro. Hopefully you're still here. I mean, it was only a minute ago. Hopefully you still are. Uh, he asked, "I'm genuinely interested in becoming a priest, but I'm oh, 37 yeah. and unmarried. Finding a woman who is devout is increasingly difficult. I've been considering cel celibacy. Any advice? Do you have anything to say on that? I have a few things to say 
on that, but Father, I'll leave that to you just for right now. Yes. Okay. Uh, sorry, can you repeat that? I was just trying to sort out the comments here. Uh, he's uh, asking about, uh, he's unmarried, 37, and wants to become a priest, but uh, so at, having at this point, finding a matushka. At this point, in, uh, there's a good chance that you should discern potentially celibacy. There's a, there's a chance. You know, pray for God's will on this because you never know. God might bring a woman into your life when you least expect it. Sometimes there have been men who have decided, you know what, that's it. I'm going to start inquiring into the monastic life. They become novices, and then they meet the women they're supposed to marry. I think that happened to Father Peter Hears, actually. Yes, it I, did. It happened yeah. to Father Peter. Yeah. He, he was about to go to Mount Athos. He was literally on the, the ready the to go in the dock that take, goes yeah, to Mount Athos. He was an and novice. they sent him back. His his spiritual father sent him back. If I remember right, the or yeah. the some elder sent him back uh, to to you know. Oh, just wait. Think about it for a few days in the village, and then he met his wife, and he he didn't become an, an Athenite monk because of that. But uh, yes, I, I mean, at, at at your age and and you know facing those those kind of questions, you know, pray. I, I hopefully you you are praying that the Lord will will if it is His will that you would find someone to be that for you um but it isn't out of the norm it, it isn't to be unexpected to to end up being celibate not everyone is meant to be married not everyone's meant to be a priest if you really do feel strongly in that that you have a very very strong desire to become closer to god to give your life up to the lord in the martyrdom that is priesthood consider becoming a monastic contact um, uh, the abbot of a monastery and see how that works for you. If, if that is a, something that you would want to, to pursue. Um, but think of it that way, because becoming a priest is the same thing. It's a martyrdom. It is almost like a martyrdom. It, it's, it's, you're giving yeah. up your, your life. I mean, if you're cool with being betrayed, slandered, hated, go for it. <laughs> you know, but, uh, uh, always, always with prayer, always with prayer and seeking God's will. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. sometimes you might even just end up maybe not even becoming, you know, uh, clergy and not becoming a monastic, but being celibate in the world. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that. You could be easily, a, uh, you know, a, a, a father to many children in your parish, you know, yeah. helping guide those children, praying for them, being a great godfather to them. It's yeah, really what thing. the Lord asks of us. If someone were to ask me when I became an Orthodox Christian, if I wanted to become a priest, I would have called them nuts. You're you're schizo. You're you're out there. And but here here I am. I mean, it's. Yeah, I mean, it was it was my wife who first noticed the the calling to priesthood in me, and she <laughs> first day meeting Father Vladimir, she's like, "So he should be a priest." And I was like, "You're nuts. You don't know this guy. You don't but, know the priest." You know, you know, God, <laughs> God bless you in that endeavor. That's that is a, a great thing to aspire to. And you know, if you do yes. find someone to do that, and you can you go through the process of ordination, that's beautiful. But if not, you know, it's it's a cross that you have to accept. And you know, it, you? It, no one can tell you yeah. other than maybe the no. abbot at a monastery or your spiritual father. But no one can keep you from trying to become a monastic. Why, if why you are really you attacking my beautiful Bishop Mar Mar Emanuel? <laughs> Well, um, for one, he's not a bishop. You know, he's in the Orthodox Church. We don't consider him a bishop. We don't have any acknowledgement for his ecclesiastical rank other than nominally. Um, we don't consider him a Christian. If you want the blunt truth, um, we don't consider Nestorians Christians. Sorry, they were anathematized. You have to anathematize Nestorius. Uh, if, if you are going to believe in the Holy Spirit and if you're going to believe in the first two ecumenical councils, but disregard the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, the eighth, well, then you, you got a huge problem because then if we're supposed to disregard every council to, to accept a faulty Christology and a heresy arc, uh, such as Nestorius, well, then what's to stop the Arians from coming in and saying, yeah, you know what, maybe we're right too. Maybe we can have our, our cake and eat it too and claim that Jesus Christ is created. So, no, Mar Mari teaches Christological era. Uh, I have many clips of him that I will use after Lent that point out where he is using subtle terminology to point to this idea of two subjects in Christ. Um, the truth of the matter is you cannot believe that Jesus Christ has 
two hypostases is two hypostases with one parsopa or one uh, prosopon because this creates such a sharp distinction and a sharp divide between the humanity and divinity of Christ that they are practically separate people. You know, the, the hypostases, uh, the human hypostases in the Nestorian Christology is essentially just an organ for the logos to dwell within. So no, we, we don't consider, uh, we don't consider Marmari Emmanuel a Christian. That doesn't mean I hate him. I'm not attacking him. I've never once said he's evil. He's a, a shyster. He's a scam artist. I've never said these things. Um, what I have said <laughs> is that he's a heretic. An error. He's an error. He's a heretic. His heresies are demonic. Why? Because the church has condemned his, the heresies that he's supporting and the heresy arc who he calls a saint uh, one his person, own liturgy, demonic. And one person people, bringing up the question, I thought Bishop Mari Mari is a Coptic. As far as I'm aware, he is what I like to call a double heretic. He is a heretic to the Orthodox and to the Coptics, I believe. Wasn't yeah, he like the, the Coptics or would consider him a heretic too because their their heresy was formulated to kill that heresy. So it's it's like yeah, he's a double heretic because um, he also teaches ecumenism and he he encourages people to break the canons and the laws and the obedience to their church in order to commune at his church. He says Catholics and Orthodox can commune at his church. Well, no, they can't. Not according to us. So. You know, he's setting himself up above the canons, the councils. Um, the other issue is, is that, you know, I've had people just to quickly address this, uh, say that, oh, well, it cuts off in part. There's other clips where you can see him in, you know, saying that Mary did not give birth to God. And then he calls anyone who says that heretics. So, OK, well, then who is Christ to you? And he'll say Christ is God. But this is that roundabout way of talking to say in all reality that, uh that Christ is in all reality is, is two hypostases. Um, so, uh, and, and yes, we can answer that, Mac Dan. Can you please repost the question? Can you copy and repost it? Um, bear in mind that it's a busy, busy live feed. Yes, please, please definitely, if you can uh, repost them. I think I saw them. And let me see if they're actually ones that we yeah. had bookmarked a while back. So um, because yeah, they, to, I, I to kind of wrap that up, that whole thing about, oh, you, you manipulated it. I didn't. The, the clip cut off there, the one that I found. I found another clip uh, where it's the whole thing. And not only that, but it's pretty telling when he says, and not to a man as the confused uh, area said, but to Christ like Mar Nestoria said. That's, by the way, Saint Nestoria. So why is he calling him a saint? Why is he saying it's like a heretic said? It, it doesn't take much critical thinking skills to say he's actually affirming Nestorian Christology when he says this. Actually, so, uh, MacDan22, I think I do remember your question on purgatory. It was, you were asking if what the Orthodox Church believes on purgatory, I believe, and um, that you liked that, you found some comfort in that. Like, what, what do we believe on? Yeah, we on don't believe in purgatory. Pur purgatory is this weird idea that when you die, you're if you're going to purgatory, you're assured heaven. You just got to burn a little bit to you know get rid of the excess fat, so to speak. Um, no, we don't. We don't hold to purgatory. There's no basis for it in the fathers and the early fathers. Anything post schism yeah. or pre schism, I mean, you won't find anything that supports purgatory. You might find a couple ideas from some of these Frankish writers, and that's because if this was a Frankish idea that developed. So it's not yeah. something held up. What you will find is lots of mentioning of the toll houses. You'll find and plenty one, of that from, from the lives of the Desert Fathers and well before. Yeah. Well, one thing I will say, too, is uh, St. John Chris, I believe it was St. John Chris Haas, it may have been St. Basil the Great, who said that, um, you know, it, it is going to be hard. A lot of us are going to end up in Hades, you know, before the Dread Judgment Day. A lot of us are going to end up there. However, those who have committed moderate and pardonable sins will be judged, you know, very kindly. They will make it. I, I can't remember exactly which saint it was who had said that. It may have been St. John Chrysostom. But those who have committed moderate and pardonable sins will make it into paradise. Yeah. So as long as you are practicing your spiritual life, as long as you are taking it seriously, going to confession, preparing for communion, you know, and all the ways that you need to, a fasting and prayer, giving good confessions, giving alms, praying, ev fasting, everything that you need to do, even if at the aerial toll houses, you end up in Hades, 
the church, those who are still here will pray for you. God so, will be merciful. Yeah, exactly. To come we have Nikita. many saints who, who have seen uh, people being released from Hades. It is a thing that happens before the dread judgment day. Even then, God will be merciful and will, through the prayers of those you know, here, Absolutely. this is why we still pray for our dead, they will be released. So just to kind of move the questions along, Nikita uh, Kotol uh, Kotolkov had asked a question, and, and uh, I just to put this up so that I don't lose it because sometimes the chat jumps and lags on my end. Um, Father, my church is in Russia, and there are no churches close enough for me to attend regularly. Are my daily prayers to God and my saint Nikita the martyr enough? Well, when, when you're not able to go, when you really just aren't able to go, yes, do your daily prayers. Maybe uh, read an extra canon or an akathist or a kathisma that day to try and at least just give a bit more of that day to God. You know, still, I would even recommend fasting until after when people would have received communion. Uh, and that way you're still joining yourself to the life of the church and you're not just, you know, kind of off in space, right? But no, you, you have to absolutely keep up with your prayer life. And it's good that you're doing that. Um, and just, you know, maybe expand just a little bit more on it uh, on Sundays. Um, only one true church asked, do you think Catholic baptisms are valid? So in the sense that what you, what we hear people say with valid, the answer is no, because a lot of the times, um, despite what certain online uh, lay theologians try to say, most people do not have the distinction between validity and efficacy in mind when they ask this question. They tend to think that valid also means efficacious. And to be fair, that in, in modern English, that's a pretty fair assumption to make. No, the, the way the canons of the church view this, even the fact that we have a rite of chrismation and renunciation of papal heresies for, for people converting from papism, says we do not believe that their sacraments have any validity. We don't acknowledge their It's a, it's a condescension to receive them by just chrismation. And, and in Rocor, as far as I know, at least in our diocese, we baptize Catholics. You know, we yes. want union with the Catholics, with the Protestants. It's like Bishop Luke said, you baptize them. It's a it's a long standing issue in the church at large on how to deal with reception of the heterodox and schismatics and stuff like that. Um, you'll have a few schools of thought on that based on certain saints, and they're both they're all valid. There a lot of them are valid positions, but yeah, truly it is. It's not a valid baptism, but. Sometimes, maybe a lot of the times, maybe too many times, they'll be received just by chrismation, especially if it's if it's a huge stumbling block to someone's salvation. Um, exactly. It's a condescension. It's a true application of economia when it's being on a case by case and not by a broad paint stroke. So Chase, uh, our good friend Chase Haggard asked, I have heard that the despair of thinking you can't be forgiven is an extreme form of pride. We did touch upon this earlier, and yes, it is, because as Father John wisely pointed out, this is this is the case when somebody thinks that their sins are beyond God's ability to forgive. They, they go beyond His mercy. Yeah, you don't. If if you think that you are, even you're unintentionally doing it, and it's deeply rooted in pride. The, the pride is so deep you can't even see it anymore. If you believe that your sins, you are so evil and darkened that not even God Himself could save you, that's a that's a pretty heavy heavy amount of pride right there. So, um, I, I do see your question, Kingdom Enjoyer. I actually did start it. I am going to answer that question. Um, we're going to, and I'm going to answer it quickly. We'll answer this one quickly too. Advice for staying out of uh, despair after repeated sins. I'll go first, and then you go, Father. We'll just we'll yep. do this one. Yeah, yeah. Quick. So um, remember what Christ said to the Pharisees. I uh, learn what this means. I desire mercy. Right. His he his ways are higher than our ways. Whenever we think we can find ways to condemn ourselves and to stay put in a, in a place of despair, we need to remind ourselves that God's ways are higher than ours and that his sense of simple justice is far greater than ours. And this includes mercy, um, that there is nothing that God can't forgive and won't forgive because God is infinitely good. It's up to us to work with the time that we have to be worthy and to live a life full, uh, filled with the fruits of repentance. And we have to remember that so many great and holy fathers have pointed out that a lot of our spiritual life is the, rep, the falling down and getting back up, but not falling down and then getting back up thinking, well, I fell and God's going to forgive me. No, it's we get back up in pain, run to, you know, confession, confess. And then we, we even if we feel like our fall is inevitable, we're so addicted to whatever it is that is our tempter, whatever it is that is our big 
sin that's causing us to constantly fall. We need to see how much further we can make it the next time. And we should always be aiming to do better. Even if we're, even if we fall again, we should be able to at least say, thank you, God, that I did better, that I held out by your, because of your grace, because I've been working on my spiritual life, even though I fell, that I was allowed to last longer this time. So just keep getting back up and working on being stronger each and every time. You should be stronger, not, not slide back, but be stronger every time. Precisely. Uh, Stylus asks, can I be married again in the church, Father, at a big Orthodox wedding years ago? That is where we'll have to say you'll have to definitely talk to your local priest and to the bishop. Yeah. There's a lot of things to consider. There's truly only one marriage of the church, and, and it's really sad when marriages fail. I, I've i only known, like it's even as Elder Ambrose said, you know, the second marriage is usually a condescension. The third, most of the time, is outright prohibited. And, and even then, if you do have another marriage, my, uh, my dear inquirer, um, it won't be the same service. It won't be a crowning. Uh, second mm-hmm. marriages are actually a, a penitential, penitential act. Yeah. Um, so talk to your priest, talk to your bishop, and uh, because unfortunately I just don't know enough to really give a solid answer on that, and uh, and I don't really feel like it's a, it's a good place to do that. So uh, speak to your priest, speak to your bishop, and and trust that they will, with mercy and love, guide you. Yeah. Uh, one one thing I do want to comment on very very quickly before you take that question of uh, just to follow up on uh, something Mac Dan had said um, on he said basically I feel I'll never be worthy enough because I'm so weak I'll never enter without the extra help. That's good. Yes. That's good. We all we need, need the extra, extra help. help. None the extra of help us. Come. None of us are worthy of the kingdom of heaven. None of us. But God wants us to be saved. And he will give us that extra help uh, if we are in pain of our sins. If we are truly in pain of our sins, we repent and we keep hoping and praying and trusting in his mercies and doing what he asks of us. And we will make it. We'll make it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Let's see. So uh, just to answer this question, I'm going to answer it pretty briefly. But uh, Father Mikhail, are you still close with Subdeacon Nectarios? What is your opinion of him joining the GOC? What is your opinion of the, the GO in general? Thank you and God be with you, Father. Well, thank you and God be with you too. God, God bless you, Kingdom Enjoyer. Um, honestly, I'm heartbroken about it. I, I love Subdeacon Nectarios. Uh, he and I have definitely had a bit of a falling out. We, we're, we're not seeing eye to eye on things, and that's why, according to tradition, is canceled. Um, but, uh, you know, I pray for Subdeacon. I encourage all of you to pray for him and not to, you know, go and bug him or attack him or anything like that. You know, he's like all of us, he's got his struggles and, you know, there's certainly, there were things that motivated him going into the GOC that, you know, it, when you look at it, it's very understandable why he did. I don't agree with it, but it's understandable. It's understandable that he, he had certain issues pop up. Uh, there were certain things with him that should have been handled better pastorally that weren't handled very well. Um, but that being said, at the same time, one doesn't leave the, the canonical church. One doesn't leave communion with the Lord and with his saint and yeah. with his servants just because Judas sits at the table. You know, that, that's my issue with the GOC and with the mindset of the old calendarists in general is that their mindset is, oh, well, let's let's enact this canon that says we can uh, depart from bishops. It doesn't say to go set up a para synagogue. It doesn't say to go and violate another canon. By upholding a canon, oh well, we're breaking communion with heretical bishops. You're setting up a Paris synagogue. You know, there's been no canonical wide condemnations. There's been no ecumenical councils, no anathemas against certain groups. Not only that, but to quote, ironically, to quote him on one of our talks, going into this into the old calendarist movement, well, you you're taking yourself out of the fight. You don't have a voice, so why keep screaming and crying and hitting the walls when you're not even in the in the church itself? You. What, what influence is that really other than, you know, just, just trying to convince people of your side? Um, and yes, the GOC was in communion with Rokor until 2007 with the reunion. Um, that being said, said, even though we are in communion with the Moscow Patriarchate, we are a self-governing autonomous church. And, you know, there, there's always going to be issues. I mean, you know, people will say, oh, well, you know, your, your, your hierarchs, you know, have, uh, you're in communion with people on the World Council of Churches. 
Like I said, Judas sat at the table with Christ and the apostles. We don't leave Christ because of Judas. You know, we, to spite Judas, you, you're going to leave Christ. It's like cutting off your nose to spite your face. It doesn't make sense. Also, so, for, for anyone who might be having a little bit of a, maybe new to orthodoxy and, and maybe into some deeper things, uh, GoArch and GOC are two different things. Uh, GoArch is the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America. GOC yeah. is the self-styled, what do they call it? Genuine Synod, Orthodox? Yeah, Genuine Orthodox. They're, they are schismatic. GoArch are, cano are a canonical church. Yeah. If you do have a GoArch, they're just the Greeks. There are Greek brothers here in, in America. There is a GoArch church near you, and it's the only one near you. By all means, go to them. They're, they are yeah. canonical. We may not be in, Rokor may not be in communion with them. There might be an unfortunate, terrible rift, uh, but they are canonical. Go to them. Simple as that. Absolutely. Uh, Jennifer Turner. Uh, she, yes, I saw your question earlier. I'm glad you reposted. So a book recommended for a catechumen for terminology. Well, there's a there's a few books. Now, there's not necessarily, there should be a book. Maybe Father and John and I should put together a, a little like index card <laughs> yeah. or something of uh, common cards for terminologies. Uh, catechumens um so you know there, a lot of the terminology is going to be learned organically um there is a book by yaroslav pelican which kind of gets into the more if i feel if i'm recalling correctly gets more into kind of breaking down the philosophical christological terminology um there is uh you know the the, the law of god by archpriest seraphim slobodskoy the law of god by father daniel sasayev um there's the um uh Orthodox Dogmatic Theology by Proto Presbyter Michael Pomazansky. That's a really good one, too. Uh, and that will contain terms and that will help you learn some of the terminology of the church. Even the, um, the book by Vladimir Lasky, the, uh, uh, the Mystical Theology of the Eastern Church, that, that is a really good one, too. So I would, uh, I would highly, highly recommend uh, just starting maybe with something like, and, and actually, despite the title, Orthodox Dogmatic Theology by Proto Presbyter Michael Pomazensky is very accessible. It's actually very much catechetical text. So um, I would recommend checking those out, Jennifer, and, and seeing if that can help out. Otherwise, you know, uh, just stick around. <laughs> you know, a lot of a lot of the terms that you absorb it. Yeah, you just kind of absorb it. It takes time. You know, the church has been around for over 2,000 years. Um, it's not an overnight. You got some learning together. to do. <laughs> we all do. We all have some learning to do. Doesn't matter how long you've been an Orthodox Christian. Uh, at any rank, we're all we're all, we're always learning. We're always. Learning. It's two thousand years of tradition of, of of things to learn. It's it's humbling. Um, Ortho Bro James had asked the question. He reposted it actually. I want to make sure that we get to that one. <clears throat> Ortho Bro James. Okay. Yeah, where where was that. his question? He has asked. What are your thoughts on certain evangelicals claiming they went to heaven and or hell? It seems like a very dangerous thing that can lead many, many without the right mindset astray. Father Sarah from Rose actually wrote about this in Orthodox uh, in um, the soul after death. Um, and, and a lot of it is demonic delusion. Notice that there's no consistency across the board with them. It's always, it's always different. It's always different. And, there, and even then. Yeah. It's not just superficially different. It's even at its root, it's completely different because a lot of, say, maybe the toll houses, some saints see it differently, but the root of what is happening is exactly the same, the same because the same. their spiritual eyes are interpreting it as best as they can. But these evangelicals, it's radically different, radically different the way they're seeing, claiming to see heaven and hell. It's it's just delusion. <laughs> it really is delusion. Yes. And uh, and you're welcome to uh, MJR. You're welcome. God bless you, and uh, have a good have a good rest. Have a good dinner. I hope it's a it's a good Lenten meal, and and uh, delicious. <laughs> yeah. Lent doesn't. I, I saw a little bit of, of of back and forth. Just to one more time reiterate, the Go Arch, the Greek Orthodox are the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese in America, canonical good Orthodox Church. Um, if you, if you go to one, that's fine. That there, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of problems in the gorge, and everyone 25. If they yeah. go into schism, well, then you're gonna have to relocate. But, but you know, um, we have, a lot of us, a lot of the you know, there's problems everywhere. But they are a canonical church. They are an Orthodox church. Yeah, you you're go for Christ. Church, yeah, there's nothing. You, you go for nothing Christ. Wrong with that. You go for exactly. You go for Christ. 
Yeah, it's uh, it's it's for Christ. You know, it, it, like I said, Judas may sit at the table. You don't abandon the Lord's Supper because of him. And and you know, if if uh, if if they decide to abandon the sheepfold and and join the Papists, then go elsewhere. You know, you, you'll still be an Orthodox Christian. You just got to leave and not commune from the altars of the of the heretics. Um, do uh, this. Anybody have good recommendations for Orthodox study Bibles or general sources? I watched some YouTubers take notes, but was hoping for more info. Well, um, again, I'll, I'll uh, just quickly grab it. It's a pretty quick, uh, quick answer, and I yeah. want to kind of fly through the rest of these because it's getting late. <laughs> yeah, the, the one if you look it up on Amazon, like the Orthodox Study Bible, it's a great resource. Great, great resource. Um, while he's pulling. Uh, I'm going to see if I can actually find that. Another great resource, especially for general studies, that if you're, you know, maybe driving around a lot or doing lots of housework, yard work, things like that, to listen in the background, Orthodox Talks by Father Cosmos uh, from the Saints. Uh, was Michael the, the Archangel. Convent. Yeah, Saint Michael the Archangel Monastery in Australia. Monastery in, uh, in Australia. And in terms really, of really best talk. translations of the gospel, this one. The Orthodox New Testament, Holy Gospels, Volume 1 by Holy Apostles Convent. Best translation of the Gospels. Um, also, aside from it being a very good translation, it has the invaluable resource of, instead of just little study notes at the bottom, it has end notes. And uh, these are all extensive commentaries on different passages from the New Testament, from, from the Gospels, by various different saints. You know, we, we have... Uh, Blessed Theophilact, we have St. John Chrys uh, uh, Chrysostom, we have, um, uh, who else do we have here? We have uh, St. Bede, um, more St. Bede, there's a lot of St. Bede in here too. There's a Western Saint, um, St. Hilary, St. Irenaeus, um, St. Bede, St. John Chrysostom, you get the idea, there's a lot of saints, there's a lot, and there, it's extensive commentary, it's not just like a little blurb. It's much more extensive. So that, that would be my recommendation is the Holy Apostles Convent uh, Gospels. It's my favorite one. Um, Father, what is your advice for a Protestant who's confused about whether Orthodoxy or Roman Catholicism is true in their competing claims? Uh, look at, I would, my, my ultimate advice is to look at church history. Yeah, look at the history. Look at the history. So Christianity started in five cities, right? Jerusalem, Antioch, Alexandria, Rome. Constantinople. Well, let's say this is Rome, and let's say these are the other four patriarchs. Only Rome falls away. Why? Because Rome reneged uh, on on their belief in the uh, Catholicity and the and the collegiality of the bishops. Um, in the Eighth Ecumenical Council, known as the Phocian Synod or the Phocian Council, uh, we have a situation where uh, there was a false Ignatian Council a few years before. Ignatius got this uh, got deposed. St. Photius got reinstated as Patriarch of Constantinople. And unlike with the Robber Council, with the Ignatian Council, the Phocian Council was actually called by the Emperor. It is a legitimate ecumenical council presided over by St. Photius the Great. And all of the Latin bishops attended. It was There was representatives from every single patriarchate. And all of them denounced any notion of a superior universal head, the claims to papal supremacy, uh, the filioque. And only 150 years later, the Latins decide to renege on that once some Frankish bishops get elected to the, to the rank of Patriarch of Rome. And aside from that, uh, what ends up happening is that they start pushing and espousing the filioque. And this, of course, did lead to the Great Schism of 1054. To me, that just looking at it from that perspective makes it astoundingly clear that the Orthodox Church has the claim to being the apostolic faith. It's changed the least. Um, you don't have all these strange uh, innovations. The other thing with Roman Catholicism, their responses to heresy always result in them being changed by the heresy within their realm. You know, the Lutherans, well, that's the so-called Mass of the Ages, the, the traditional Latin Mass. That's a Lutheranized version of the old Latin Rite. So it, it was made to be more appealing to Lutherans. It's a watered down liturgy. So, you know, you, you have a situation where, where people are constantly changing and adapting to, to meet with the environment and the circumstances they're in. And they're, 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 it's a very worldly thing. You know, the Pope is constantly embroiling himself in worldly politics. That's not, that's not what the church is for. So, 
Uh, just a quick question. Uh, Matt had asked, where should Canadians order incense if it isn't available in the church shop? Amazon doesn't have a good selection and American websites cost an arm and a leg for shipping. One, don't don't order incense from Amazon, please. No, no. Um, and, and same with prayer ropes. I wouldn't I wouldn't really. Yeah, don't. You don't, you don't know what you're going to get. Um, I would say spend the arm and a leg getting them from either Jordanville or from uh, from Holy Cross. Or yeah, and in Canada, there's there's the um, the Constellation of the Virgin Mary Monastery, yes. founded by Elder Frem in Quebec, and they do sell incense as well, and you can get it a little bit cheaper there. Um, it's not ready yet, but my church uh, here in Lethbridge will be having an online store at some point this year. Um, won't be for a little while yet. Uh, the, the person who runs it is about to give birth uh, to, to her next child, and uh, we're going to wait until... Uh, she's recovered from that so that we can then go out and start looking at, you know, getting a shipping plan set up and everything else. So there, there will be uh, more options opening up. We're going to look to try to, to contribute to distributing Orthodox books and uh, Orthodox supplies. But uh, if you just bear with us, we're working on it. Okay, Legacy um, Icons is good. And there's also a, a one that I just found the, out. The, the shipping from Legacy Icons isn't because they're in the States. Yeah, uh, one that I just found out about recently is saintnick.ca. Um, they are a Canadian uh, seller of books and church supplies. Um, you can get some pretty good deals on on incense there that they source. They they actually list where they source all of their supplies from. And a lot of it does come from the monasteries as well. So exactly. they're also a, a good source, mainly because they have said where exactly they get their stuff from. That's always important. You want to support the monasteries and you want to support people who support the monasteries. Yeah. Got to support the church. Um, Matthew Matt asks, would you say such feats of holiness are attainable by all Christians or is this presumptuous slash delude slash prideful to, to suppose such. Well, we're not like the evangelicals or the charismatics who think that it's a bargain sale on miracles and, and spiritual gifts. Um, they certainly, it is attainable. Is it, is it possible? Yes. Is it difficult? Yes. Yeah. We're um, all, we are all called to be saints. That yeah, is, will everyone the, obtain the these spiritual gifts and powers? No. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's, we, we aspire. We should always be aspiring don't to, aspire to have spiritual gifts. No, not not aspire to, yeah. to be holy. Aspire to be a good Christian. Yes. Let God sort out what he gives to who and when. And if you think something's going on, you think you have the gift of prophecy. Well, I would first off say reject it and say you don't and talk to your spiritual father. Talk to your priest. Don't just go off on a whim. Uh, Noodles had asked two rapid fire questions, which I'll ask, or uh, which I'll answer pretty quickly. Uh, how do I react when people dismiss my faith as invalid? I've brought up words of a saint's Bible. They insinuate that I'm not good enough for Christ's forgiveness. It makes me cry. And I want to evangelize to people who I consider outcast. Is it a bad thing to do this? I love telling people about my experience and joy with faith. Well, for starters, people who are writing you off like that, especially if you're talking to them about the faith, once you've talked to them about the faith and they're still blowing you off, then that's okay. Don't You don't have to continue engaging with them. You try. That's what we're asked. We're asked to try to help these people. You've thrown the seeds. You've cast the seeds. If they catch, if if you know, if, if they grow, then glory to God. If not, they've rejected it of their own volition. It's and, tough uh, that it does make you cry, but you know, just know that you can pray for them still. You yeah, and, and forgive them. them. Forgive them. Yes, forgive them, definitely. And um, for those who are outcasts, you know, evangelizing to them, that, that is good to an extent, but you have to have some discernment in doing that um, on, on who you're speaking with and stuff and making sure that you're not throwing pearls before swine um, yes. in that it's not people who just want to argue or maybe people who are, you know, into a lot of weird spiritual stuff who are just going to sort of absorb it into their weird neo-pagan spiritual nonsense yeah. that's going on. But in and of itself, it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. So, uh, Maria Kelly, just to quickly answer your question. Yes, it's a really good store. There's a lot of good stuff in Legacy Icons. Uh, the reason why I just don't often recommend it for uh, Canadians is just because it's super expensive to ship to us. And uh, Trudeau's ruined our, our country and our dollar value uh, astoundingly a lot in, in the eight years he's been prime minister. So, God willing, hopefully we'll get caught up economically soon. And shipping through the States for us won't be so bad. <laughs> um 
to come back to this, uh, so only one true church. So if you get baptized Catholic, then you get chrismated Orthodox. Is that fine? Well, it's it. Yeah, it's okay if you get chrismated. I still recommend you get baptized. I've met, I've never met a single person who regrets getting an Orthodox baptism. I have met plenty of people who are heartbroken that they didn't get baptized. Sometimes priests make mistakes and they skip over very vital prayers in the service. And we have to be careful not to fall into, it's not, no, some people say, well, this is sacramental rigorism. No, we also have to be careful not to fall into another form of rigorism, a form of rigoristically abusing the sacraments and thinking that God is just going to constantly give us a free pass to be inattentive and not watchful. Um, there are prayers that should be prayed when somebody is being received into the church and shouldn't be skipped. Um and in all reality, uh, in, in my parish and in the diocese that Father John and I serve in, we receive Catholics by baptism. That's it. Yeah. Uh, unless we there's some baptism. absolutely big circumstances and situations that need bonomia to be applied to the person, we will recommend and push the baptism first because it's it's needful. It's important. Yes. But it's, it's on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, there is a really quick question that I had seen. I forget who it was from um, saying that do the Orthodox uh, yes. view the New and Old Testament as literally true? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, why not? It's the inspired word of God. Yeah. You know, we believe that the Holy Spirit reveals things. And if we were to even doubt the, the New Testament, what we're going to doubt Christ and the and the men who walked with him? Uh, I don't think so. No, we, we do take it literally. We're not textual critics. Uh, and uh, most textual criticism, there's been some other channels out there uh, that have done a really good job disassembling a lot of textual criticism because a lot of it ends up contradicting itself anyways. And this is why atheism is on the on the rise, why degeneracy is on the rise in the West is because the Protestants and many of the goofy heretical approaches to scripture have made Christianity appear either wimpy or inconsistent. And it's not. And, and, and in some places, too, we see it both literally and figuratively. How exactly. about that one? Exactly. Uh, it's complicated. Great. It's a very, it's, it's complex. The book that the Bible is an extremely complex book. It is. Is Jesus, uh, so praise the Lord asked, is Jesus a part of God's energy or essence? And could you explain the distinctions, please? Oh boy. <laughs> so there's a, yeah, these, these are, it's a good, it's <laughs> a good thing you've asked this question. There's, there's, there's some errors here. Um, Jesus is not a part <clears throat> of God's essence. He is a divine Person. He is a divine hypostasis who insubstantiates divine, uh, divinity. So divinity is not separate from, from the three persons, right? So when we say God's essence, we have to realize that when we're speaking about God's energies or essences, yes, people oftentimes will use God and the Father interchangeably. But the other application is that when we speak of any one of the divine persons, we are speaking of one God because there's one divine nature communicated across three divine persons who interpenetrate one another or in one another. And there, as a really good paper on um, Nicene Trinitarian, uh, Trinitarianism put it, uh, the persons are not separated by materially or spatially. So there's no separation of them because, you know, we have to understand God is spirit. God is uncreated and immaterial. Of course, Jesus Christ assumed human nature and all that it means, all that is proper to human nature, he assumed. And so he does have a physical body. But that being said, as a divine person, and in terms of his divine nature, he's, in circums he's uncircumscribable. So he is not a part of God's essence. He insubstantiates it. He inhypostatons or inhypostasizes humanity and divinity. He inhypostasizes divine nature. He is not... Uh, or in other words, substantiates it. Nature cannot exist outside of hypostasis. It doesn't exist outside of persons. So he is eternally begotten of the Father and eternally has an internal relation to the Father. He is his own full hypostasis, but he's, of course, there's a perfect union between the members of the Holy Trinity. They they share a divine will and a divine energy. Um, in terms of the, the essence energies distinction, um, God's essence versus is, you know, it's causative. It's what is that interactive principle that makes God, God, right? The energies are the operations, right? So this is what God does. Like, you know, the ability to create, to forgive sins. Um, we, we see manifestations of God's uncreated energies in miracles, like the miracle of the Holy fire in Jerusalem. So it's, it's very important for us not to 
confuse first off um, with what I'm seeing in this is the confusion between essence and person. And you'll find a lot of the time Coptics, many Protestants fall into this issue of confusing God's essence with his person, meaning that they, they might even fall into what's called tritheism, where they view the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as uh, particularized universals and not one universal in three particulars. So it's uh, it's very important for us to to be accurate in how we talk about God about the Trinity. Um, oh, so, uh, uh, Tim Tim Milton asked a question that I a lot of people want answered, and it's actually a really good one. Um, saying, if I putting aside everything else that's unnecessary, fully devote my daily life to Christ and the Orthodox Church, can my devotion alone save my family? None of them attend nor fully believe. That that's up to God. It's, it's that's where it's we have to be careful to, of the subtle pride. Can yeah, my devotion? Your devotion is important for you growing closer to Christ, and it can help people. But ultimately, the salvation of your family is totally up to God. You know, and and it's their, their, their own free will. They they have to accept yeah. it. But I will say that yes, you should be putting aside as much as unnecessary, not for anything other than pleasing the Lord and everything else will follow suit if it is his will. No. St. Seraphim Sarov yeah. quote that is something that many, 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 many people quote is that if we let the light of Christ shine within us, we will convert thousands. As in, if we give our lives directly, totally to Christ, live a godly life and people can see that change in our lives, it will touch them. It will affect them as well. But we need to be doing it in a very pure way, not in a bargaining way with God, but because we want to please the Lord. And I understand. I, I really, really understand that. I, you know, my fam I wish my family could convert as well. But it's it's for me, it's not it's still not time for me to even really speak to them about such things. And I don't even think I'm spiritually prepared to handle those conversations with my family. And I'm just trying to work on my spiritual life as best as I can. And then if God permits that I can come back to my family in, in Miami, have contact with them and speak to them again, that they will see again the changes that have happened in my life, see my disposition. Maybe I can have an opportunity to speak to them and, and change their minds on things. But Absolutely. ultimately, that is up to them to accept. And it is up to the Lord to grant that, but we have to do it purely. We have to have our spiritual life for no other purpose than to please the Lord. If we're doing it to chase other things or to get something out of it as a bargain, we'll never get anywhere. Be and that's just trouble. the bottom line of it. We won't get anywhere. Absolutely. Um, Maria Kelly, great question. And, and the church would love to baptize you. We, you know, we, we desire for people to come into union with Christ. Um, as for remarriage, well, it, you know, whatever happened in your life before baptism, baptism eliminates all sin, all, all shortcomings. You know, it, it, it unites us to Christ and we become born again. We, we become new creations. We are born again through water and the spirit. So for you, it wouldn't be a remarriage. It would be your first. Um, yes. The Orthodox church would not would not uh, at least it's how we've always done things in this diocese is that if, if there's been a situation like that well that's um this happened before your baptism when you were in the world you know it's a different thing it's a different story so you know make sure to talk to your priest you know get in touch with the local priest and uh you know just constantly pray for god's guidance on all things and and just have patience god wants your salvation more than anything and uh baptism is definitely the first good step I think uh, I think we've actually cleaved through almost all the questions. Uh, there is one question from old Joe that I think is is the only one left. Uh, as far as I can think, we'll sweep through to make sure we didn't miss anything else of uh, on Abraham and sacrificing uh, Isaac. Yeah, this um, is um, obedience. Yeah, it's it, well, and it's also a it's prophetic. It's actually a, an archetype of the father sacrificing his son on the cross, right? So much like Christ, Isaac carries the wood that would form his pyre up the mountain, just as Christ carries the wood of the cross over his back up the hill of Calvary. You know, and of course, 
he was willing to be sacrificed by Abraham. That's one thing that is, is clear when you read the scriptures closely and carefully. And just like Christ, he was willing to go to his own death for the sake of righteousness. Of course, the difference is, is that the lamb that is provided uh, later on, you know, it, it says, you know, God says, I will provide a lamb. I will provide a sacrifice. And they find a lamb caught in the bushes. Of course, this is foreshadowing that the Lamb of God, the Son of God, who, who is the Lamb that taketh away the sin of the world, would be offered by God, that he would be the one to give the sacrifice that would save all of mankind. So it's a it's it's actually a really beautiful passage because it, it foreshadows all of this. Um let's see. So member of the UOCC, welcome to attend Roll Core liturgies at this time. Always, always, always. Um, we're, we're certainly not in communion with the U Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Canada, but that being said, you're welcome to come. You know, we, yep. as far as I, as far as I know, myself, Father Vladimir, Father John, Father, our, our friend Father David, who's the second priest with Father Vladimir now. The way we see it, the, the war does not determine our our love and our relationship to each other. Yeah, the, you know, the, I mean, the, the worldly our, politics. Keep that outside. Guys the are, even Christ. then, you know, if on top of that too, as far as far as communion goes, uh, I don't believe we are in communion with the UOCC. Uh, I know you guys are in communion with with the GoArch. Um, you know, I personally, out of obedience to my bishops, and if if I were you, I would listen to my bishops. I would commune where we are in communion with. That's not to say that something is or isn't canonical. But you want to always listen to your bishops, especially when yeah, it comes to just that. to quickly Some... just to quickly jump in on this, just to put down this kind of talk, because this is not about worldly politics. Putin is not the devil. The devil is the devil. Putin is a man who, despite his many mistakes and shortcomings, like all of us have, you know, Trump has shortcomings, despite being a, you know, a, a favored leader by many. Um, Trudeau has shortcomings. Uh, Pierre Polyev has shortcomings. Uh, everyone has shortcomings okay you know he's not putin is not the devil putin has struggles he has passions and just as much as god wants to save you avoid the pride that we talked about where we say well god can't save me because i'm such a sinner avoid the pride of saying god can't save someone like putin you, you never know you know and yeah, we don't and putin certainly believes in christ he certainly believes to some extent in the orthodox church but um you know, we can't call him the devil. You know, that that's just, that's kind of, that that's actually. Things we, we can't really make those kind of judgments. No, right? and, and it, it actually lessens the severity of the spiritual. It, it diminishes the, the threat that the actual devil poses when we start using equivocations like this and calling people we don't like the devil. Yeah, it's, it's like it's someone calling Trump, you know, the devil or, yeah, or you know, this, poli this such and such politician is the antichrist, this and that. It's like that yeah we can't um, we can't do that and just to quickly address uh mary kelly here maria kelly here well glory to god you guys if you enter the church together you can you can have an orthodox marriage together and that will be you know that would still be your first marriage you know uh, civil marriages uh there, there are people who've had those and they come into the church and and they get uh they, they get crowned so don't worry i okay me as well to come up to canada I wanted to wait, you know, a few years. We wanted to wait a few years of living together before I got married. This is far before we converted. Um, but we realized that really the only pathway for me to be able to immigrate to Canada would be to go ahead and, and just get married early. I mean, we'd already been dating for like four years at that point anyway. So it's just natural. And we got civilly married and then we converted. And then we properly, truly got married in the church which is a true sacramental marriage where we are joined together as one flesh. Right. We are wardens of each other's souls. You know, we, we have greater responsibility through Absolutely. the sacrament. So there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, it's how the world operates when you're outside of the church. And, and yes, old Joe, there is, it's all about conforming to Christ. Abraham, you know, of course, this is before the time of, of Christ's birth and, and crucifixion, but this, the whole thing with, with Isaac prefigures that. It's it's a prophetic prefiguring of the events to come, a foreshadowing, as they say. And uh, ultimately, it's to be faithful to God that even if we don't see 
the end of God's plan, that we follow it through to its end and trust God to take us through it. Um, it's all about having faith in God, which, yes, our faith in God should it should just be absolute faith and obedience. You know, he created us. He loves us. We owe him that. Um, does the Orthodox Church have a strong stance on Freemasonry? Can an Orthodox be a Freemason if he if Absolutely. he is? Is he excommunicated? No, you can't be. Absolutely no. not. It's, it's instant excom excommunication. And even if you convert to the faith and had been a former Mason, you can't be a priest. Um, yeah, you literally you're never been involved. Yeah, that, that bars you from priesthood. So no, it's uh, it's yeah, it bars you from priesthood. Very, it's mass communication. Um, I actually heard a story recently of there was uh, someone who had reposed. And this person, I think her husband was a Freemason, something like that. And they actually had to, the, the priest who was going to do the funeral service had to be very, very sure that she wasn't a Freemason. She was an Orthodox Christian, but her husband is a Freemason and supposedly an Orthodox Christian as well. But he was interrogating her son to know, like, was she a Freemason? Did she espouse these beliefs? Did she go to these places? Because if she is, he cannot administer the the funeral service for her. It would be a mockery because of what they believe and what the Freemasons stand for. It, they're completely 100% in opposition to the Orthodox yes. Church. End of story. Um, no debate yeah. on that. Absolutely exactly. no debate on that. Well, moving through. Uh, Hello, fathers. I have many Protestant friends. What do you say to them about the issues of Sola Scriptura? Uh, it's not in the Bible. <laughs> There's no such thing as the same scripture, even in the Bible. Jesus My, will quote bo uh, from books that the, the Protestants consider apocrypha. <laughs> so, yes, My that, that is honestly a, a favorite pet argument. It's such a silly argument, but it is true. You will find nowhere in the Bible that Christ even said, write the Bible. Also, in now to have a, a, a more nuanced approach the Holy Apostle Paul speaks of traditions not written that were only spoken of, that we should follow them as well, which right there is all the confirmation we need within the Bible. So if you're following Sola Scriptura, then you should also have traditions outside the Bible. Ergo, Sola Scriptura defeats itself. But on top of that, most Protestants are going to believe in things outside of the Bible. They're going to have their own customs, their own traditions too. They're going to go blue in the face saying how that's not true, but it is true. They're going to yes. believe in things that don't appear in the Bible. They're going to do things in their own weird sacramental ways or their non-sacramental ways, whatever things that they do as part of their customs and traditions that are inviolable to them. That would be They would see it as blasphemy or heresy to not do these things. So you can't tell me that like, it's impossible to only be Sola Scripture. You will develop traditions, erroneous traditions outside of the church. But nonetheless, we will we crave order. We will develop these things regardless. Exactly. So it's, um, it's just impossible. It, you, it's uh, not possible to be so completely Sola Scriptura. It's just and, not. And, and Max, I have no idea what you're talking about here. Um, again, you know, there's a difference between the church having to deal with being in the world and being consumed by worldly concerns. You know, it's, it's not really a political commentary chat. I'm really sorry. I, I don't know what you're talking about. And, uh, you know, I, I won't really allow for too much engagement with secular politics. You know, that this is a place for uh, spiritual discussion and, and trying to grow in the spiritual life. So I hope you understand. It's, uh, I, I, I will say that this is a, a good place actually to say this, that we shouldn't refer to anyone, even our greatest enemies as dogs no. freemason muslims anybody we shouldn't refer to them as no matter what they do no matter the atrocities that they may commit never ever that is very very low and judgmental and god will not see that very kindly yeah no sex before marriage by the way yeah no <laughs> none <laughs> that's yeah that absolutely is... not Zero. no exactly this it's is not. why christ himself even says you know the two become one flesh but this is after one becomes wed once once it's a once it's a proper union between the man and the wife joint in Christ. You know we cannot bless ourselves, and otherwise, you know, when we're doing this, we're putting this before God. We're putting our body's desires and, and our carnality before God, and and this can oftentimes result in tragedy. You know, it's it's better to have that commitment and to save oneself for the marriage bed. That's why it's called the marriage bed. So we keep Satan out of it by not jumping into it with the wrong person before you know for sure and before you are married. 
have the blessing of the Lord first before you go into this. Uh, um, Desert Fox, didn't Christ call people snakes and vipers? Yes, but yes. he is God and would not do anything with passions, with anger. He, he cannot yeah. do that with passion and anger. When he was like, speaking of this, he was speaking to the spirit in which the Pharisees were addressing things and were doing yeah. things. They were a brood of vipers because they, they were devouring. You also have to understand the context of this term mm -hmm. and why it was such an insult. Vipers devour their young. And so he's saying this because they sat in the wisdom seat of Moses. Many of them would have been called father. And yet they were leading the children of Israel astray from the truth for their own personal gain. Not all the Pharisees bear in mind. This whole pejorative thing, by the way, the whole term of Pharisee being a pejorative, this did not really even happen in church history until around the second century. Pharisees weren't necessarily seen as a bad thing. St. Paul no, calls himself a Pharisee and a son of a Pharisee. Um, uh, Nicodemus, he helped bring Christ down from the cross and helped lay him in a new tomb. Yeah, St. Saint, Saint John Chrysostom even says that uh, Lazarus may have been a Pharisee with how much like clout and, and respect that the Jews had for him when he passed. Because it even it says it in scripture that the Jews in the area were sad when Lazarus died. So it, it Pharisees were, for all intents and purposes, those who truly were living as as they should have been in fair like being a Pharisee, they were devout Jewish men, very devout. And that's Some why they perform minor miracles. Yeah, that's why those Pharisees who encountered Christ converted. They followed him. They the the Pharisees. Only the, the Pharisees who didn't convert is where we get rabbinic Judaism from. And I mean, in, in that case, yes, in, especially in like the context of the publican and the Pharisee, we shouldn't be Pharisaical. But in the historical context as well of just the Pharisees, a lot of them did follow Christ. Those who didn't, rabbinic Judaism. Here, well, here, here's a, actually, this is a good kind of follow up on things. Um, the, the truth of the matter is, uh, truth defenders, is that Tradition is where we actually eke out where the scriptures are. So if you were to look at the New Testament and what was decided as the canon of the New Testament for the first 26 books, this wasn't done till around the fourth century um, or, or complete or verified until then. In fact, the first establishment of the, count of the canon was actually in the Council of Carthage, which was third century, I should say. Um, sorry, I got my dates mixed up. It was third century. So you know, about 300 years after the ascension of Christ. And there were false gospels going around, forgeries, the Gnostic gospels of, of Peter, Thomas, and Mary Magdalene, which, of course, contradict the words of Christ and contradict the witness of the church without the tradition, though both the oral tradition and the written tradition, one would not be able to necessarily easily discern what came from who and what was proper and what was not. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, it was about verifying what was apostolic and what was not according to tradition. Before the printing press, guess what? You had to rely largely on tradition. Couldn't, you couldn't do much with that. And, and the problem with thinking, well, now we have the printing press. We can just rely on the Bible and read the Bible. It reduces Christianity to nothing more than a mental exercise. And for some, it's truly just a feel-good self-help philosophy. I mean, put so, it this way. Yeah. St. Saint Basil reluctantly, begrudgingly, and saw it as lamentable that there were people in his time who said, had the same thought that anything that wasn't written down shouldn't be followed and we shouldn't have to care about it yeah. to which he responded well why do you cross yourselves why do you follow all of these traditions it's because we got it from the holy apostles but you still do it anyway even though it isn't written down and you wouldn't renege on that would you and they of course answered well of course we'd follow these things and, 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 here's, that, and this is why yeah. we get a written down version of the divine liturgy because well, saint yeah. basil was put into the position that he had to write this down to shut these people up. Well, and here's the other thing um, when, when it comes to these things. In, in Acts, St. Paul says, did not our Lord say it is better to give than to receive? Well, look through all the Gospels. Where in the Gospels does Jesus say this? Nowhere. This was an oral trans, uh, orally transmitted teaching given to him by, by the other apostles. Um, do you fathers recommend any books to read and understand uh, the Orthodox Faith and Church History. Yes, if you go to the Center for Traditionalist Orthodox Studies website, there's a really good book by Proto-Presbyter James Thornton on the Seven Ecumenical Councils of the Orthodox Church, A Concise History. 
I would pick up that and read it. It's really good. Each chapter is uh, is its own self-contained uh, summary of the reason and the events and the decisions of these councils and what they addressed. So I would really recommend that you you pick that up. It's a very, very informative and awesome read. Also, if, you're, if, if your reading level is extremely advanced, I would say also pick up uh, On the Dogma of the Church from St. Ilarion Troitsky, because uh, it is a very good historical overview of ecclesiology. Uh, it's a great, great book. It is just an extremely hard read. So put on your thinking cap when you read that, because it's tough. No, um, actually, Truth Defenders, you're incorrect. There's there's really nothing to historically prop up Protestant uh, teachings. Other, you know, you know, Protestantism started in 1517 with Martin Luther. And in all reality, the, the quote unquote traditions, we just gave several examples. So if, if you're if you're not too busy engaging in arguments and following in the footsteps of the Protestants uh, type of of church ecclesiastical heresies, Arius, the lover of arguments um, in, in reducing the church to just a created thing uh, completely removed from God, you'd have to realize that for one Jesus did promise that the church would not fall in Matthew 16, that the gates of Hades would not triumph against it. And it most certainly hasn't. What Christ has established, man cannot tear asunder, man cannot destroy. And the Protestant belief that there was ever a great falling away or a need for a reform is an incredible blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And that's just the truth. It is blasphemous. Uh, you know, I, I will say there are a lot of Protestants with good hearts out there, many who I love, but they're in error. And, um, you know, truth defenders, the only truth you might be defending, you might have to come to the stark realization is probably your own personal truth. And that's not truth at all. Uh, Father, could you write the name of those two books into the uh, chat? I cannot. Interact which which with ones? Them. Sorry. Uh, the St. Hilarion Troitsky book on the dogmas of the church and the one that you had recommended on church history. Uh, Someone had asked if you could please write them in. Okay. On the dogmas. And then we should get to wrapping this up. Yeah, I, I'll take. Uh, I'm, there's two that I saw that I, I'll take, and then yeah, I should probably wrap it up because I am I am gonna fade out of existence because it is two forty in the morning. Uh, so on the dog, just a quick note on the dogmas of the church by Saint Ilaria and Troitsky. Um, it's a tough book. It's a tough book. It's a big book, and it Beautiful is a, uh, a. And. One second. Truth defenders, there is no debate, okay? Calvinism is a Gnostic heresy. <laughs> I'm going to call it that. It presupposes God is the author of evil, no matter which way you swing it. God does not need the fall to show forth his goodness. Um, this isn't a debate channel. As you can see, most of the questions that we care to answer are actual spiritual ones where people are trying to get answers for spiritual struggles. And, uh, you know, I'm sorry, but I, I don't owe you a debate. And that's not what we do on this channel. You know, we, we'll give like answers to things and refutations. Um, Arthur Bro James just pointed out there's a good book on this by Father James, uh, by Father Josiah Trenum, um, Rock and Sand. So uh, you, you can go ahead and think Eastern Orthodox is heretical. History proves that you're the heretic. So God bless you. But you know what, Truth Defender? I don't have to entertain you. I don't have to give you a platform. And if this is how you're going to act and you're going to act like a proud, whiny little man about this, then you know what? God help you. I, I say this with love, but, uh, <laughs> you know, your, your heresy art, Calvin, he was all for killing people and establishing himself as a worldly, worldly leader. So, no, I'm, I'm not wrong. His history proves it out, truth defender. Saying you're wrong is not an argument. Uh, <laughs> there's so many arguments against Calvinism and against its, its egregious heresies, which are blasphemies against Christ and against the Holy Spirit. I really do pray that you are not so much a truth defender, but you'll become a truth seeker and seek union with Christ. God help you. But uh, this is not the prelist hour. So you're getting a ban. Bye. Uh, I'll take there. There's three questions that I really want to ask because two of them are going to be pretty, pretty quick. Uh, someone had asked, are the seven councils, the seven churches in Revelations? There is a thought now going around that there's eight actual ecumenical councils that's backed by a lot of historical evidence, which yeah. that well, just needs to be investigated yeah, a lot more. So exactly. no, that's definitely a no on that one. Um, old Joe asked, I feel like when I touch truth, I'm touching God, touching something bigger than myself. Am I being deceived or am I mistaken somehow? It, 
Okay, so Mike, just one second. Tr Truth Defender, you're getting a ban. Okay, I, I was nice to you. I was I was pretty nice to you. I'm not going to give you a pass. I'm not going to take this Western kind of light approach of, well, let's talk about it. Maybe maybe we can both find... No, you're wrong. Sorry. I'm not going to say you're right or acquiesce something when, no, you're flat out wrong. You need to go read some church history. You need to do some real soul searching. I haven't insulted you. I haven't called you names. But you are a heretic. You're trying to push heresy. I've tried to correct you gently. You're a heretic. Okay? And, and you know what a heretic means? It means someone who chooses, who chooses apart from. You're making a choice to choose something that is anachronistic, that is ahistorical, that isn't true. That's your choice. Fine. You can choose that. You are a heretic for that. You've chosen something. I'm not swearing at you. I'm not calling you names. You know, uh, <laughs> yes, you did. Wow. Well, you know, if you want to talk childish, go ahead and keep spamming. But all you are, you're, you're in an echo chamber. Nobody agrees with you. I've been nice to you, but I'm not going to put up with you. And I'm and I'm sorry, priests are not pacifists. We're not pushovers. We, we have more than every right to say you're wrong on something and to call you out on it. God help you. I'm well, getting a ban. It's like being a vegan and coming into a meat eating convention and trying to argue it. It's like, we're just here to eat meat, man. <laughs> yeah, no, right? It's like being a vegan at meat fest. I'm just here to that eat meat, man. So, uh, yeah, it's a ban. what was I saying? Oh, uh, old Joe, um, on the question of truth and, you know, getting truth adjacent, touching truth and feeling something bigger there. Truth in our day and age, unfortunately, is subjective. Truth is very objective. It is not a subjective thing. Um, if you are approaching it through the lens of the church and in the church, then that's still kind of a, a strange way to put it. I mean, in a sense, we would, when we do approach truth, when we pray, when we fast, when we, we read the lives of the saints, when we, you know, read theology, things like that, that do connect us to Christ, to the Lord, we, we should feel like we are touching something bigger when, you know, when we're at church, at the services, we should feel like we are there. God is bigger than us. We should have that awareness, that feeling of that. But there it's, there, there are a lot of ways where that can be in, in error, in delusion. Um, it's a, it's a difficult thing to ask without more con like to answer without, without more uh, context and like knowing you personally is one of those things. Um, but on the surface, I would say that that's kind of a delusional thing, but it depends. It just depends. It's a, it's one of those that's too tough to assess, um, just like informally kind of, uh, kind of thing. Uh, there was one more that I wanted to really answer. Uh, where is it? Um, mathematics, the handwriting of God. Uh, I wouldn't quite go as far as to to say that but i would say that mathematics can certainly prove that there is order logic reason to the universe which definitely um does give proof to you know things being created i think mathematics in that sense if, the, if that's what you're asking if mathematics can prove that create that our reality is created and thus that it points to the hand of a creator then yeah you know there, there's all sorts of great evidence for that and i think it's it's a beautiful thing when we can look at creation and see evidence of, of the creator's handiwork in it and to see that there is irrefutable proof that we live in a created reality. It's beautiful. It's, it's, it's crazy to me how uh, people can be nominalist and think that uh, that nothing is, is united, that there's no universality to anything, that there's no creator, and yet they think that they can push for and champion human rights. <laughs> well, if there's no universals, if everything's just subjective, then, you know, what's the big fuss about whenever anything goes on, right? So I, I think that our ability to peer into the essence of things as well and to see creation for what it is and to see uh, a pattern to things and to have an idea of right and wrong is also evidence that God exists. Okay, I found the one that uh, I was looking at uh, from Praise the Lord is the last question that, he, that was sent in. Uh, weren't the Sadducees the ones that plotted against Jesus the most and were the ones who chose not to believe in Jesus and eventually became the Jews of today? Or am I getting it wrong? So the Sadducees, when you do see them in scripture, yeah, they're definitely completely wrong. They didn't, they denied the resurrection. They were heretics by Jewish, well, not them. That was the, 
No, Sadducees were heretics. Were, were they heretics by yeah, Jewish Yeah, the, the Pharisees sat in the seat of Moses. The Sadducees, even though they had influence on the Sanhedrin, it was largely a societal monetary yeah. influence. But and, they, uh, yeah, they, they know, didn't believe in yeah. the resurrection. They didn't they believe, didn't in, believe in the that. resurrection. They only believed in the first five books of Moses. They were kind of the sola scripturist of the days. So I think anyone... you might be getting uh, a little uh, mixed with the um, the Samaritans because the Samaritans only believed in the five books. The Sadducees, I mean, their big error was that they didn't believe in the resurrection. They had everything. The, 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 trust, trust me, the Sadducees actually were, also okay. denied anything. Yeah, they, that's but, one of the reasons uh, why they denied the resurrection is they they deny everything after the first five books of Moses. Okay, but yeah. to uh, actually, if anyone wants to read on this topic, Father and John and I are talking about. Um, no, the, the Sadducees did not believe in resurrection and didn't really have a, a view of the afterlife either. Mm. Um, I would say there's a really good book by Holy Apostles Convent called The Life of the Theotokos, the Virgin Mary. Um, if you read that book, it actually gives a lot of historical context for what was happening with, with Jewish society at the time. It breaks down the whole thing with yeah. the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin. Very, very important for understanding the life of the Holy Theotokos and everything that's kind of happening in the background of the gospel. Very yeah. interesting. It, it's a great book. Um, Big book, too. It's like, es you know. Essentially, what a lot of what shaped modern Judaism is the remnants of whoever didn't follow Christ. They all kind of made this weird hodgepodge of all of their beliefs. And then things got really wacky after the temple was destroyed. Things got really wacky after that. Um, and then we just get rabbinic Judaism out of that and the, the Talmud and all of that, the all of that stuff. And just a quick thing. No problem, uh, old Joe. We were happy to, <laughs> to take your questions. And, uh, you know, is, there's no such thing as, as too old and no such thing as being at an end of a rope that God can't pick up and, and pull you up with. So we're always happy to give our time. Thank you for asking really good questions. I can't believe it's been four hours either. <laughs> yeah. It's it's one of those things where you sit down and you're like, well, we're only going to talk for an hour or two. And then it's just like, it's so, it's so hard. People have so many questions. How well, can we leave you people? First um, so live streams for a new program. They typically run a little longer. It's kind of like the flagship thing, right? Um, the last thing I'll answer and then we'll, we'll call it a night. Um, uh is uh from drew and it's how does one atone for divorce in my case my spouse committed adultery nearly had a child with oh lord have mercy i'm so sorry to hear this drew divorced mm -hmm. him and has been married to two people since she divorced me five years ago lord have mercy well in the in the church actually because she had committed adultery and would be considered the at-fault party um you know, it, it would be one of those things where she wouldn't be allowed if this was in the Orthodox Church. And if people are following the canons as they should be, she would not be permitted those marriages. Yeah. Um, you know, you, one can't commit adultery and have their marriage blessed by the church. I mean, if you go to City Hall and get married, well, what, what can you do? You know, people can get a piece of paper. That piece of paper does not equal much in the kingdom of God. Um, but in terms of what can you do to atone? Well, in all reality, Drew, just give your life to Christ. You know, draw to Christ, pray to the Holy Mother of God, ask for her intercessions for her help. Um, you know, God, a, bro a heart that is broken and humbled, God does not despise, as the 50th Psalm says, right? So, you know, this is what is an acceptable sacrifice to God. You come with your brokenheartedness, come with your humiliation, your sadness, your disappointment, your rage, and just Pray for God to have mercy on her, to forgive her. Even if you struggle to forgive her, pray for God to forgive her. And uh, do your best to draw closer to Christ, to have a fulfilling life in the church, to draw near to him, to participate in the sacraments, receive his, his precious yeah. body and blood. And, and this alone can, can even start to give you some great comfort and some healing. But uh, and, and what, if... what happened is, is such a tragedy. And, and I really hope that this hasn't, you know, I, I hope and pray that, you and, and your family are doing okay. If you had children with her, I, I really hope that everyone's doing okay. Um, and you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll say some, I'll say a prayer rope for you tonight. And, and I pray that God will, will comfort you. And, and same with Alex. I mean, there's many wonderful people here who have had terrible things happen to them, but know this, that, that God loves you and that uh, yes. in your suffering, you draw closer to him. You, you have a share in this. These are crosses to bear. 
and as hard as they are, don't grumble upon them. Don't don't grumble against them. Accept them with love, and and say, Lord, I I offer myself and all my pain and humiliation to you. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. You know, just just pray for these, and I, I will definitely pray for you too, Alex. I think, uh, you know, I think that God will will. I know that God will assist you all, and that He'll help you through these struggles. So, you know, keep praying to Him, keep turning to Him, draw closer to Him, and don't give up. Okay. So yeah, that if, if if you are outside of the church, too, just know that when you know if if you do be if you are received into the church, if you do get baptized, that that will the slate will be wiped clean. You know, you'll be approaching it fresh, especially if you get married within the church. It'll be as if it's your first. And just one last thing for a press who's been asking about a uh, website or book in terms of uh, the the just the daily traditions and, and uh, things in the church. Really, those kind of the day to day things like that. Um, Desert Fox is, is really right. A lot of that you will just absorb by being in the life of the church in your parish life because some parishes too even have maybe little customs that they have this and that so it really is dependent on your parish and and what local church you're part of you know which diocese you're in those little things those customs a lot of it will transfer across many uh jurisdictions and many local churches but just throw yourself into the daily life of the church see how other people act observe when i first came to the church that was the main thing i did i i Actually, my family and I, we were in the back of the church and we were just observing what everyone else would do, you know, how they would approach icons, how they would yeah, how, the how blessings, they cross, how they you, bow. You just learn. And no one's going to be like, oh, who are these weirdos standing in the back if you're like a catechumen? They're going to understand that, oh, wow, well, this, this person's here and they're trying to learn what we're doing. Plenty of people will appreciate that. That you're not just, you know, going around and making a goof of yourself, but that you're being respectful and, and learning that. And just being part of the church, being part of the daily life, participating, you'll learn it. It's it's like with everything, you know, you'll learn the little the little customs, the 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 ins and outs of it just by by being there. Absolutely. And and you know what? Uh, just as a, a quick thing, you know, uh, people are always willing to help. And uh, stylist, God bless you. Uh, we appreciate you and all your questions, everyone. Thank you for everyone for tuning into this live stream. Yes, and, thank um, you, thank you so much. And you know, just take take heart. Know that that God is is the God of the suffering and the brokenhearted, and He is he is there to lift you up, to to restore you, to bring you into life with Him. Doesn't mean life will be easy. Uh, a Christian doesn't look really to have an easy life. Look at how it was for the Lord. He's God, and yet He suffered so much on the cross. He didn't have to. He could have taken Himself off it at any time. He could have destroyed the people below, but. Out of his great love and condescension, he says, God, forgive them for they do not know what they do. And so th this is the, the approach we should take. And, and that actually, just to kind of touch on that briefly, uh, self-flagellation, not no good, good to do. Don't don't mar the flesh. God made you in his image. Um, fasting is more than enough to mortify the flesh. Fasting and prostrations. And yes, old Joe, we will be doing this um, once every other week to once every two weeks, whatever works in terms of our just our schedules for serving. Um, and, but yeah, this will be a, a frequent thing. It's a new show, two two priests in a podcast. <laughs> and and uh, uh, please, please uh, forgive us if any of us, if we uh, ruin your sleep schedule, try yes, to get some good us. sleep. <laughs> and no matter how tired you are, please go to Vespers. Go, go, to, go to Vespers, go to hours and matins. If go to church in the morning. It's, Do your it's prayers. The first week of Great Lent. Push yourself, even if you're dead tired. Hopefully, this has been edifying and worth it. But go to church, please. It's the first week of Great Lent. Do all that you can to be in church. Spasiba to all of you for joining us. Thank you. God bless you. And yes, God uh, bless you. All. Doing, we will be looking for a way to get our our podcast, our future podcast, up on. Um, on the uh, uh, on Spotify and other platforms, just to give a bit more accessibility and a bit more uh, diversity for what we have uh, in terms of where we can we can hit uh, towards people um, in terms of where they are and, and being able to help them. The next the next live stream will definitely be shorter, but this not <laughs> a lot live stream significant was uh, was an absolute blessing. It was a blessing to meet you guys to talk with you, and uh, you know please keep us in our prayers and God bless you all. Much love in Christ to all of you. And have a wonderful night. God bless you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.